this something is the genes, the bearers of hereditary qualities transmitted from parents to children. Genes supervise the continuity of the species, they explain hereditary family traits and determine the inherited dowry which is laid with each child into the cradle. The characteristics of the one and a half million genes which actively participate in one act of fertilization determine not only the character of the infant, but they also determine each and every physical detail, down to color of eyes, facial expression and skin pigmentation. Genes are also constructed of atoms and molecules, so that any damage to them by cosmic radiation must be far more fateful than damage to our organism itself. Changes in the structure of the genes, such as have been proved may occur under the effect of radiation, affect not only the characteristics of immediate offspring, but are fundamentally inheritable. Such permanent alterations of inheritance are known as mutations. We may compute the probability that a gene, a unit of our inheritance, will be damaged by cosmic radiation, for it may be statistically treated, since we know the shot density and the size of the target. If we assume radiation density is that of ground level and apply it to the period extending from birth to the termination of reproductively of the average man or woman, the computation shows that a gene will be struck about ten times within the many generative cells generated over that period. But only a very tiny fraction of the generative cells of a person have the opportunity to participate in determining the characteristics of a child. Hence the probability of mutations affecting the individual family is minute. Due to the fact that there are some two billion inhabitants on our earth, there is a goodly chance for a number of hereditary changes in each generation, despite the small likelihood of a mutation in any given family. A mutation is by no means always negative, for we have both good and bad inheritances. While some inherited diseases, such as the haemophilia of the Russian czars, may turn up, improvements in heritage are also possible. It seems to me that the Darwinian doctrine of the survival of the fittest should here be introduced. A more intelligent, stronger, better species in the long run has a better chance of survival than the obtuse, weaker and poorer. Perhaps we can interpret the development of man from Homo primigenius to modern Homo sapiens as the combined effect of mutations on one side and Darwin's selective survival on the other. This may even be a tiny peephole into God's mysterious laboratory. Whatever our attitude towards such interpretation, one thing is certain, and that is that every living thing on earth is subject to a certain, definite, but small prospect of a mutational change by cosmic radiation. The prospect is immeasurably small for any individual, as has been strongly attested to by the amazing uniformity with which human, animal and plant species have continued themselves through the ages. The total cosmic radiation density in empty space is some 19 times greater than on Earth, according to the figures just presented. A gene, however, cannot be exposed to particles penetrating the body until a certain layer of the body had been traversed. The thickness of this layer will, of course, be affected by the angle at which the particle impinges. In space, the particles approach from any direction so statistically we shall do well to figure a certain mean layer thickness. This is about equivalent to 20 centimeters of water surrounding the genes. Collisions may of course occur in this layer, preventing primary particles from reaching the genes to some extent, but also increasing the danger of their being struck by secondary products from these collisions. You will see that the body provides a shield for the genes similar to that of a thin atmospheric layer and that the density of particles is somewhat higher than that produced by the primary radiation alone. It can be estimated that in empty space the genes are not subject to 19 times the surface level cosmic bombardment, but to 140 times as heavy. On the other hand, cosmic rays are by no means the only sources of mutations. It has been scientifically confirmed that certain chemicals, of which colchicines is one, can also affect the genes. Botanists have found in experiments with plants that exposing the genes to marked changes of temperature, in particular shortly prior to the fertilization process, has much the same effect. Mutations are sometimes caused by radiation emitted by lighting. 
There may even be arbitrary orientations within the complicated molecular structure of the genes. Therefore there are quite a variety of additional causes of mutation aside from cosmic radiation. Some of these causes, such as lightning, do not occur in empty space. Under these circumstances, it is difficult to say to what extent a mutation is more likely to take place in space than on Earth. We may, however, state that the factor of cosmic radiation will not be multiplied by more than 40. When applied to any individual, this factor of 40 is negligible. After all, gentlemen, you do not propose to expose yourselves for the rest of your lives to this radiation, but only for some three years. We believe that millions of people would have to expose themselves in empty space for a lifetime before we scientists could confirm an increased number of mutations in succeeding generations. Now, you might like to know whether the nasals of the Mars vessels might not be shielded to a point which would reduce the cosmic radiation density within them to that of the Earth's surface. The absorptive capacity of our atmosphere corresponds to that of a leaden wall some 40 inches thick. I need not tell you that anything even approximating such a thickness would render the Mars vessels incapable of fulfilling their functions. Anything thinner would be worse than useless for as you have learned, the total radiation density at 60,000 feet is higher than in empty space by reason of the collisions between the atoms of the atmosphere and the particles. It is the atmospheric layers below this altitude which absorb the secondary radiation to an extent which reduces the total radiation density at sea level to less than that of empty space. Therefore a shield of a few centimeters of lead would only make matters worse and offer no protection whatsoever. It would simply increase the probability of collisions without being thick enough to absorb the secondary radiation. Thus, the thinnest wall remains the best, and the organic outer skins of your nasals are favorable to the protective issue. The organic plastics of which the nasals will be composed contain primarily hydrogen carbon and oxygen atoms and are highly porous to the primary particles. Thus collisions, with their resulting secondary radiation, will be reduced to a minimum and their radiation density within will be no higher than in empty space, while metal walls of moderate thickness would increase it. In short, gentlemen, I believe that I can assure you that there is hardly any danger to which you will be called to expose yourselves that will be of less consequence than the cosmic rays as infamous as they may be thought to be. There's no doubt in my mind that you risk yourselves and your posterity to a far greater extent each time you get into a motor car than you will be doing by exposing yourselves to cosmic craze in the nasals of your space vessels. Chapter 12 The Great Space Lift General Braden concentrated his personal attention on the organization of the ferry service which would freight Operation Mars up to the orbit of departure. Already he had reduced the rocket vessels which served Lunetta from 30 to 12. Those 18 ships which he assigned to Operation Mars were immediately sent to United Spacecraft for the necessary modifications, which included complete removal of the passenger accommodations and the relatively small cargo bays from the top stages. Fifteen of the vessels were equipped with cargo tanks for the hydrazine and nitric acid propellants of the Mars vessels. The other three ships were rebuilt with wide doors and large, roomy cargo spaces for the bulky components of the Mars vessels to be assembled in the orbit. United Spacecraft further completed 28 more series as propellant freighters exclusively, giving Braden a fleet of 43 tankers and three cargo vessels. The ferry plan provided that each vessel should average a trip every 10 days, and actually, the top stage of each ship required but 12 hours or so for a round trip. The problem of salvaging the booster stages, particularly the second stage, with its drop into the ocean a full thousand miles from the launching site, was complicated by reason of the three days required by the salvage steamer to get back to the base. There were, nonetheless, some seven days available for inspection repairs and reassembly of the various stages to prepare each ship for its next departure. Experience with the Lunetta ferry system indicated that such a schedule could be safely complied with, and matters were so arranged that the 950 Mars ferry flights could be carried out within about eight months.
even if as many as six ships should be concurrently out of commission for major repairs. Braden's plans were synchronized exactly with spacecraft's delivery schedule for the components of the Mars vessels and with the assembly schedule for the orbit of departure. Accordingly, a few cargo flights delivered a number of tank frames and tanks, followed by one of the nasals for the passenger vessels. This cabin was to serve as a primitive shelter for the assembly gang during their labors in space. Working in space suits, the men assembled the frames and located the tanks within them, ready to receive propellants. This permitted the propellant loading operation to begin without delay, during which the tankers pumped dehydrazine and nitric acid into the prepared receptacles of the as yet incomplete Mars vessels. Two tankers were to be launched simultaneously every 12 hours and to lay alongside the storage tanks which they would fill through their delivery hoses within the 10 hours preceding the arrival of the next shipment. Then they were to uncouple their hoses and apply to themselves a brief decelerative thrust in order to re-enter the elliptical plunging path whose perigee would touch the atmosphere after the ship had gone half around the Earth. After another half circle in extended gliding flight they would return to their point of departure. During the elapsed 12 hours, this point would have slowly advanced 180 degrees by the Earth's rotation, and would hence again be below the orbit of departure. The cargo vessels were intermittently to deliver the other Mars ship components as the fueling proceeded. The last movement was to be that of the landing craft whose wide wings would already be awaiting them in the departure orbit. Using their own rocket motors atop Sirius class booster stages, they would fly up to orbit to have their wings attached, and would themselves then be clamped to their mother ships in anticipation of the long voyage through space.0. This was an enormous logistical effort, the greatest ever undertaken by the space forces. Establishing Lunetta had been child's play in comparison. But before Braden could begin it, he was faced with another important problem. The plane of the orbit of departure lying, as it did, in the ecliptic, had eliminated Kilui as a practical base of operations for the ferry vessels, for the Hawaiian Islands are approximately in the latitude of the Tropic of Cancer. The latter represents the northernmost latitude attained by the orbit. Nor could more than one launching operation every 24 hours be carried out from Kilui and this would have delayed the entire ferry operation. In addition, there was the matter of utilizing the maximum payload, and the location of Kilui was unsuited to this. Braden therefore was forced to establish an entirely new base for the ferry vessels at Christmas Island, a huge atoll of more than 100 miles circumference rising from the Pacific to bear the ring of its palm-fronted islets 1,200 miles south of Hawaii. Since Christmas Island was almost exactly on the equator, it was from there that the maximum peripheral velocity produced by the Earth's rotation could most effectively be utilized for ascent. At the equator, this velocity is 464 meters per second, and since the direction of movement in the orbit of departure was identical, a velocity of 464 meters per second was no mean contribution to the required total velocity of 8,260 meters per second in actuality, only 425 of those 464 meters per second would be saved, and this was because of the angle between the ecliptic and the equator. Nevertheless, some six tons of propellants per trip would remain in the tanks of the ferry vessels over and above what would have been the had the trip been made from Kilui to Lunetta. Since the propellants were the same as those used in the Mars vessels, this represented a considerable net gain of available payload. Only by this gain had it been possible to reckon with but 950 flights for the whole ferry operations. The base on Christmas Island shared with Kilui the advantage that there was direct sea transportation between it and the plant of United Spacecraft at Long Beach, for very nearly all the material to be shipped was either manufactured there, or passed through there for testing or adaptation. The problem of loading propellants was far easier in steamer ships than in tank cars. It would require more than 500 shiploads, so that this aspect alone was a determining factor in the selection of a new island base. The DuPont Corporation expanded for the Space Force's large propellant plants in both Oakland and San Diego, 
and nothing was easier than for the tankers to go alongside the loading piers in these harbors, load up, steam to Christmas, and discharge into its storage tanks. Early in January, 1983, 18 months' work had put the Christmas Island base into temporary operating shape. It was a rude shock which awaited the crews detached from the Lunetta ferry service and their comfortable quarters in Hawaii. The grousing was like the grousing in every army since Caesar's, to the effect that when a base was picked by the space forces, it was at the most godforsaken spot on the map. When they got there, Braden took their worries off their minds by delaying the ferry flights to the orbit of departure as little as possible. To keep soldiers busy was also an old Roman custom. Zero, a number of salvage steamers were always within the Christmas Island atoll while the tankers were unloading propellants into the tank farm near the docks. These salvage ships sought out the exhausted booster stages as they dropped into the ocean. Like returning whalers, they carried the great bulk of the boosters on their low-lying after decks when they entered the atoll's protected waters through the channel which had been blasted through the barrier reef. They always flew a victory pennant from the fore truck, somewhat like that flown by a successful sail fisherman. Salvaging boosters had become a science since the first modest space ships were developed, it had become so important that a number of special devices for it had come into being. The enormous first booster of a serious ship produced a thrust of not less than 12,800 tons and imparted to the upper two stages a velocity of 2,350 meters per second in 84 seconds. At the 84 th second, when the initially vertical flight path had curved to a little more than 20 degrees from the horizontal, the ship would be 40 kilometers high and about 50 kilometers horizontally from the launching site. Then the second stage began to exert its thrust, separating from the empty first booster below it. With its tanks empty, the latter still weighed 700 tons. There is still considerable drag at 2,350 meters per second, even at an altitude of 40 kilometers, and at the moment of separation. A large parachute of wire mesh emerged from the after end of the exhausted booster. The parachute slowly decelerated the great bulk on its still rising path, attaining several hundred degrees of heat in the process, by reason of the high velocity. The metal of which it was constructed, however, could easily withstand this. The booster continued upward to about 64 km altitude from which it descended to the sea its velocity having dropped to 1,250 meters per second when it passed the 40 kilometer altitude. Now the booster's flight path began to grow steeper, until it finally reached sea level some 190 miles from the launching site, approaching the water at 50 meters per second. It had flown for seven minutes. When the huge bulk was still 50 meters above the sea, a ground proximity fuse went into action igniting the braking rockets. These were mounted in the nose section of the booster and now pointed downwards due to the pull of the parachute on the other end. Their ten streams of fire, generated by powder, exerted an upward thrust of almost 2,500 tons for two seconds. Had the booster continued seawards at the same rate, it would have been destroyed by the impact, but the rockets, pouring their violence against the water, reduced the speed left by the parachute to almost zero. Thus the booster landed softly in the water, roiled by the rockets, and submerged. Before long it emerged once more, rolling like a wounded whale as the flotation of the great, empty tanks turned the huge stabilizing fins downwards. Finally it floated supinely, its empty powder rocket tubes pointing at the sky and the heavy rocket plant acting as ballast. A salvage steamer had been waiting in the vicinity, tracking the booster's descent with radar. Now she hastened to the spot where the great, boil like mass rolled amid the frothing seas. She approached it cautiously, with much packing and filling, for to hoist aboard such a clumsy object was no child's play. Specially trained teams had been developed for the purpose for any slight contact between the hull of the steamer and the delicate structure of the booster might well result in damage which would mean long and costly repairs. The ship moved stern first towards the booster with the jib of a crane mounted at the taffrail extending above it. From the outer end of the jib hung a bridle with a heavy spreader, 
upon each end of which sat a man. The bridle was lowered and the two men skillfully shackled the ends of the bridle onto two fittings located atop the booster especially for this purpose. It was a majestic sight when the crane began to hoist the dripping black monster clear of the sea. The 20 meters of diameter and its 29 meter length, adorned by the huge stabilizing fins, finally hung above the water as the ship's stern sank several feet because of the added weight. Before the jib of the crane was swung around, a second great stream of water poured out of the belly of the suspended monster. A fresh water hose had been part of the suspension bridle, so that all parts of the valuable booster might be sprayed down to prevent damage by the corrosive sea water to its complicated equipment and delicate structure. When this was completed, the crane swung around slowly and deposited its load upon an open section of the steamer's deck, forward of the crane. Here the stabilizing fins were promptly secured by screws to fittings prepared for them. But the steel cable leading to the parachute still hung over the side of the ship. It was attached at its inboard end to a ring inside a large containing drum located in the center of the rocket combustion chamber and its nozzle system. The latter covered the whole cross-section of the booster. The metallic parachute, of course, had sunk dot to salvage this chute with its 85 tons of weight and its diameter of 64.5 meters was almost as much of a problem as to salvage the booster itself. In earlier days, this complicated job had been done with a large net lowered from the jib crane into the water astern of the steamer. Four steam winches had wound in cables with grapnels at their ends which had engaged in the bulky metallic chute and pulled it into the net, piece by piece. Finally the crane had hoisted the net, chute and all, inboard. The salvage was too primitive to avoid frequent damage to the delicate parachute, and such damage was always followed by extensive repair work. But now the ferry trips of the Mars vessels were greatly facilitated by a new procedure which had been worked out by the space forces for this salvage activity. It had been proved superior to the older method by extensive testing. A roll of reinforced sailcloth was suspended just aft of the stern of the ship between two outriggers. The roll was about 10 feet thick and as wide as the beam of the ship. The whole thing was somewhat like a roll of carpet. The roll began to turn under the power of an electric winch and the sailcloth dipped into the water with its ends delimited by two thick, round discs. Under the weight of the wire reinforcement, the sailcloth unrolled ever faster until stopped by a break on the roller. Thus the full 180 meters of the sailcloth was submerged, the chute hanging almost collapsed, its depth nearly that of the sailcloth. There was a switch hidden behind a plate at the base of one of the four stabilizing fins of the booster. This closed an electrical circuit running through a conducting core concealed within the lay of the parachute cable. When current flowed, it set in motion reefing motor located in a watertight casing at the open end of the parachute. The motor reeled in a thin steel cable which closed the bite of the parachute down to a few meters as it hung deep underwater at the end of its cable. Now the steamer's engines went slow ahead and the great parachute began to open as far as the draw line tightened by the reefing motor would permit, but still creating much drag behind the slowly moving vessels. As the speed of the steamer increased, the parachute on the end of its cable, now secured to bits at the stern of the ship, began to approach the surface. It streamed out behind the ship at an ever flatter angle, until some 50 meters astern, the first visible meshes of the chute appeared above the boiling wake. Soon, almost the whole pocket of the great mass of metal ribbons was whirling and flashing near the surface like a school of flying fish. The long sailcloth roll had been pushed up beneath the parachute by the dynamics of the water and was raising the whole thing above the surface, much as a man on an aquaplane is supported by it. Dot at last, the parachute lay with its whole length clear of the water and was kept narrow within the width of its supporting sail by the drawstring. Dot now a man on deck pushed a button and a solenoid in each of the two disc-like affairs at the far end of the sail pushed off two can-shaped covers. This revealed on each disc a little water wheel with spoon-shaped paddles. Promptly beginning to revolve in the wake of the advancing steamer, these wheels began to roll up the sail and the parachute within it around their common axle. 
it seemed that the towed sail was growing shorter, as the roll it made at its after end grew thicker and thicker. Some 40 meters astern of the steamer, this rolling up process stopped due to the weight of the axle and its burden being too great to be supported above water by the now shortened sail. At this point an electric motor began to rotate the huge drum upon which the towing sail had been stowed. The sail was wound back onto it until the great mass, nearly 12 feet in diameter, between whose folds lay the dual layers of sail and parachute, was clear of the water. Just before this emerged, there appeared an enormous swivel weighing some two tons. This swivel, joining the parachute suspension line to the shroud lines of the great canopy, was to prevent any fouling of the latter if the body of the booster should begin to rotate while in descent. The carpet like roll of parachute and towing sail was not hauled in board, but secured to the after section of the hull, well above the waterline. Then, as the steamer's crew began to turn in earnest and her course was set for Christmas Island, the radio flashed the welcome news of another successful booster salvage to the ferry command. Minus zero, the spacious inspection and repair building for recovered boosters stood close by the bulkhead of the inner basin of Christmas Island. As the steamer came alongside, the ship's crane deposited the booster gently on a wire trailer which was then promptly hauled into the building. Here the reconditioning procedure began immediately, starting with the drying process by blasts of hot air. These removed any remaining traces of water from the booster's ducting within a few hours. Still on its trailer, the booster next went into one of the test chambers, where it was thoroughly inspected for dents, damage and sprung rivets. The electricians connected the plugs on either end to their multiple testing circuits which terminated in a profusion of test panels upon which glittered masses of switches, gauges, meters and test lamps. This revealed any defect in the magnetic valves, switching relays, serve motors and the rest of the complicated equipment which rendered the launching of a serious swell nigh automatic. Other mechanics connected compressed air mains to the tubing of the propulsion unit, verifying its leak proofness and the operation of its multiplicity of valves. Any defects revealed during these inspections were immediately made good by specially trained crews carrying appropriate replacement parts. Usually there were a few minor elements whose operation might be considered unsatisfactory such as a sticky relay or a recalcitrant valve. All such commonly required parts were kept in stock in the building itself and could be obtained without delay. But occasionally there was major damage to be repaired. In such cases, which might vary from a crack in a seam weld on the rocket motor to a defective turbo pump, the entire hull section of the booster might be hoisted by the overhead crane, as an undershirt is stripped from a patient in a hospital. The workmen would swarm around the inner structure like bees and remove the defective unit, installing a new motor or turbo pump in laborious hours or even days of effort. One of the regular operations in preparing a salvaged booster for a new flight was the replacement of the exhausted deceleration powder rockets. Each of these ten rockets, as it checked the descent of the great booster a few meters above the ocean, developed a full 250 tons of thrust. It was a little more than backslash VZ meters in diameter and was about 2 meters long. The powder charge weighed 2.5 tons and was loaded in steel drums weighing almost 1.5 tons empty. When the powder was ignited, it burned for 2 seconds, expelling its gas in a violent jet of flame at a pressure of 200 atmospheres to produce the upward thrust which slowed the downward motion of the plunging booster. When this work was completed and the test section had certified the booster as ready for service, a tractor hooked onto the trailer and dragged it over a pit where the parachute was installed. This pit was just outside the building. The parachutes themselves were taken directly from the salvage steamer to a separate shop where they were removed from the rolled towing sails, thoroughly inspected, and finally given a new coating of corrosion proofing. Then they were skillfully loaded into special metal containers and sent to the installation pit. Here a hydraulic ram pushed the container upwards into the parachute housing of the booster. It was locked in and the suspension cable was attached. Two assembly sheds were located some eight miles away along the ring of the atoll, 
on which a wide concrete road had been constructed. The trailer was towed to the sheds not far from the launching site. Each shed was an enormous, tower-like structure some 70 meters high and each could contain four complete series at a time. Within each shed there was a mighty overhead traveling crane which lifted the complete booster slightly from its trailer as it came in, while the trailer was removed. The heavy metal annulus from which the launch would be made was on rails and was run under the boost to which the crane gently lowered onto it. It was not time to mount the second, or baby, booster, as the Space Forces called it. Looking somewhat like an egg truncated at one end and in the middle, it was brought into the shed and made ready. It was 20 meters in diameter at one end, thus matching that of the big booster. At the upper end it tapered roundingly to 10 meters, above which section the third stage would find its place. The whole baby booster was about 14 meters high. Now the traveling crane lifted the baby and set it in place atop the stumpy taper of the big booster's upper level. The taper also served as jet deflector for the baby when the latter's rocket motor began to spew flames after the propellants of the larger and lower rocket stage were exhausted. Around the taper there were four vertical guide rails into which the baby was now carefully fitted. A bare meter above the tip of the jet deflector cone, the lower part of the small booster came to a stop. Four mechanical couplings which provided the rigid connection between the stages clicked shut. They would part electromagnetically only in flight, when the big booster was to drop off. As the couplings snapped shut, the multiple pole electric jacks and plugs also connected firmly. Now the crane fetched four large rectangular cover plates. These would close the annular gap between the two stages. Just before the baby booster's motor fired, these cover plates would be released by explosive bolts so that the jet might freely emerge around the lower stage's conical top. The ignition cable leading to the explosive bolts was plugged in, and thus the first part of the assembly was complete. When the top stages had completed their trip to the orbit of departure and returned, after discharging their freight they landed on a runway not far from the assembly shed. The runway stood on piles within the protected waters of the atoll and the date of completion had been a masterpiece of coordination between the space forces and the contractors. Like the others, the top stages also were thoroughly checked after each landing. A hangar was available for this purpose, nor were they approved for other flights until the inspection had been completed. When their retractable wings were spread, they looked rather more like conventional all-wing aircraft than rockets. Their wings were highly raked and had two conspicuous steps where the thinner retractable outer wings protruded from the thicker midsections. The span was 52 meters. Approximately where the first step of the telescoping retraction took place, were two vertical stabilizers with rudders behind them. In comparison with the Martian landing craft, with their much greater span, their hulls appeared rather fat and stubby. This was largely due to the huge flat bases, 9.8 meters across. Without this great area, the top stages could not have expanded their gases of combustion down to almost one hundredth of an atmosphere. Thus with their length of but 15 meters the hulls appeared rather like short artillery projectiles. The top stages, when belonging to cargo vessels, received their loads of non-fluid cargo immediately after their inspections, and were towed to the assembly sheds on their own landing gear. Their wings were hydraulically retracted as the tractor drew them into the shed. Here two thick, round steel tubes were inserted transversely fore and aft, so that each protruded from both ends. The fore ends were picked up by slings from the crane, the ship was hoisted horizontally and the landing gear was retracted. When the ship had been hoisted halfway, the stern was lowered and finally swung into position above the double booster and lowered into its seat. Thus the third stage, once in place, comprised the forward point of the whole enormous rocket. When the three stages had been joined, two men entered the pilot's cabin in the top stage and thoroughly checked the various flight mechanisms. If everything worked well, the ship was declared in flight condition. There were four separate launching sites on Christmas Island, two of them being operated in conjunction with each assembly shed. When a ship was to be launched, 
One of the great sliding doors in the building opened to permit its 60 meters of height to pass out. The powered launching platform, complete with jet deflector and running upon wider gauge tracks, bore the vertical rocket ship to the takeoff site, located a scant mile from the building. The site itself was no more than a wide concrete platform permitting various auxiliary vehicles to approach the waiting rocket ship and eliminating, as far as possible, any damage from the pelting of the surroundings with rocks and pebbles that would take place if the mighty blast of the jet were to impinge upon unprepared ground. When the site was reached, the launching car was immovably anchored by tong like brake shoes to the rails and a web like series of propellant hoses was attached. Each of the three stages was filled with two propellants independently through separate hose lines. A system of pipelines connected the filling stations at the launching sites with the storage tanks near the harbor. There was a fuel meter on each outlet, permitting maximum accuracy during the tanking procedure. When the filling was over, the elevator gantry on its trailer was brought alongside the ship and the crew went aboard. All was ready for another takeoff for the orbit of departure. Zero, Braden's schedule called for the departure of two ships every 12 hours. They would be launched almost simultaneously and proceed in formation to the orbit of departure. This cycle of 12 hours was determined by the positions of the growing Mars vessels in their orbit, for there were only certain moments at which a Sinus ship could take off from Christmas and reach them. The orbit of departure lay in the plane of the ecliptic, namely at an angle of 23.5 degrees to the plane of the equator, it is in the plane of the ecliptic that both Earth and Mars circle around the Sunday the group of vessels on which the assembly work was being done circled the Earth once every two hours and this made them cross the equator once every hour. In the meantime, the Earth was slowly rotating under the orbit of departure making a complete revolution every 24 hours. Hence, after every half revolution, or 180 degrees, the same point on the equator which was now just under the vessels, would again be exactly under them, they having meanwhile made six full circles around the earth. Therefore it was always possible to launch a second flight just 12 hours after one launching had been made from Christmas Island. But if one flight had reached the orbit of departure in a northeasterly direction, the succeeding flight 12 hours later would be obliged to depart southeast, for only after a further 12 hours could the orbit of departure be attained via the northerly track. Chapter 13 Incidents and Adventures No great achievement of a technical nature has ever taken place without exacting a tribute of sacrifice and Braden's magnificent space lift was not long in following suit. It was noon on a March day in 1983 when the two ferry vessels, Andromeda and Max Valia, took off at the regulation interval of three seconds. Valia was the leader, with Andromeda close astern. Hardly had the ships begun to respond in velocity to the ear-splitting roar of their great boosters than the ground crews noticed that Andromeda's comet-like propulsive jet suddenly collapsed to nothing. A few seconds later the enormous ship came to a standstill directly over their heads. Contrary to orders, they had become so accustomed to uneventful launchings that they had left the protection of their bunkers as soon as the danger of fire and pounding rocks was over. Now they rushed madly back into cover, that to spend a few seconds of tortured waiting until what seemed a minor earthquake shook the solid bunker, flinging them from side to side. It was followed by a violent explosion, which died away in a series of smaller ones. Then all was silence. They opened their steel doors to hear the wail of a siren which somehow injected a note of belated absurdity into the tragedy, as though anyone might have missed the earthquake, for some thousand feet distant from the launching platform a great mushroom of brown smoke ascended out of what seemed a volcano of roaring white flame. Above it all could be heard the diminishing thunder of the valley on her path to heaven. So intense was the heat from the pyre that not until some fifteen minutes had elapsed could the firefighters and their equipment approach close enough to spread their blankets of foam over what had once been the proud Andromeda. She lay at the center of a shallow crater some two hundred feet in diameter, where hydrazine was still burning with its acrid odor of ammonia. Pieces of the huge rocket combustion chamber could still be recognized, strewn over the bottom of the crater. 
the ruins of the second and top stages lay in a line along the walls of the bowl, indicating that at the moment of impact the great ship had already begun to turn her nose downwards. All around the crater were bits of shattered steel and sheet metal, interspersed with carbonized pieces of electrical equipment. It was quite plain that none of the crew of four had succeeded in leaving the vessel before the catastrophe, although the intense heat had destroyed all traces of their bodies. The sad news brought General Braden to Christmas Island immediately. Shortly after his arrival, a board of inquiry began a search for the causes of the accident. But such was the destruction, and so completely burned and crushed were the pieces of wreckage, that the board was unable to assign any reason to the disaster beyond a wholly hypothetical conclusion that a certain relay must have failed. The particular one selected was the relay which shuts off the flow of propellants to the main booster motor when the second stage is ready to take over. It was assumed that this relay had functioned prematurely, thus depriving the ship of power at the most critical phase of the ascent. Immediately the launching of ferry vessels was interrupted for a week, and every switching relay of every serious vessel was carefully examined. The old spacemen on Christmas Island muttered that the board of inquiry might have done better to call the thing an act of God, for they knew that relays are always the scapegoats in the rocket business when obscurity cloaks the unforeseen. Ever since the first liquid rocket flew, the relay has suffered criticism despite its reputation for reliability and its manifold uses in telephones, power stations and aircraft. Considerable damage to the project was caused by the loss of Andromeda, chiefly in that four able men had perished. These men's vast experience in space would long be missed by the space forces while their many companions and friends sorrowed greatly. The absence of the ship itself was easy to compensate, for production of serious vessels was in full swing at United Spacecraft, and there was no difficulty in adding one more vessel to the line of production. It was, in a sense, fortunate that Andromeda had been a propellant carrier rather than ferrying dry cargo, for no scarce component of a Mars vessel had been lost. But considerable damage had been done to the installations on Christmas Island by the shockwave engendered by the huge explosion. The hangar where the returned top stages were overhauled and inspected looked as though a blockbuster had struck close to it. Fortunately, there had been but one top stage in work at the time, but this was so badly distorted as to be fit only for the junk pile. In the repair shed, where baby boosters were overhauled, a travelling overhead crane had jumped its rails and descended upon two boosters that lay below it, damaging them severely. As though by a miracle, the working crews had survived without a scratch. The nitric acid supply line from the harbour storage tanks to the launching sites was kinked by the shock in several places and leaked considerably. Several filling pumps and their motors were destroyed by acid corrosion. A test of the complicated wiring system connecting the launching sites with the operating bunker showed a wide variety of malfunctions. It had to be laid up for extensive repairs. The big assembly building near Andromeda's launching site, where the three stages of Sirius vessels were fitted together, had all its windows blown out and several of the men working the suffered glass cuts. Even at the relatively distant harbour, ceilings had dropped, windows had been broken, and door frames had been sprung. Aside from the loss of Andromeda herself, there was several hundred thousand dollars damage and a delay of two weeks for the whole operation. Zero, Andromeda's, however, was not to be the only accident to cause loss of life in Braden's ferry operation. Some three months later, Orion fell victim to a sorry fate. Orion had passed the transonic speed range and was approaching the velocity of 1000 meters per second without incident. Suddenly the flight path began to fluctuate. Observers later reported that she had yawed to the left and that the contrail behind her fiery jet then became wavy. A few seconds later, the vessel broke apart. The aftermost portion blew up in an explosion whose shockwave was audible at the launching site much later. The smaller fore part of the ship continued upwards in a steep ballistic parabola, passed its maximum ordinate, and fell with still increasing velocity into the sea. There had been no radio calls from Orion. Flight control immediately dispatched aircraft and rescue boats to the point of impact given by the radar stations, 
but not a trace of the ship could be found before it was engulfed by the ocean. After several hours of search, a survivor was picked up in an exhausted condition by a rescue boat, his rubber raft having functioned in the nick of time. Sergeant Kenneth R. Andrews had been the radio operator of the unfortunate Orion and reported the accident as follows. The gyroscopic steering gear of the big booster had malfunctioned for no ascertainable reason. Andrews had noticed a sudden sharp tilt of the vessel from her programmed heading, accompanied by a disagreeable centrifugal acceleration. This motion was arrested by a returning couple, followed by a swing in the opposite direction and three or four violent oscillations. The skipper had punched the emergency cut-off button in fear that the high angle of attack might rupture the whole ship. Then he released the big booster which was at once decelerated and separated by its huge chute. He ordered the crew to don the helmets of their pressure suits and to attempt to abandon ship at maximum ordnance. Here the stagnation air pressure would be a minimum and thus offer the least hindrance to exit from the still upward bound ship. After receiving the order, there was but a minute before the maximum ordnance was reached. The preparations for abandonment took place hurriedly. Andrews himself was shot out by his ejection seat into the thin atmosphere like a champagne cork. This moved him well away from the ship. He allowed himself to fall from the 40 km altitude of the maximum ordnance to 5 km before opening his chute to avoid congealing himself. Whether anyone else got out he could not report. The rescue planes and boats continued the search for two days without further results. Operation Mars had three more victims. Zero. Captain Henry Burke of the Hercules was to experience an adventure sensational even to a veteran spaceman. Hercules had been climbing for 207 seconds and it was time for the speed indicator to throttle the thrust of the baby booster and ignite the top stage, which would then force itself away from the baby under its own power. The impulse signal was given correctly, and the painful acceleration of the baby boost didn't diminished, the cover plates detached themselves, the top stage ignited properly. Then it happened. The magnetic disconnector between the stages malfunctioned and no separation took place. Burke immediately pulled the emergency baby boost to release, but the booster did not fall off. Then Burke cut off the propellants to the top stage motor and waited tensely. A few seconds later the already weak thrust of the baby booster died entirely and, as the last propellants burned, a jar ran through the vessel flinging the men forward. The decelerating chute of the baby booster had opened. And the propellant laden top stage was still clinging to it like a leech. The crew glanced nervously at the captain who, feigning indifference, was cudgeling his brains for a solution. The ship's instruments showed a velocity of 6,420 meters per second, an altitude of 64 kilometers, and an angle of elevation to the horizon of 2.5 degrees. The weight of the baby booster, now exhausted of propellants, was 70 tons. It clung insistently to the top stage. The open deceleration chute was calculated for this weight only and was expected gradually to reduce velocity in the thin upper atmosphere. The top stage, still loaded with propellants, weighed 130 tons, so that the little chute was now attached to a full 200 tons. Such a weight could not be slowed down by the chute in the time available, and the ship would tend to remain at relatively high altitudes for but a limited period as a result of her small angle of elevation. Soon she would tilt downwards and enter denser air with too high a velocity, thus the chute would inevitably tear away from her. The first step was obviously to lighten the top stage by dumping the propellants. Burke closed the servo-operated hydrazine valve and whipped his turbopump to its full delivery. This forced nitric acid alone into the rocket motor from which it emerged through the areas uncovered by the jettisoning of the side plates, to be sucked out and dissipated in the rushing air. After less than a minute the tank emptied. Burke closed the nitric acid valve and opened the hydrazine. This drained the other tank thus reducing the weight of the top stage to 47 tons by expelling 83 tons of propellants. The chute was then laden with 117 tons rather than the 70 for which it had been designed. The situation was much improved over that of the former load of 200 tons, 
but there was still great danger of descending too rapidly into lower and denser air. To make matters worse, the vessel was beginning to roll slowly around her longitudinal axis to the right. Burke undertook the risk of rigging out the telescoping wing panels of the top stage, whereupon he applied full left aileron. This stopped the roll and he pulled back on the flippers. Then began a weird and wonderful flight, for the chute of the baby booster was still slowing them down gradually. The chute was extended behind an almost conventional aircraft whose wings were producing lift and could extend the time during which the odd and unforeseen configuration could remain at altitude, compared to what this time would have been had the wingless rocket followed a natural descent path dragging the chute. At the controls of the queer craft sat a pilot bemused by the apparent ease with which things had gone up to that point. Burke was grubbing in his memory to remember the correlation of altitude and velocity which corresponded to the flight path of the baby booster and its chute alone. He wanted to try to fly the weird combination of rocket and aircraft according to that data, and he cursed silently the paucity of information in his flight data folder. At the moment, he was entirely out of sympathy with the Space Force pen pushers who hadn't foreseen that a captain might some day have to make a landing with his baby booster still attached. Had they really envisaged every emergency as they claimed, he would not now find himself without that vital curve sheet. So he simply hauled back on his slipper controls as far as he could without tearing off the wings, coaxing every possible bit of lift out of the straining panels. For his own life and the lives of his crew, he must enter the lower air strata as slowly as possible. That would reduce the deceleration which endangered the parachute. Two and one half minutes had elapsed before Hercules' velocity was down to 5,300 meters per second at just under 70 km altitude. The great vessel soared east northeast across the deserted Pacific. The deceleration of the chute had been reduced from 1.8 grams at the time of chute release to about 0.7 grams by reason of the gain in altitude and the decrease in velocity. Burke became conscious of a new worry, he might be able to use his wings to prevent too rapid a descent, but the mass of his vessel was greater than that of the baby booster alone, and he could not prevent her from descending to a point far beyond where the baby booster would normally have taken to the ocean. Salvage ships would be awaiting the solitary booster, and away beyond that point there would be none. Furthermore, the baby booster's deceleration rockets were not calculated to check the fall of such a great mass as now composed of their odd aircraft. The cabin might well be crushed by the impact on the sea and bar their exit, and the empty propellant tanks of the booster might admit water and sink them below the pitiless waves of the Pacific. He hated the thought of making a halfway decent landing with the prospect of drowning with his crew like rats in a trap. Burke grasped the intercom. Radio. SOS to Christmas Island from Hercules. Top stage not separated form baby booster. Now gliding, wings extended, on projection of great circle of ascent track. Send cross bearings and locations any sea vessels in this region. Anticipate landing 1,970 km distant from a launching site. Prefer to land near any vessel in that area. Another thought came to him with a shiver. P.S., he said over the intercom, hope nitric acid dump doesn't corrode my chute too fast. After a couple of minutes their cross bearings began to come in. 500 km ahead and slightly to port, the tanker Patrick was steaming towards San Diego. Burke would attempt to land alongside her. Hercules' velocity was now down to 3,000 meters per second and her altitude to about 48 km, but the deceleration had become almost unbearable with the descent into denser air. Five G's pressed Burke against his shoulder belt where he gasped for breath, barely able to read the instruments and to keep his craft in the flight attitude. Slowly the nose began to point downwards and when it reached 30 degrees, the agony relented. With this angle and 31 km high, they slipped below the 500 m per second mark and the co-pilot with his binoculars reported a steamer diagonally beneath them. It could only be the Patrick and Burke, still able somewhat to control the winged parachute bomb which the Hercules now was, 
headed in the direction of the tanker. At 10 km altitude, Hercules pointed vertically downwards like a parabomb before impact. Her crew hung forward in their belts, gazing terrorized at the uprushing ocean. Already they could make out the white caps and the bone in the teeth of the Patrick steaming under forced draft towards the point of their prospective dunking. 50 meters above the water, the circumferential checking rockets in the baby booster above them roared out and the deceleration again threw them into their belts with violence. The jets from the rockets screamed past their portholes in a mantle of flame. Then the greenish darkness of the sea veiled a port, breaking some of them and compressing the air into the crew's ostarken tubes. Their ears cracked. This must be the end. But there was a rolling and twisting of their cabin, and sunlight burst through the broken port, reviving their flagging spirits. Hercules stood like a kinboy upon her fractious baby booster and they were safe. An hour later, Burke and his crew watched from the tank of the great mass riding safely on the ground swell of the Pacific, the great wings torn and twisted by the impact. The Patrick stood by until the arrival of the salvage ship Sea Lion. The latter, after considerable difficulty, got the badly damaged rocket aboard and, with its crew, steamed off for Christmas Island. Braden reacted typically to the report of the accident. His radio to Burke read tersely, congrats. More luck than brains. Braden. Holt, who had been about to leave Christmas Island, delayed his departure and interviewed Burke in detail. When he had heard the whole tale, he was convinced that Braden had been unjust to Burke, to whose presence of mind, Holt felt, was not only responsible for the survival of the crew, but had also provided valuable information on how to avoid future troubles of the same nature. Holt's wire to Braden Reed, Burke's brains beat bad luck. A few weeks later, Burke's dearest wish came true when he read his orders to command one of the Mars vessels. Chapter 14, Farewell to Earth It was past noon on March 1, 1985 in San Diego. The morning fog had gone and the sidewalks were crowded as they had not been since the day of the armistice which ended the Great War. Police held back the enormous crowds thronging every street leading to the harbor. The city was gaily decorated with star-spangled bunting and the rainbow colors of the United States of the Earth. Greetings to the Mars adventurers hung in great transparencies across the wide thoroughfares. The steamer Queen of Hawaii lay alongside the string piece of San Diego's waterfront wall. It was in her that the personnel of Operation Mars would sail for Christmas Island at slack tide in the evening. Four years had passed since a memorable session of the Congress of Earth had passed the Appropriations Bill, which was to make into a reality the exploration of interstellar space and had loaded upon the shoulders of its protagonists the enormous burden which such an extension of a man's realm implied. The preparatory work had been unspectacular and quiet, and the general public had become almost unconscious of the mighty deeds which were preparing in their midst. But the departure of these intrepid men had again concentrated the light of publicity upon the enterprise, and Mars again was a familiar word upon the lips of all and sundry. Once more a spate of curiosity welled up as to his mysteries. America left no stone unturned to send forth her sons into illimitable space with proper honors and the proud pomp which was their due. The great cruising steamer was full dressed with signal flags. Her ample decks swarmed with visitors and voyagers whose families had come to bid them farewell. Fathers and mothers crowded the companionways. Aunts, uncles, cousins, brothers and sisters of the intrepid explorers cluttered every available space. Here and the lovers made plans for reunions when the three years demanded by the expedition should be over. Gary and Catherine Holt stood on the boat deck looking at the harbor with its flotillas of submarines and destroyers nested beside their stodgy mother ships. Gary, I know you'll do it, she said without looking at him. Everything is as ready as we could make it, he answered. God will have to do the rest. The deep-toned whistle called those ashore who were not to depart. With a quiet kiss, Catherine descended their long, covered gangplank. The Space Forces band on the deck struck up a merry air and paper serpentines flew between the ship's rail and the pier. With a last loud blast from the whistle, moorings were cast off and the water between the white steel side of the vessel and the shore grew wider. 
Catherine held up her crossed fingers to Gary's receding figure. He could not see her brimming eyes above her smile fading into the distance and the crowd surrounding her as the ship pulled away. As the Queen of Hawaii drew clear, every whistle, siren, horn and bell in the city of San Diego blasted its cheering fanfare to Holt and Knight and their enterprising band of spacefarers on the afterdeck of the tall ship. This is it, Tom, said Holt quietly. Zero. Coronado lay astern and the vessel had begun to lift and descend to the mild swell of the Pacific when the call to dinner rang from the ship's melodious gongs. The great dining hall was bright as the mass crews seated themselves, to their full number of seventy, at long tables, one of which was occupied by the leaders who had done the planning. Braden, Spencer, Peyton and Holt took their seats with the ten captains of the spaceships waiting in the orbit of departure. The captains were Henry Burke, whose adventure with the Hercules had earned him the sobriquet of Captain Marvel, Anthony Haynes, United Spacecraft's recent chief pilot, whose imperturbability had become legendary, and Frank Sherman who had been a spaceship captain in the last war. He had emerged from retirement as a major in the Space Forces when the Mars expedition was activated. Another reactivated major was fat, cheerful Freddie Duncan with his inexhaustible fund of salty and passable anecdotes. Trigv Nordenskjold was a Norwegian lieutenant. A slim and silent fellow, he had made more than sixty ferry trips to the departure orbit in Sirius without the slightest incident. He'd been insistent that he could make as good landings on Mars as he could at home. Herbert Stmetz, Lieutenant Colonel, Space Forces, an old-time space skipper. Fred Van Neumann, a young, intrepid-looking captain. Lieutenant Colonel Tom Knight, with his light hair and winning ways, quiet, contemplative Glenn Hubbard and the effervescent. Smart Frenchman Charlie Laroque. Little persiflage passed between them as they sat. Each man was too much affected by thoughts of the great adventure ahead. They had bidden farewell to their loved ones, to wander forth into the emptinesses of space for years, perhaps, indeed, forever. They would stand on the brink of the unknown. At a table to the right sat Hal Royer, navigator in chief, surrounded by the ten who were to work at that trade and simultaneously co pilot their spaceships. The next table was for the engineers to the last man experienced burner boys from the war or the Lunetta ferry. Their dean, tough, grizzled John Wigand, vainly attempted to draw them into a discussion of specific impulse and the hypergolic propellants which eliminated the complicated machinery formerly required to induce combustion between fuels and oxygen carriers. John had almost assembled the circling and waiting Mars ships with his own hands during the fifteen trips he had made to the departure orbit. Blindfolded, he could have laid his hand upon any tool in any space vessel. He knew more of the coming problems than any other engineer. But his attempts to lecture them fell on deaf ears. Their minds were elsewhere. On the other side of the dining room sat the scientists. Dr. Marian Gudunek was a swarthy Yugoslavian research linguist whose fluent 17 languages might enable him to establish verbal communication with Martians and permit his to study and codify their speech, if any. Near him sat John Henry Billingsley, as British as Brixton with his RAF moustache. He had abandoned his archaeological diggings in India and China and left his book on the Ming Dynasty incomplete so that he might plumb the depths of historical development on Mars. Douglas McRae would record zoological facts, Howard Ross would botanize. Sam Wolfe's geological hammer was ready. Dr. Hans Bergman knew Mars geography better than he did that of the Earth. James Barrett MD was the surgeon of the expedition and certainly the world's most distinguished practitioner of space medicine. Hardly had he graduated from medical school than his keen mind apprehended the variety of medical problems which attended flight through space. It was not long before he had made the solution of these problems his main life's work. 
the effect of high accelerations upon the body caused him to perform studies with the human centrifuge which provided the groundwork for his solution to the difficulty in breathing called forth by the inability of the chest muscles to expand the breast under high g apostrophe s. His discovery that hyperventilation during the low g periods would store enough oxygen in the blood of a spacefarer to allow him to withstand the short periods of high g's without breathing at all had made him the medical advisor of the space forces, entirely aside from the many other medical innovations he pioneered. During Lunetta's trial period, Barrett was her surgeon and was able to investigate the physiological and psychological effects of the absence of any acceleration, even that of gravity, the one g to which all creatures of Earth are subjected. Of these, the sense of equilibrium was the most affected and the most difficult of solution. When the war was over, he set up his famous Institute of Space Medicine and left it for a time only because of his devotion to the Mars Project. Not far from the scientists sat the radio men, headed by their boss, spare, snowy haired Francis Lassini of Canada. It was he who had designed the high duty radio sets which were to bridge the unfathomable distances which would soon separate them from the Lunetta orbit. He was one of the doubters until he met Holt in Lunetta. But the darkness and solitude of the deep heavens bewitched him during his long struggle to perfect satisfactory interplanetary radio in the orbit. Then he sought and was granted the opportunity to communicate personally across the multi-million mile radio bridge his genius had conceived. Lieutenant Hempstead and his military troop of 18 sat at another table. It was they who would guard and guide the landing party. John Wigan would keep them employed during the extended coasting flight through space and they had been trained to a tick along many lines. Some of them would preside in the ship's galleys with their electric stoves. Others would operate the busy bees from ship to ship or apply the damage control knowledge they had acquired in the simulators for repair personnel. All of them were to be of the landing party except Jimmy Cox, the heavyweight chief cook and storekeeper, and his two helpers. Once on solid Mars, they would drive the caterpillars and, if necessary, employ their light weapons to protect the others. They would taste all the surprises the red planet might hold in store. Zero, in the orbit of departure, the Mars vessels had been abandoned by their shipkeepers and were manned by their regular crews. All the ferry vessels had returned to Christmas Island except Astroliner, the luxurious command vessel of the Space Forces. In her cabin, Braden, Spencer and Dick Payton awaited the final departure of the strange agglomeration of cumbersome shapes apparently floating motionless in space some few hundred yards from their observation ports. Braden terminated a short valedictory radio talk, reminding the crews of the scope and intrepidity of the Enterprise. He stressed the responsibility to the peoples of Earth resting upon them and emphasized the importance of Spartan discipline. Lack of the latter might jeopardize not only success, but their own lives. Six journalists scribbled tensely at notes, reporting the great departure while two newsreel men worked their cameras under the unaccustomed handicaps of weightlessness. Outside the observation port, Holt's flagship, Polaris, hung motionless at the head of the column of Mars craft. She bore the spherical control and living nacelle at her four dot silvery in color. It exhibited the seven astrodomes and sundry portholes. Behind it and vertical to the longitudinal axis of the vessel was the framework of the cruciform forward tank retainer. The fat-bellied dual hydrazine tanks for the first propulsive maneuver hung swollen and silver from its outer ends. Each contained 540 cubic meters of the liquid dot below them and supported from below by a second tank retainer were the nitric acid tanks for the maneuvers tanks of almost equivalent dimensions. In the other plane of the cruciform tank retainers hung the elongated tanks for the second and third maneuvers. In the center, almost obscured by the latticework backbone of the vessel, were the attenuated pipe-like storages for the ultimate maneuver of adaptation to the terrestrial orbit when the expedition should return. The reserve tanks for propellants left over from prior maneuvers were cramped between them and the huge spheres for the maneuver of departure. Their filling would begin with any excess which might remain when the first maneuver was complete. There was a long extension protruding transversely from the after tank retainer. 
a universal joint at its end supported their long, gutter-like solar reflector for the power plant. The mercury vapor turbine and its electric generator could be seen beside it. Behind the after tank retainer were the serpentines of the propellant piping leading from the tanks to the feed pumps. Above the latter was the enormous rocket motor, flat, and in appearance not unlike a huge cake. Around its rim were the four movable steering rockets for flight path control. Eklund astern of the Polaris floated the cargo vessel Robert H. Goddard. The Goddard's appearance was dominated by the enormous wings of the landing boat constituting her forepart and serving as crew nacelle. Behind the stern of the boat, almost concealed by the great struts of the connecting structure of the ship, was a spare propulsion plant intended to replace any which might prove defective in the Goddard or some other Mars vessel. Goddard carried no tanks or propellants for the last tow maneuvers, for she would never make them. She was to be left circling Mars. But to make up for it, she was laden like a Mexican burro with all sorts of tanks and equipment for the easement of the tasks of her sister ships. Among her burdens were the large telescope, the solar reflector and the circular reflecting antenna of the high duty radio set. She also carried two busy bees, oxygen tanks, the water supply, and many objects whose applications were not immediately apparent. In Astroliner, the loudspeaker had been hooked up to intercept communications between the ships. Colonel Holt in command of Polaris speaking. X minus six minutes. Send ready reports as called. Nordensk chilled. Nordensk chilled, cargo ship Goddard, ready. Ponderously came the other reports. Sherman, passenger ship Aldebaran, ready. Van Neumann, passenger ship Arcturus, ready. Duncan, passenger ship Regulus, ready. Hubbard, cargo ship Oboth, ready. Burke, passenger ship Capella, ready. LaRoque, passenger ship Vega, ready. Haynes, cargo ship Ziolkowski, ready. Stmetz, passenger ship Antares, ready. To squadron from Polaris, time x minus 3. At x equals 0, beginning with Polaris and in order of reporting, ships will apply thrust at 30 second intervals. The seconds dragged wearily as tension among the men in Astroliner waxed, their eyes glued to the ports. Then Holt's voice spoke calmly. X minus ten, nine, eight. At the word three, a tiny flame leapt from the motor of Polaris, to be followed by a long trail of fire. The thunder of the jet was imperceptible, for this was no rocket launch from Earth. There was no air to transmit the sound even across the short span between Astroliner and the convoy. Slowly, very slowly, the colossal vessel began to move across their field of vision and disappeared. Then the Goddards. Flaming jet lashed out and she too bore away majestically with her out thrust wide wings. Aldebaran, Arcturus, Regulus, one after another, they forged into the illimitable distances by the consecutive ignition of their fiery tails. Amid a silence in which the buzzing of an at might have been heard, the cumbersome craft departed from view. The cabin of Astroliner resumed it to a mechanical buzzing as the pilot ran up his flywheels and twisted his vessel in space so that Braden might again see the convoy. That they were against the velvet black sky with its unwinking stars. An orderly line of ten man made comets trailed ten flaming exhausts laterally across the heavens, and Braden's heart swelled within him. This was truly a departure on man's proudest exploration, a departure in flaming confidence. He was still musing upon the incalculable possibilities facing the space crews when Astroliner's jet roared out to start him and the other stay at homes back to Christmas Island. Chapter 15 Killing time between the world's five days of the voyage to Mars were behind the ten ships of the convoy. After the initial impulse away from Earth, their intervals had slowly become greater. After three days, at the exact end of which each ship had fixed her position by stellar parallax, Hal Royer, the head navigator, reported to Holt that Ziolkowski was the only vessel to have applied her thrust so accurately as to both direction and amount that she needed no correction. Duncan, the solid fellow in command of Regulus, had slipped ahead so far that the sunlight on her glittering tanks appeared but like one of the fixed stars in the dim distance. 
Birkin Capella brought up the tail of the procession, some forty miles astern of Zyolkowski. Polaris held her position well and was but little ahead of Zyolkowski. All radioed orders for corrective maneuvers to return the nine stragglers to Zyolkowski's track. Extreme concern for economy of propellants might have dictated that closing up the convoy should be conducted so that the ships would be in close formation only when near Mars, but Holt had his reasons for reassembling them without delay. He felt that a few thousand kilograms of propellants would be well expended in keeping the ships near enough so that in case of damage mutual help would be at hand in a minimum of time. So the ships started their steering rockets and maneuvered themselves towards Zyolkowski. Within ten days no more than ten miles separated them. By now, the Earth was some one and one half million kilometers distant and appeared about as large as the moon does to Earth dwellers. She reminded the observers of the waxing half moon, due to her right half alone being illuminated by the Sunday but that half shone more brightly than ever the moon, so brightly indeed that no contrasts upon it could be distinguished with the naked eye. Some distance from the Earth, they could see a luminous discolate of about one quarter Earth's diameter. This was the moon itself faithfully following Earth on her path around the Sun. The sight brought the men of Operation Mars to full appreciation of the significance of their departure into the planetary world, they could see Earth and her companion actually submerging in the depths of space. Glances at the spectacle filled them with a kind of humble pride at their privilege of being the first to witness it. Zero, not long after the maneuver. A stiff watch list and work program was instituted in order to accustom the men to the even and uninterrupted passage of time. Since there was no natural sequence of day and night, the good old military principle of invoking authority to determine which was which went into effect. At exactly 2000, expedition time, blinds were pulled over all ports except those of the pilot's cabin and astrodoms, to be opened only at 0700. Meals of course, were served on the dot. Weightlessness even proved a problem for the old Space Force veterans when it came to eating. Sinus trips had been so short that there had never been a question of more than an odd sandwich or so, while aboard Lunetta the synthetic gravity had brought the business of food down to earth, so to speak. The consumption of a full meal under weightless conditions was an exciting novelty for almost everyone. Food was served in pannikins with spring loaded covers and no knives were used. Edibles requiring cutting were chopped up in the kitchen. Nor were there forks or spoons. The interstellar voyagers reached cautiously underneath the covers of their pannikins with tong like devices to prevent the whole meal from floating unsupported before them. Soups and other fluids required even more inventive treatment being served in flexible containers with nipples not unlike those used for infants. By taking the nipple in the mouth and squeezing the container, the fluid could be expressed and sucked to a point where the muscles of the esophagus could begin their work. Nothing could be poured as it could when gravitation exerts its helpful influence. At 2000 every day, each crew would assemble to listen to a radio broadcast from Earth. Perhaps the most welcome event of the 24 hours. Oberth had a receiver which caught a special program for them from the high duty radio set near Lunetta, which Lusini had spent two years developing and assembling to assure communication between the expedition and the Earth. This was then rebroadcast by Oberth on the intership frequency. It usually brought news, a lecture or so, and music. Although from time to time, some regular American program was retransmitted. The Mars crews might hear of hostilities of a minor nature between Hindus and Muslims flickering and dying, or even reports of their own doings. When a commercial would emphasize the availability of some new toothpaste in the drugstore just around the corner, roars of laughter would go up over the assertions concerning just how essential to civilized existence such products had become. The scientists kept themselves busy with studies and writings on their own specialties, and the captains, navigators and engineers relieved one another on watch. The main duty of such a watch while coasting unpowered through space was to keep all the auxiliary machinery operating at highest efficiency. 
and to see that no part of the complicated installation suffered from neglect. This called for rather more activity than appeared superficially. One important item was the temperature of the propellants. Each passenger ship had four tanks for each maneuver except the last, for which there were but two. In addition, there were the four reserve containers. It had proved necessary to distribute the propellant over so many tanks to establish a proper symmetry of masses during each maneuver. Temperatures in the 18 tanks were kept constant by thermostats operating the reflecting Venetian blinds. The angular attitudes of the ships tended to vary considerably by movements of the personnel within, so that the inner tanks were shaded by the outer ones in very irregular fashion. Early design studies had showed that certain attitudes of the vessels would permit supercooling of the inner tanks, because in such attitudes, no sunlight could reach them. Hence, from time to time the watchkeeper had to start the flywheels and move the vessel out of the prohibited attitude. Then there was the air conditioning system. Although temperatures, humidities, pressures and oxygen content were automatically regulated, there were tests to be made and regularly logged. An ingenious device constantly showed the ratio between the flows of treated and untreated air. It would reveal immediately whether there was any tiny escape of the precious respiration gas into the great void outside. Temperatures of water and oxygen storage tanks had to be read and recorded, as also were those of the food storage. The electrical power supply required the most constant supervision. It was the heart of the whole complicated system of enunciators remote reading gauges and such which kept the man on watch informed on the condition of the entire vessel. It further worked the various automatic regulators which alone permitted the involved system to maintain the life within it. Electricity fed the gauges and the instrumentation, and turned the temperature controlling blinds to their appropriate angles. Above all, it whirled the pumps and blowers which fed air to the lungs of those few lonesome humans far into the reaches of airless sky. Should the mercury vapor turbine halt, it would be but a few hours before the battery's exhaustion would bring the life-giving air circulation to a stop. Should the current supply fail, the watchkeeper would sound the general alarm and awaken the crew. Then he would radio one of the cargo ships for a power B whose powerful accumulators would keep the blowers and pumps running while repairs were made by the damage control party called in for assistance from other ships. Zero, two weeks from the day of departure, John Wigard began a series of monthly inspections. From ship to ship he went in his busy B, accompanied by three crewmen specially trained by United Spacecraft in troubleshooting and damage control techniques. No detail of the involved structure or machinery escaped his eagle eye in the prying hands of his assistants. Generally he would spend up to three days on each vessel. His three minions, together with the engineer of the ship and John himself would don space suits and climb out to the propulsion feed pumps at their station between the rocket motor and the huge tanks. Here his electrician began to pull plugs and seek scorched contracts or cracked plug bodies which had been allowed to overcool. His plumber might check tubing for hairline cracks caused by excessive heat stresses or the long vibrating of the initial maneuver. His tank expert would search for punctures with a magnifying glass. He would patch the tiniest rift such as was occasionally caused by meteoric dust, lest the self-sealing tank lining fail to plug it. John himself, with the help of the ship's engineer, might lift the turbine cover of the great 5,000 horsepower pump and perhaps decide to replace a wiped bushing dot after thoroughly examining the ship externally for as much as a whole day they would proceed to functional tests. Pressures were applied to parts of the propulsive mechanism to discover leaks. Trial switching operations were run so that the electroneumatic gear might not escape the inquisition. Finally, Wigand and his gang would go over the pilot's compartment with a fine-tooth comb. He and his electrician checked inverters, gyros, computers, switchboards and instrumentation, using portable test panels. They would open relay covers to ascertain the contact pressures or to try the soldering on a cable terminal. Wigand recorded his findings in a red notebook of evil repute, where he also laid out the repair work to be done, with some assistance from his troubleshooters, by the crew of the ship just victimized. 
The latter would procure any required parts from one of the cargo ships. His reports to Holt on the mechanical state of affairs kept the engineers and captains under constant pressure, for he never hesitated to lay the blame for any unsatisfactory condition exactly where he thought it belonged. It was not long before they were so intensive in their own inspections that Trouble John, as they called him, found trouble in finding trouble that he might enter in his horrid red book. Holt discovered that Wigan's tireless X-ray eyes slowly but surely brought him the assurance that he need no longer fear that human mental inertia would prove a satanic factor in his computations. This it might easily have happened, lulled as were the men by the monotony of their seemingly endless voyage, and as susceptible as were the involved mechanisms to neglect. Holt had enough to worry about without that. Chapter 16, Interplanetary Radio Holt found much of his diversion in listening to the tales of adventures on the five continents related by the three interplanetary hitchhikers, Billingsley, McRae and Ross. One day, however, they professed boredom with the confined cabin of Polaris and Holt happily sent them off on a visit to Lusini in Oboth. Here the old radio man lived in monastic seclusion, completely preoccupied with his high-duty radio set. The adventurous three had no particular technical background, but they hoped that the sour Canadian might explain to them how he managed to maintain unbroken communication across so many million miles of sky. The earth and moon appeared no more distinctly than a bright dual star, but the newscasts and music which sprang from the loudspeakers were as clear and undistorted as though they came from a local station around the corner. As Billingsley and company approached Toberth in a busy bee, they could see beyond one of the wide wings of her landing craft hanging obliquely in space, an odd structure some 1,000 feet away from her and wholly separate from the bulky cargo ship. It looked like a silver drum, with hemispherical heads from which extended two four-legged frames on opposite sides. One frame had at its terminal a circular, parabolic, opaque reflector like those of wartime radars, while the other bore a gutter-like, elongated mirroring surface within which was a thick, black tube. The odd device was one of the two high-duty radio sets borne by the cargo vessels, although only this one from Oboth had been put into operation. The bee slipped into the guides at the side of the drum and the men floated inside through the rapidly opened doors. After greeting La Sine, who crouched in front of an enormous instrument panel, they managed to inveigle themselves into such open spaces as could be found amid the electrical apparatus that filled the compartment. Frank, said Billingsley, it's jolly good of you to let three radio ignoramuses into your high voltage jigsaw puzzle. If you're not too busy playing radio footsie with Venus, or something equally abstruse, give us a bit of a lecture on how your interplanetary hookup works. Lasani did not deign to respond to this sally beyond stating that they were in direct, two way communication with a similar station in Lunetta's orbit. It's just like any two radio stations talking to one another, he remarked, only the distances are greater. There are no innovations nor peculiarities about the sets themselves. You talk as though all these millions of kilometers were a secondary consideration, bellowed Billingsley. As a matter of fact, they're only one of many, equally important factors, answered La Sine. When we began to work out this set, all the radio people argued that we couldn't radio across interplanetary distances. So we just worked up some calculations and proved to the doubters that for 40 years they've had the technological means for radioing reliably clear across the solar system. What? shouted the three visitors, amazed. Certainly, right across the whole 12 billion kilometers of Pluto's orbital diameter. Actually, we might transmit almost twice that far, if you want real accuracy, for the figures showed 23 billion must call for almost infinite power to transmit that far. Not at all. 60 kilowatts is all we need and we get them quite easily at the frequency we've selected for this example. For this limiting case, in which we sought to demonstrate to the experts the performance of today's radio equipment, we left out such fancy trimmings as music or voice transmission. At those extreme ranges, we only claim to do business with the simplest and crudest type of communication, namely dot and dash. 
music and voice transmissions are rather tricky, for we have to have what radio people know as bandwidth. Bandwidth means that the receiver, when tuned to a certain wavelength, must also receive a band of longer and shorter waves at the same time, if it is to pick up the modulations with which speech or music affects the carrier wave. When you want to transmit all the finer points of music from an instrument like a violin or cello, the tonal quality of which is determined by its overtones, the truer the transmission is to be, the greater the bandwidth required. But there is an unpleasant obverse to the case of great bandwidth. When you turn up the volume on your domestic receiver, you've all noticed that there's a background noise which increases and largely blurs the reception of distant stations, and this noise is caused by unavoidable heat effects in the tubes of the receiver. In radio technology, there's an inevitable relationship between the noise level and the bandwidth, in that the noise level increases in the same ratio as the latter. Reasonably good reception requires that the useful signal power of the reception be a multiple of the noise power. But the noise level is entirely a vice of the receiving equipment, and has no connection with the distance from which the signal comes. On the other hand, the power of the signal itself decreases as the square of the distance of the receiver from the transmitter, so that, if the distance is doubled, the signal's strength is diminished to one-fourth, and so on. So you see that if we wish to radio over great distances, we must reduce the bandwidth so that the noise level is correspondingly reduced. This is the most important viewpoint in setting up interplanetary radio sets. In the arithmetical example to which I referred concerning radio transmission right across the solar system, we assumed that the bandwidth was reduced to 120 cycles per second. In our computation, we picked a wavelength of 50 centimeters, corresponding to a frequency of 600 megacycles, or 600 million oscillations per second. This means practically that the receiver accurately tuned to a 120 cycle bandwidth can only receive such wavelengths as do not vary by more than 60 oscillations from the 600 million. Based on this wavelength and this narrow bandwidth, communication across 23 billion kilometers with 60 kilowatts of power, and directional reflectors for both transmitting and receiving of 100 square meters, we should still have a signal power exactly equal to the noise power. If these dots and dashes are slow and are visually observed on the screen of an oscilloscope, they can just be distinguished from the grass of the background noises. That's a little dim to me, said McRae, the animal trainer. According to you, the secret of long ranges is to reduce the bandwidth sufficiently, then you say that a wide bandwidth is necessary for music and voice. Nevertheless, we hear beautiful music and speech every evening. How does that fit together? At present we're nothing like 23 billion kilometers away from the transmitter. It's only about 20 million, and we've enough reserve range capacity to set our bandwidth for music and voice. But it won't be long before you'll notice a distinct deterioration in the quality of the reception, for we shall continually have to cut down on our bandwidth as we recede from Earth, so as to prevent the background noise from overwhelming the decreasing signals. But you wanted to know how our system really works, so here's the principle of it. Not far from Lunetta and in her orbit, there's a radio station much like the two we have with us. But instead of our reflecting antennas 3.56 meter diameter and 10 square meters, the Lunetta station has one of quadruple that area. It is 7 meters in diameter, and would be somewhat cumbersome for our circumstances. Power actually radiated from both our transmitter and from that of Lunetta is 10 kilowatts. It is the maximum present day transmitters can put out at our operating wavelength of 10 centimeter. If we base good voice reception upon signal strength of 100 times that of the noise level and if we demand a bandwidth of 5000 cycles for reasonable clarity in voice reception, this means that our system has a range limit for voice communication of about 100 million kilometers. We shall reach this limit on the 160th day of our journey. Then we'll slowly have to dispense with direct voice and music reception from Lunetta. Of course. Our actual range of communication will then in no wise be used up. If we limit ourselves to fast code, 
transmitted automatically, we can reduce our bandwidth from 5000 to 1000 cycles. Since a receiver for automatic telegraphy still operates well when the signal strength is about 20 times that of the noise. The limit of our range for automatic telegraphy is more than 500 million kilometers. Our greatest distance from Earth will be when we are waiting in the Martian orbit and the Earth passes behind the Sun day our radio transmissions will have to overcome a distance of about 377 million kilometers. So you'll see that we never get beyond the range of automatic telegraphy. We shall never in this voyage utilize the extreme ranges which we could attain by brass pounding our dots and dashes slowly, in which case we could further cut down on both bandwidth and surplus signal strength. Billingsley spoke up once more. When Earth is hidden behind the sun, it would seem that radio transmission to our home planet would be blanked off by the sun. That's right, but the period will be short, for the Earth will soon reappear. Do I understand that the reflecting antenna is used for both transmitting and receiving? Asked Ross. Yes indeed, Doctor. It works like the reflector of a searchlight, for the actual transmitting rod antenna lies in its focus. Radio emission emanates from this short rod and is reflected into space as are the light rays from a searchlight. When the rod is connected to the receiving set, Arriving radio emanations are concentrated upon it by the reflector, rather like the way a shaving mirror can concentrate sun rays to burn paper. Then the directive qualities of the antenna reflectors must be an effective means of increasing range, mused Ross. Very much so, answered Lusini. If we were to operate the rod antenna without the reflector, the emanations would spread about spherically into space so that only an infinitesimal part of them would strike the distant receiving antenna. With the directive reflector, we concentrate the radio emission preferably in the direction of the receiver dot then the receiving reflector picks up a goodly part of the impinging energy and concentrates it upon the receiving antenna, providing a further gain. Mathematically, the total effect is given by the product of the transmitting and receiving reflector's areas. You just said that Lunetta's reflector has four times the area of our own, objected Billingsley. Then Lunetta ought to receive our transmissions better than we can get hers. No, that isn't quite correct. We do not concentrate our transmissions quite so effectively with our smaller reflector, but Lunetta is able, with her larger one, to intercept a larger cross-section of our beam. So the effective energy caught by her larger reflector from our less concentrated beam is exactly equal to our lesser amount from her highly concentrated emission. Either way, it's the product of the reflector surfaces that counts. How sharp is our beam? Asked Dross. It's some way degrees. Generally this kind of beam is sharper, the greater the diameter of the reflector is in relation to the wavelength employed. Just a moment. Why, then, don't we shorten the wavelength? 3 or 4 centimeters instead of 10 ought to give better results. Theoretically you're right, but in practice, our wavelength is affected by other factors as well. The main problem is that it is still difficult to build transmitters for powers of the order of magnitude of 10 kilowatts and wavelengths of less than 10 centimeter, although it is thought that it may be done someday. If we reduce power, we sacrifice some of our range, while the narrowing of the beam achieved by shorter wavelengths would lose its value. One more question, please, asked McRae. You said that there was no difficulty in reducing the bandwidth for achieving long range. But that means that the receiver must be tuned very accurately to the transmitter's wavelength. How can you find the frequency at all? I have trouble on my set at home finding the frequency of a certain short wave station. Now you've hit on a touchy question, said Lusini. In our case, tuning to the transmitter is complicated by some special factors. First of all, there's no way of building a transmitter which will not fluctuate to some extent in the emitted wavelength. Ours are stabilized by crystals whose natural frequencies are sharply defined and which prevent any broad variation of the design frequency. But even these crystals are subject to temperature and other variations which prevent complete steadiness in the frequency. We have the same difficulty in our receivers, for, 
If we wish to tune to a definite frequency with such high exactitude, we must use superheterodyne circuits. In the latter, we do not tune the carrier frequency proper, but rather its difference from a frequency standard generated in an oscillator in the receiver. The accuracy of this oscillator, however, depends on a crystal. The sum of the irregularities thus introduced by inevitable variations between receiver tuning and transmitting frequency forces is to stay above a certain minimum bandwidth. Otherwise the transmitter may wander out of the reception band for which our receiver is set. Fortunately, the minimum bandwidth needed for these reasons is only a fraction of what we require for voice transmission or automatic telegraphy. We have still another bugbear which is characteristic of our cosmic radio problem. This is the effect of the relative motion between our ships and the station with which we communicate. It makes the frequency actually received different from that transmitted. This phenomenon is called the Doppler effect. It becomes positive or negative as we approach or recede from the station we are working. In actuality, the Doppler effect during our voyage is composed of four independent motional effects. The first is produced by the presently increasing distance of our vessels from Earth and will be reversed during the return trip. The second motional effect is caused by the rotation around the Earth of the station we are working. The third motional effect will be caused by our circling around Mars after we enter the satellitic orbit there. At that time, the fourth, the most powerful motional effect, will be caused by the relative motion between Earth and Mars. Let me outline for you how the Doppler effect is produced. Let's assume for the moment that the distance between us and the station with which we work is increasing. Waves emitted by that station must overhaul the ship as it tries to get away from them with its own velocity. Therefore the waves strike our antenna in slower sequence than if we were at rest with respect to the transmitting station. You may think of the simile of an ocean liner, a head sea strikes the vessel more frequently than a following sea. The extent of the role played by the Doppler effect is exemplified if you'll forget for the moment our motion relative to the Earth and consider only the periodic rotation of the lunetta station around the Earth. This produces a very powerful Doppler effect. If, at one moment, the lunetta station is approaching us at her orbital velocity of 7 km per second, an hour later, it will be receding from us at the same speed. That means that inside of an hour a speed difference of 14 km per second may take place, and thus the frequency which we are now receiving is 140,000 cycles per second higher than that we shall receive within the hour. You remember that we wish to reduce out bandwidth to 1000 cycles, so you can see how important it is to keep our receiver constantly tuned to the transmitter. It's not quite as difficult in practice as you might think. We might use a search receiver sweeping periodically over a wide frequency band in addition to the working receiver. The searching receiver would detect the frequency at which the messages were arriving each time it passed them on its scale, and would periodically tune the working receiver accordingly. Actually, we use a single receiver with automatic frequency control. The Lunetta station is similarly equipped and it is not difficult to re-establish communication even after lengthy interruptions. How do the Lunetu operators know where to direct their radio beams? Asked Billingsley. I can see that we simply aim ours at the Earth. But Lunetta surely cannot see our vessels at present. Their tables give them our exact bearing in space and since they have our coordinates daily they always know whether we're on our prescribed track or not. Minus zero. I'm only a child when it comes to radio, remarked Ross, and I want to ask what might be a foolish question. Could we communicate by radar? The question is by no means foolish. What you have in mind is obviously pulse radar, because the simple term radar is not clearly distinguished from the term radio. We checked and found that it would be quite possible to use pulse radar, although it offered no particular advantages over radio. Perhaps you'd like to hear the reasons. Pulse radar technique differs from radio in that the continuous waves used in radio are supplanted by momentary radio flashes or pulses. The output of radio transmitters is generally limited by temperature rises, mainly in the tubes. 
In pulse radar we have the advantage of being able to overload tubes mightily during the short times that pulses last, for they can cool off between them. Actually, we can multiply the power of emission on the order of magnitude of 1000 as compared with continuous waves, if the pulses are short enough. So, if we were working with pulse radar, We could multiply the output of transmitters such as this one by a thousand without any greatly increased effort. It sounds quite appealing, but there's a catch to it, for such a powerful emission extends over a considerable bandwidth. There's an interesting analogy in acoustics, fire a pistol near a piano when the damping pedal is depressed, and all the strings will vibrate. Why? because the sound of the shot is composed of tonal vibrations of innumerable frequencies or tones, as the acousticians call them. Each individual string reacts to the air vibration from the pistol shot that corresponds to its natural frequency, and gets in resonance with it. You might say that the explosion has a wide acoustic bandwidth. A radar pulse is just such an explosion. So we'd have to set our receiver for a wide range of frequencies if we wanted to extract a lot of energy from it. That would mean wide bandwidth. There's the answer to your question. A pulse receiver needs a bandwidth that is greater, the shorter the pulses it is to receive are, the greater the necessary bandwidth. But the noise level increases in the same ratio as the bandwidth. So, as we shorten our pulses for a radar receiver, we get more grass as opposed to our continuous wave receiver. On the other hand, we cannot increase our output power without shortening the pulses. So you'll see that what we gain on the swings, we lose on the roundabouts and vice versa. Transmitter efficiency goes up, but receiving efficiency goes down. So the pulse method has no advantages, and we stick to continuous wave radio for maximum range. Minus zero, I say. Francis, said Billingsley, why did you take the trouble to set up a station in the Lunetu orbit? Why could we not communicate direct with Earth? We thought about it a good deal, and there's not much doubt but that we might have done so under favorable conditions, answered La Sine. But there were a lot of practical reasons which induced us to set up the Lunetu station. First there's the problem of Earth's rotation on her axis. We could communicate with a single station on Earth for a maximum of a half a day at a time, for that station would be blanked by the Earth's mass for the remaining 12 hours. That would have meant several terrestrial radio stations for continuous contact. These stations would have had to work in relays with continual intercommunication between themselves, and the whole world girdling organization would have had to be set up for three years. The Lunetta station permits us to work at least once every hour, by reason of its bi hourly circling of the Earth. Then, too, radio communication directly to and from Earth would be affected by the atmosphere. The lower atmosphere would have made communication hinge on local weather conditions. Sandstorms and thunderstorms might have upset communications. Clouds tend to reflect some of the energy radiated at them by our short waves and we often would not have known whether we'd been received correctly or why the other station didn't come in at the agreed times. When I went to General Braden with this idea and kept going back to him with new problems and demands for perfecting such an involved net of communication stations, he wasn't pleased. Finally he pounded the table and said, you'll get one ferry flight to the Lunetu orbit. Fix up something to take up there which will do the job our side of all this atmospheric blockage. We want reliable communication with the expedition, not a scientific circus which will be flopping intermittently so that the wise boys can give a thousand reasons from advanced physics for the flops. So we built up another set just like those we have with us now. There was some extra disposable load in the Sirius which took the set to the orbit and this allowed us to haul up the big, 40 square meter reflector. That's the story of the station which we work. McRae looked puzzled. You imply that the Lunetta station is a Chinese copy of our own. F believed that it was the other way around and thought that our station was independent of the Mars vessels because such an independent station had proved its efficacy in the Lunetta orbit. 
But if the design was first worked out for the voyage, why wouldn't it have been simpler to have made the radio set integral with the ship? There are mighty good reasons for the radio station being a self-contained unit separate from the ships. First of all, cargo vessels do not have comfortable living spaces like that yacht you're living in, the Polaris. They have a pilot's cabin, a tiny radio shack, and the crowded cargo bay of the landing boat, and that's all. Our transmitting and receiving spaces would have had to be built separate from the landing boat anyway. Then Peyton insisted that the attitudes of the ships be controlled, even while coasting, so as to avoid any propellant tank becoming too cold by being shaded for an excessive period. This would have prevented us radio people from setting the ship's attitude in accordance with the desired angularity for our reflectors. You'll understand, of course, that not only must our reflecting antenna be constantly directed at the Earth during the actual voyage and while circling in the Martian satellitic orbit, but the reflector of the generating plant must be directed at the Sun day it would be quite a trick to do that from a spaceship whose attitude is determined by entirely different considerations. Right now, it's difficult enough to keep the ship's own power producing reflector pointing at the sun and still permit the skipper adequate freedom to position the vessel as he wishes. With our two reflectors, that would be a geometrical impossibility, for the angular relationship between earth and sun changes much during our voyage. The self-contained and separate characteristics of our station eliminate these difficulties entirely. After the maneuver of departure, we had two busy bees tow this station away from the Oberth and leave it some 1,000 feet from the vessel. We can stay here until the old man decides that we have to make another power maneuver. Here we can keep the transmitter compartment in whatever attitude will permit the reflectors to be appropriately directed. How do you control the reflectors? asked McRae. With triple flywheels and in the same manner that the attitudes of the ships are controlled. There's a set of such flywheels here in the transmitter compartment. With them, we set the whole radio station, leaving the reflectors locked in position. Then we unlock the solar reflector which is swiveled at its center of gravity on an outrigger. The solar reflector has two flywheels with which we direct it at the sun, after which a photoelectric cell automatically cuts the flywheels on and off to keep the direction. In the same manner we rivet the reflecting antenna to the earth. Minus zero, your current supply here is doubtless based on the same principle as the power plants in the ships. Remarked Billingsley. Yes, it's the same idea, solar reflector, mercury vapor boiler, turbine, and condenser, the latter being in the shadow of the solar reflector. The reflector is smaller than those on the ships, having an area of but 15 square meters. It collects solar energy to the amount of 8 V2 kilowatts and feeds it to the boiler. This figure holds near Mars, but increases to 20 kilowatts near the Earth where solar rays are much stronger. Such kilowattage is not adequate for our transmitter, and besides, our turbogenerator is only about 30% efficient. In the Martian orbit, we shall only extract some 2 V kW of power from our 8 V2 kW of solar energy the remainder being radiated to space by the condenser. Thus you see that our reflector only provides a quarter of the energy emitted by our transmitter. Moreover, to radiate 10 kilowatts from the antenna, we must have an input into the transmitter of 30 kilowatts. For these reasons we must store energy in batteries. We charge the accumulators with 2 V K W for the full 24 hours, say 60 kilowatt hours and that allows us to operate the transmitting set about two hours daily. Our outgoing messages are handled during the ten minutes, occurring every two hours, when the station we are working is between us and the Earth. Of course, we can receive for much longer period because the receiver needs very little current. I suppose you just shift your antenna appropriately from transmitting to receiving when you're working the other station, said Billingsley. Rather like talking over the telephone. Lusini smiled. I'm afraid it's not quite as simple as that. Were you to try it, you'd find that all those millions of kilometers are rather more than just abstract figures. Radio waves move with the speed of light, 
300,000 km per second, and we are now about 20 million kilometers from Earth. Now, if I ask my friend Donald Flip in the Lunetta station, how's tricks where you are? It'll take about a minute before my question reaches him, and I'll have to wait another minute before his, just fine, Francis, gets back to me. When we reach Mars, and when during the waiting time, Earth passes behind the sun as seen from where we shall be, it will require almost 42 minutes for a radio wave to make a two-way trip between us and Earth. So we'll have to bunch our questions and answers if we expect to be understood. How horrible! groaned Billingsley. It makes me homesick. How about it, boys, shouldn't we be getting back to Polaris? I've another question for Dr. Lassini, said McRae. There's one thing about the power plant I've never quite understood. Every time I think of our flexible baby bottles, I cannot figure how a steam boiler can work in weightlessness. Liquid has to be evaporated in the boiler, and nothing but the steam is supposed to reach the turbine. It would seem to me that there might be frightful priming troubles. How is that avoided in weightlessness? Lassini smiled again. What you've just brought up has been one of the critical problems in the development not only of the radio power plant, but of the other plants in the ships. Here's the way it's done in principle. The condenser liquefies the mercury vapor along its walls, where it takes the shape of small globules driven along by the still uncondensed vapor moving past. These globules are caught in a small chamber in which the condenser tubes terminate tangentially. The heavy liquid mercury whirls around the sides of this chamber from whence it can be returned to the boiler by the feed pump. Residual mercury vapor, which keeps up the whirling motion, is recirculated to the admission side of the condenser by a small blower. Thus separation of mercury and vapor is done centrifugally, although in the boiler itself there is no sharp division between the liquid and the vapor phase. In principle the boiler is nothing but a tube set in the focal line of the gutter-like reflector. Mercury enters one side of the tube in liquid form and leaves the other side as vapor at 700 degrees centigrade, being piped directly to the turbine. It all sounds a good deal simpler than it really is. We made preliminary experiments in the Lunetta orbit for months before the thing was working in principle. And it took more months to get the bugs out of the first trial power plants. Then we gave these a service test in the orbit. But finally we were successful, and I feel that we can consider this mercury vapor power plant as entirely reliable and functional. Chapter 17, A Nasty Little Aster on the 2nd of June, 1985 the voyages to Mars had been underway for 73 days. Their routine gave no indication to their senses that they were not floating idly in space, while they were moving actually towards their distant goal at a rate many times exceeding the muzzle velocity of a bullet. Today they would see the Earth pass across the brilliantly flaming surface of the Sun. At first, the ship's elliptical path had kept them advancing away from the Earth at a rate of more than 3 kilometers per second. As soon as they escaped from her gravitation and began wandering through space like a swarm of tiny, independent planets, drifting through the solar system. Then the sun's gravitation had begun to act, and they were still swinging away from its source, although working against it. Their velocity along their elliptical path had day by day diminished, until their angular velocity around the sun had been reduced to less than that of the earth. The Earth had begun to overhaul them on her solar orbit, and would pass between them and the Sun at a distance of some 20 million kilometers. Thenceforth she would outdistance them more and more. This day would offer the lonely crews of the Mars vessels a celestial spectacle never before beheld by the eye of man. They would see the Earth and the Moon transit the Sun's disk. It would be a farewell to Earth until they should again return towards the close of their sidereal journey. Smoked glasses before their eyes, they hung at the port, gazing at the sun's blinding splendor. They could not see the luminous double planet with which they had become so familiar during the past weeks, for both Earth and Moon had turned towards them their nocturnal sides and these did not detach themselves from the surrounding blackness of the sky. At last a tiny black dot appeared against the enormous corona surrounding the blinding white sun's feel like a robe of flames. 
It was, to begin with, sickle shaped, gradually becoming circular in appearance. Deliberately, very deliberately, it moved from left to right into the full glare of the fiery ball. An hour or so later, another tiny spot appeared, even tinier than the first. It followed towards the sun's center. Dot to the navigators, this was far more than a spectacular sidereal slideshow or sorrowful leave taking from a midget dark spot that called itself the center of life, and which its inhabitants were wont to refer to as the world. The navigators could use it for a thoroughgoing check on the accuracy with which the convoy had maintained its velocity and track. In their astrodomes, they held filtered telescopes before their eyes, took the exact instants and measured exactly the points at which Earth and Moon transited the left and right edges of the Sun's disk. Then they computed to the fraction of a second just how much time had elapsed since they had shut off the rocket motors some two vi months earlier and begun the long coast through space. The transit of the Earth lasted eight hours and five minutes, and in two hours she disappeared from sight beyond the flaming edges of the corona. One hour later, the moon followed suit. The navigators compared notes and data by radio, consulted their tables, and came to the conclusion that their track was little, if at all, in error, and that no corrective maneuver need be undertaken. Chapter 18 The Aldebaran Calls Mayday. Three more months passed, and Holt and his faithful band still faced an equal period before they would reach their mysterious red planet. Weariness and extended inactivity made themselves felt. Personalities were beginning to wear on one another with resulting tensions. The cook and the engineer of Antares had gotten into a fist fight, which might have had serious results had it not been for the handicaps imposed by weightlessness on physical combat. This was no particular surprise to Holt. Familiar as he was with the effects of restricted living quarters on the occupants. He therefore undertook an exchange of personnel between the space vessels so as to afford some variety in the human contacts between his men. It was, indeed, time to alleviate the unbearable monotony which supervenes when the same wisecrack has been worked over as many as ten times. Even Billingsley had seemingly exhausted his ample store of amusing anecdotes concerning English globe trotters and dead Chinese emperors. That had been the danger signal. Even if there are no new tales, thought Holt, we can improve things by getting a new set of listeners. Captains, navigators, and engineers had to stick it out, for it would not have done to throw away the intimate familiarity they had developed with the complicated mechanics under their charge. Tom Knight, captain of Holt's Polaris, remained of course, and none of the tensions had occurred between the two. Their friendship actually became deeper, despite the over-intricate contact in which they were obliged to live. Tom's appearance had altered considerably since they had stood together at the rail of the Queen of Hawaii and watched the lights of San Diego melt into the distance. In accordance with a custom which sprang up in the whole Mars fleet a few weeks after departure. He had let his beard grow. With his smoothly parted blonde hair, his bright blue eyes and his long blonde beard, he looked like an ancient Viking sailing forth to Ultima Thule. Holt himself remained clean shaven. He insisted that no beard could hang properly without gravity and that it would interfere with eating. No matter how convincing the arguments of the beard wearers that their experience proved the opposite, he stuck to his theory. But in the interest of the psychological welfare of his crews and to prevent them from becoming prey to depressive thinking, he instituted a broad program of activity. Every passenger ship held a movie show at least twice a week. Sam Wolfe and Howard Ross circulated from vessel to vessel and ran the projector. Those not on watch in the cargo ships we allowed to attend, since the limited spaces where they lived would not permit of such luxuries. This they called getting out into the great world. Dr. Gudunek would give radio lectures in English, French, German, Russian and Spanish for those who desired to improve their education during the long days of inactivity. He announced that he would include Martian during the return trip. He saw to it that there was an active interchange of books between the vessels, thus providing himself with an opportunity for extensive visiting.
and he was always welcome.0, the expedition's gravity cells offered one of the gratefully accepted escapes from boredom. Early in the planning stage, Dr. Barrett and the specialists of the Institute of Space Medicine had expressed grave concern as to the effects of the weightless condition upon the crews, when protracted for months on end. Even Bergman and his assistants, the champions in long-time weightlessness, had been able frequently to return to Lunetta during their extended observations and there to expose themselves to her synthetic gravity for several hours. Many problems had been posed to the space doctors. What would be the effect of extended weightlessness upon body fluids? Would, perchance, the sensitivity of the organs of equilibrium of the inner ear, weight sensitive as they are, suffer? It was these organs which for ages had told men and animals what was up and what was down, where heaven and hell were. In space flight their system of reference was gone. Would a general degeneration of the muscular and vascular systems not threaten organs such as arms and legs and heart, when, accustomed to working against gravity, they would be able to function with so little effort? In weightlessness, violent motion involved the danger of the movers colliding with any of the six walls surrounding him, forcing him to use his physical strength with utmost caution. The muscles and limbs of the crews might well shrink as though in plaster casts, incapacitating them for their duties when they reached the surface of the distant red planet. The answers to all such problems were the gravity cells, for it was impractical to provide the expedition with so bulky a donut as Lunetta. Peyton's designing genius evolved the dumbbell shaped affairs which floated not far from the ships whirling about the center points of their handles like giant maple keys. Holt issued a squadron order that each crew member must pass not less than two hours in the gravity cells twice a week. Busy bees ferried the men in groups of four to the huge dumbbells, which they entered through the central chamber, a spacious metal drum, via bulkhead doors directly from the bees. From the central chamber the men descended to either of the great bells through air impervious hoses 100 feet long and 3 in diameter. The two diametrically opposed spheres, the hoses and the central chamber were inflated by an air conditioning unit to a pressure of one atmosphere for respiration and to maintain the dumbbells shape. The four sometimes unwilling athletes distributed themselves into opposite gravity cells by seating themselves upon a board attached to a rope one of whose ends was made fast in the central chamber while the other was rolled around a drum on the board. When a snubbing device was released, centrifugal force pulled the man on his board into the cell proper. To return to the central chamber, he would pull himself back by a handle attached to the drum. Within the cells were a few simple gymnastic implements with which the men worked their unaccustomed muscles back to suppleness accompanied by many a humorous curse and gripe at the now loathsome synthetic gravity. When propulsion maneuvers were undertaken, the gravity cells were secured, as was La Cine's radio set and Bergman's telescope. This was done by allowing the internal pressure to escape, after which men in space suits folded the spheres and their connecting hoses and stowed them in the metallic drums of the central chambers. The chambers were then towed back to their cargo vessels. Zero, officially it was night and Holt was sleeping peacefully in the air of the living compartment of the Polaris. Two safety pins through the coat and trousers of his pajamas held him gently moored to a pair of cords which kept sleepers steady during the hours appointed for slumber. His dreams were rudely interrupted by a twitching of one of the cords. It was Tom Knight who had recently gone on watch. We've had two maydays from Aldi Bar and shouted night, no response to our acknowledgement. Holt ripped the safety pins out of his night clothing and swam with night into an astrodome from which Aldi Bar and was visible. Field glasses showed nothing abnormal. She hung there about eight miles away, as she had for weeks, motionless and glistening against the velvet sky. Holt slipped into a uniform, snapping out commands as he did so. Wake and Dr. Barrett and two corpsmen. Clear away a busy bee with four space suits. Radio Ziolkowski to send a power bee to Aldi Baron. Same to Goddard. Radio Capella to send Wigand and a damage control party to Aldi Baron. I'm off with Barrett and the two corpsmen. A few minutes later, Holt and his party, already dressed in their space suits, 
entered the busy be secured at Polaris airlock and the forward tank retainer. Holt himself took the helm and swung out towards the motionless and apparently unaffected Aldebar and Dot as they neared the vessel, his glasses revealed several figures moving outside the nacelle and apparently busy near the forward portion of the tankage system. Still no apparent damage was visible. Holt reversed his thrust so as to stop the bee some 200 feet off. Opening the hatch, he spoke into the microphone contained in his transparent space helmet. What's up, Sherman? One of the figures lifted an arm in acknowledgement and then, drawing his reaction pistol, projected himself in their direction. As he neared the bee, he reported via his individual radio set. We took a meteor through the nacelle just now. No personnel losses. Repairs are underway. Holt drew him into the busy bee. He closed the hatch, pressurized the little cabin and they removed their helmets. Tell me about it, Sherman. We were hit by a meteor about one-fourth of an inch in diameter through the forward wall of the control room, just alongside the Boastrodome. It passed through the captain's cubicle and through my laundry chest. Then it knocked a hole in the position chart in the navigating room and went on out through the sick bay aft. It cut the corner of one of the hydrazine tanks for the second maneuver, and I'm afraid we've lost some propellant. But the patch is just about on, and the loss is small. Were you aware of what happened? Sergeant Bock was on duty in the control room and I was strapped down in my cubicle. Reading the thing missed box head by a foot or so. The others were asleep. All I heard was a bang in my laundry chest and then some smoke came out of it. There was a hissing sound, followed by the alarm horn. Then I knew we'd been hit. I ordered Bok to send and so's, although he was a little fuzzy from the shockwave of the meteor. When the nacelle pressure began to go down and the dropout in the smoke producer gave us a clue to the location of the entrance and exit holes. We had hard rubber patches over them in about three minutes. The blower system went into automatic high delivery just as it is supposed to, although we lost about a half an atmosphere of pressure before the patches began to hold. Then the pressure climbed right back to the full one atmosphere. The system worked beautifully. Made my ears snap, the pressure came back so fast. How about the hydrazine tank? asked Holt. We didn't notice that in the excitement until Corporal Blacksmith went to make a check on whether any of his medical gear had suffered. He opened the port cover and took a look out at the tanks when he saw that the wake of the meteor might be near them. When he saw the hydrazine pouring out, we put on space suits and climbed out with patches. Do you think you've lost much? I don't think it's a great deal. It was pouring out of the aftermost leak like a half-opened spigot. It began to spread over the skin of the tank because of its adhesive properties, and then evaporated rapidly in the vacuum. The forward leak just dribbled. Weightlessness is what saved us. I hope and believe that we didn't lose more than 50 gallons. Well, that's not as bad as it might have been, said Holt, but why didn't you answer us after you sent the Mayday? Until we stopped the leaks in the nacelle, I didn't know how long we could maintain our pressure. It was dropping despite the emergency power on the blowers. So I ordered the crew into space suits and shut off the juice from everything except the blowers so that the batteries could keep them running at full power as long as possible. Our radio transmitter was shut off too. I believed it was vital to keep the pressure up at all costs, or else the nacelle might collapse when the batteries went dead. A collapse like that would play havoc with the entire installation. We reported as soon as the holes were plugged, but you'd gone. Colonel Knight took the message. You handled the situation very well, Sherman, said Holt. Let's have a look at the damage, while Dr. Barrett gives Sergeant Spock the once over. They replaced their helmets, depressurized the interior of the bee and pushed themselves clear of the little vessel. With their reaction pistols they shoved themselves towards the silver nacelle of Aldebar and dot the holes made by the speeding meteor were insignificant. The edges of the punctures showed signs of carbonization due to its velocity. The hard rubber patches within the nacelle were still held tightly by the interior air pressure. 
Wigand and his repair experts were already busy cementing them in place from the outside for permanence. The Aldebaran people had completed this detail on the hydrazine tank.0. The encounter between the meteor and the Aldebaran promptly became a welcome and enduring subject of conversation among the Mars crews. Bergman the astronomer had drawn Laroque's Vigo in the personnel shift and found himself foregathering with the loquacious Billingsley. Meteors in general had become a matter of very considerable importance and Bergman's sidereal knowledge was much in demand. Heretofore he had not been able to utilize his fine, large telescope, for Mars was still at a greater distance than during his most favorable oppositions and Bergman was unable to find a refuge from the hail of questions with which he was bombarded. I had no idea that these meteors were such dangerous fellows, remarked Billingsley on the day after Aldebaran had been struck. It would seem that our ships are so tiny compared to all this space that there should be plenty of room for us without any real danger of colliding with the wretched things, you know. Do you think there's much chance of its happening again? I'm afraid there is, answered Bergman cautiously. I believe, however, that the Aldebaran incident permits us to discount any major danger from collisions of this sort. But I say, old chap. What if a bloody great meteor knocks a whole ship to bits and pieces? Bellowed Billingsley. That would be very tough luck indeed, answered Bergman, but the big fellows are fortunately few and far between in anything as vast as the universe. It's the small fry that give us the headaches. Judged by the size of the hole it made in all de Baron, the meteor must have been about a quarter of an inch in diameter. Not very large, you'd say but it's quite respectable for a meteor. The risk of an SL being hit by another is about once in 10,000 years. My dear fellow, you seem shockingly definite, retorted Billingsley with some skepticism, how on earth, in space, I mean, can you know that? It's quite simple in principle, although that type of calculation is apt to be somewhat rough. The frequency of shooting stars as we observe them from Earth gives us a point of departure. Really, old fellow. How jolly interesting. Won't you elaborate a bit? A meteor one quarter of an inch in diameter is visible as a shooting star of zero magnitude when it strikes Earth's atmosphere and becomes incandescent by air friction. That is to say that its luminosity is equal to such bright, fixed stars as Vega or Capella. A statistical compilation of the observations of stargazers scattered all over the Earth indicates that about 500,000 shooting stars of zero magnitude and higher strike Earth's atmospheric shell per 24 hours. When this is referred to the tiny globes of our nasals, it comes out to the figure I gave you, one probable hit every 10,000 years. That would seem to settle the matter for the quarter-inch giants, right enough. I shan't worry too much about them. But what about the smaller bits? Our recent visitor went right through two walls of an cell, tore and burned my good friend Sherman's undies, and punched two bloody great holes in the hydrazine tank. Can't one of his baby brothers burst through the nacelle some day and knock my breakfast panic in Galley West? As I told you, it's the smaller ones that give us the headaches for they become more frequent as they decrease in size, and it is indeed fortunate that their penetration also decreases. This permits us to count on the three-quarter inch walls of the nasals to protect us from all meteors smaller than the tenth magnitude. That size can only be perceived through powerful telescopes when it strikes the atmosphere, for the diameter is not far from one hundredth of an inch. We should call them grains of meteoric dust rather than meteors. Should such a grain penetrate the walls of one of our nasals, the tiny puncture can be repaired with far less fuss than all de bar and s trouble. As to probabilities of such punctures, meteors down to the tenth magnitude strike Earth's atmosphere five billion times per day, or ten thousand times as often as those of zero magnitude and larger. The probability of a hit by such a large meteor is, as I said, one in ten thousand years. Therefore the likelihood of a hit by a meteoric grain is one per year. On our three years trip, we might expect about three punctures per nacelle. What about armor plating the nasals? Asked Billingsley. 
to get effective protection against meteors up to and including the eighth magnitude, answered Bergman, we should have to plate our nasals with one-tenth of an inch of steel and that would amount to five tons per nacelle. The planning staff felt that the risk did not justify the sacrifice in payload in order to cut down the chances of puncture to 20%. Whether they were wise or not is a matter of educated guesswork rather than a scientific question. We shall know when we get home. That's all very well of the nasals, pursued Billingsley, but our propellant tanks are remarkably thin, so I'm told. Aren't we apt to dribble like sieves? It's not as bad as that went on Bergman. The large tanks for the initial maneuver are but one-tenth of an inch thick and can presumably be holed by meteors as small as the fifteenth magnitude, which are about one four-hundredth of an inch in diameter. The tanks are roughly the size of the nasals, and of the same material. Fifteenth magnitude meteors are about one hundred times as frequent as those of the tenth magnitude so we anticipate roughly 100 punctures per year. By the time we jettison our presently empty tanks, they'll probably average 70 punctures apiece. We're far more concerned over the smaller tanks for later maneuvers, since they will be exposed to meteoric grain bombardment for a much longer time. It seems to me a jolly great miracle that we've a drop of fuel left. Bergman smiled confidently. You've heard of puncture proofing, have you not? It was used in automobile tires as early as 1920 and in bulletproof aircraft fuel tanks before that. Our tanks contain a chemical which immediately flows to the tiniest wound and stanches it then and there. Nor is it often called upon to heal anything as large as a 0.50 caliber hole, as it used to do quite regularly when men fought airplanes. It will be 10,000 years before there's another puncture like Aldebaran's, you might remember. Really, Bergman, you're the most accommodating and patient science fellow it's ever been my good fortune to travel to Mars with. They do have meteoric swarms if the tabloid journals are right, persisted Billingsley. They are relatively dense, to be sure, answered Bergman, but the nice thing about them is that we're on familiar terms and know where to expect them. Meteors may be classified as hyperbolic or elliptical. The hyperbolic type enter the solar system from elsewhere and when they enter the solar field of gravitation, they have an initial velocity which tends to increase the closer they approach to the sun day when their distance from the sun is equal to the distance of Mars's orbit, they are traveling more than 34.3 km per second, and at the distance of Earth's orbit more than 42.1 km per second, for they would have attained this velocity by solar gravity alone, even without any initial velocity. Such meteors are strangers and they describe a hyperbola around the sun and disappear forever from the solar system, unless they fall into the sun or onto a planet. We have no way of predicting their appearance, whether as to time or location, for they visit us but once and for a short time. It is assumed that 70% of meteors are hyperbolic. Elliptical meteors must basically be slower than the figures I've quoted, and the whole situation is different. Like planets, they gravitate around the Sun in elliptical orbits which are frequently very eccentric. They cross Earth's orbit at regular intervals and this permits us to become relatively familiar with their paths. The track of this voyage avoids such paths by a safe margin, if our computations have been effective. Jolly interesting, you know mused Billingsley. Then the swarms of meteors which return regularly on certain days belong to the elliptical brotherhood, et? Bergman nodded. And how do they come into being? We figure that the elliptical brotherhood, as you call them, are the wreckage of comets which may have come too close to the sun and burst from the heat. When a swarm of such small particles following the same path, but considerably separated from one another, arrives at the inner regions of the solar system as they fly around the sun, there are minor differences in the attraction exercised by the latter upon the nearer and more distant particles. This, and planetary gravity, produces small differences in their orbital periods which in time become cumulative. Thus the wreckage of the erstwhile comet is distributed along the orbit, and we see a swarm of shooting stars. It's not as bad as that, went on Bergman. 
The large tanks for the initial maneuver are but one tenth of an inch thick and can presumably be hauled by meteors as small as the fifteenth magnitude, which are about one four hundredth of an inch in diameter. The tanks are roughly the size of the nasals, and of the same material. Fifteenth magnitude meteors are about one hundred times as frequent as those of the tenth magnitude, so we anticipate roughly one hundred punctures per year. By the time we jettison our presently empty tanks, they'll probably average 70 punctures apiece. We're far more concerned over the smaller tanks for later maneuvers, since they will be exposed to meteoric grain bombardment for a much longer time. It seems to me a jolly great miracle that we've a drop of fuel left. Bergman smiled confidently. You've heard of puncture proofing, have you not? It was used in automobile tires as early as 1920 and in bulletproof aircraft fuel tanks before that. Our tanks contain a chemical which immediately flows to the tiniest wound and stanches it then and there. Nor is it often called upon to heal anything as large as a 0.50 caliber hole, as it used to do quite regularly when men fought airplanes. It will be 10,000 years before there's another puncture like Aldebaran's, you might remember. Really, Bergman, you're the most accommodating and patient science fellow it's ever been my good fortune to travel to Mars with. They do have meteoric swarms if the tabloid journals are right, persisted Billingsley. They are relatively dense, to be sure, answered Bergman, but the nice thing about them is that we're on familiar terms and know where to expect them. Meteors may be classified as hyperbolic or elliptical. The hyperbolic type enter the solar system from elsewhere and when they enter the solar field of gravitation, they have an initial velocity which tends to increase the closer they approach to the sun day when their distance from the sun is equal to the distance of Mars's orbit, they are traveling more than 34.3 km per second, and at the distance of Earth's orbit more than 42.1 km per second, for they would have attained this velocity by solar gravity alone even without any initial velocity. Such meteors are strangers and they describe a hyperbola around the sun and disappear forever from the solar system, unless they fall into the sun or onto a planet. We have no way of predicting their appearance, whether as to time or location, for they visit us but once and for a short time. It is assumed that 70% of meteors are hyperbolic. Elliptical meteors must basically be slower than the figures I've quoted and the whole situation is different. Like planets, they gravitate around the sun in elliptical orbits which are frequently very eccentric. They cross Earth's orbit at regular intervals and this permits us to become relatively familiar with their paths. The track of this voyage avoids such paths by a safe margin, if our computations have been effective. Jolly interesting, you know, mused Billingsley. Then the swarms of meteors which return regularly on certain days belong to the elliptical brotherhood, et? Bergman nodded. And how do they come into being? We figure that the elliptical brotherhood, as you call them, are the wreckage of comets which may have come too close to the sun and burst from the heat. When a swarm of such small particles following the same path, but considerably separated from one another arrives at the inner regions of the solar system as they fly around the sun, there are minor differences in the attraction exercised by the latter upon the nearer and more distant particles. This, and planetary gravity, produces small differences in their orbital periods which in time become cumulative. Thus the wreckage of the erstwhile comet is distributed along the orbit, and we see a swarm of shooting stars. Chapter 19 the approach path to Mars ten days remained before the maneuver of adaptation to the satellite orbit around Mars, and the excitement among the crews waxed visibly. Their distance from the planetary goal had diminished to the paltry figure of 2.2 million kilometers and they could see him as a prominent half-disc, one-third of the diameter of the Sunday the sunny side glowed intense orange red and green and even the naked eye could distinguish the white spot of the southern polar cap melting in the sunlight of the Martian summer. The opposite half was shrouded in night, and its outline could be made out only when approached by a star which began to twinkle as its light passed through the Martian atmosphere. 
it would finally occult when it reached the invisible rim of the planet. Not much more distant from it than the diameter of the Martian half disk, there was a softly glowing starlet whose relation to Mars visibly changed if observed for some time. It was Phobos, Mars in a moon, on its seven and a half hourly chase around the planet. Double the distance away and on the opposite side of the luminous semi disk was Deimos, the other and more distant moon. Inconspicuous against the fixed stars, it made a leisurely circuit of its lord and master in an exterior orbit requiring 30 hours for completion. Hitherto the navigators had been content with a stellar parallax every 24 hours, but they now floated into the astrodomes every third hour and determined the apparent motion of the red planet against the fixed stars behind him. Two days remained before a corrective maneuver was scheduled to bring the convoy into a more exact elliptical path from which the actual hyperbolic approach to the planet might begin. Mars' solar orbit would then pass outside the aphelion of their improved ellipse and at exactly 8,800 kilometers from it. He was coming up behind them, overhauling them at the rate of 2.55 kilometers per second and bringing them subject to his gravitation. Then they would fall towards him in a hyperbola having its vertex about 1000 km above the surface. 2900 km before reaching this vertex, a propulsive maneuver was to reduce their velocity to that of the local orbital speed. The navigators figured that, if no such maneuver took place, they would shoot out into space again at an angle of exactly 106 degrees and 12 minutes of arc to the initial direction of approach. Holt had instructed Bergman to secure big telescope through which he had been scrutinizing their rapidly approaching goal. It was fastened to the Goddard, and La Cine's radio station likewise became a part of the Oberth after the last reports on Bergman's observations had gone forth to Earth. The gravity cells were collapsed and hauled in, then Wigand made a quick but thorough check that all was in readiness for the vital maneuvers. A full 24 hours before the signal was to be given, each ship was as much in readiness for it as human hands and eyes could make her. Zero, the correction maneuvers had taken place without incident and the velocity of the squadron had been changed by 22 meters per second exactly in the direction which the chief navigator figured would bring about the required 8,800 km distance from the Martian orbit and provide proper timing with respect to the now rapidly approaching planet. Observations of Mars' disk in relation to fixed stars confirmed the correctness of the calculations and the outcome of the maneuver. There was now no further use for the great propellant containers from which had been drawn the power for the departure maneuver and the ensuing corrections. They must be jettisoned in order to save weight during the coming maneuver of adaptation to the circumd Martian orbit. Preparations for abandoning them included forcing all residual propellants into the reserve tanks. This done, the engineers in space suits emerged from the nasals and broke the connections to the propellant pumps, then unscrewed the helium lines which pressurized the tanks. Finally they pulled the plugs and interrupted the electrical connections to the quantity gauges and remote indicating thermometers in the control room. There were other useless loads besides the empty tanks to be dispensed with. The superfluous storage batteries provided for steering during the extra long initial maneuvers were now useless, since the smaller regular bank of batteries would be adequate for the coming shorter propulsion periods. Spent food containers broken tools and instruments and similar accumulated debris was to be eliminated. Carried along as useless ballast, it would cause waste of propellants. Packed in what might be called sidereal garbage cans, the debris was bolted to the tank retainers to be jettisoned. Then the engineers re-entered the nasals. Flywheels were started to bring the vessels into slow rotation around their longitudinal axes. Then the closing of electrical circuits detonated explosive bolts holding the outer arms of the tank retainers to their centerpieces. The centrifugal force generated by the rotation then flung the arms with their great silver globes out into space, where they continued to recede slowly into the infinite distance. There could now be no danger of their interfering with the coming maneuver of adaptation. Holt ordered his convoy into Echelon with an interval between ships of some 1,000 feet, with instructions that their captains should keep station with the utmost accuracy, 
using the four rotatable steering jets only.0, events now came in such rapid succession, almost taking away the breath of the Mars crews after the weary boredom of their months in space. The apparent diameter of Mars two days before the maneuver of retardation had been equivalent to about twice that of the Sun, and 24 hours later it had increased to nearly quadruple. Now, just four hours before the vertex of the hyperbola was to be passed, the enormous multicolored disk, more than half of which was brightly illuminated, subtended an arc of vision of over 7 degrees, or 14 times the angle subtended by the Sunday. The now compact flotilla of spaceships was only 55,000 kilometers from the center of Mars's enormous sphere. All navigators lay strapped into their astrodomes recording the times of occultation behind Mars of various stars and reporting results to Holt immediately by radio telephone as he and his chief navigator, Hal Royer, studied the flight path chart in the navigation room of the Polaris. As Royer read positions from the tables with each incoming report, Holt would mark the spot on the chart with a round-headed, colored pin. Thus he could keep track of any small divergences of the convoy from the prescribed track's thick red line. Holt was well content, for the many careful observations of star occultations were now bearing fruit, proving the last correction maneuver to be accurate. There was no reason to anticipate any unforeseen alteration of the flight path by extraneous or unpredicted factors. Two hours and fifteen minutes remained before they would reach the hyperbolic vertex where they were to convert their precipitous drop into a definite circular orbit. In the meantime, their velocity relative to Mars bad increased from 2.55 km per second to 3.1 km per second and the rapid increase of the disk of Mars in their eyes impressively confirmed it. The distance to Mars center was 27,500 km, and almost three quarters of the great sphere was bright with sunlight. There was a brilliant star close to the inky edge of Mars' nocturnal side, sliding rapidly towards the planet. Instead of disappearing behind the somber edge it remained visible on the night steeped face of the planet, and passed across the orange-red deserts, finally moving off into the world of stars with increasing pace. It was Phobos, the fast-moving inner satellite of Mars, crossing their course. Field glasses revealed that the 10-kilometer sphere was misshapen in contrast to the perfected rotundity of larger heavenly bodies. It takes minus 85 minutes. Their distance from the center of Mars had been clipped down to 13,750 km and their relative velocity had risen to 3.57 km per second. Mars himself, with his glowing red, white and green shadings, subtended a full 30 degrees of angular vision in the eyes of the tense crewman. Holt now gave the order to turn the ships to the attitude for the maneuvers. Royer selected two fixed stars on which the directional scopes of the new Sperry instruments were bracketed. Then the desired relative attitude of each vessel to this system of reference was set, and when the control gyros had leveled themselves, the flywheels were started. Ponderously, the ships gyrated in space until their rocket motors faced in the direction of flight. There was no disturbance of their orderly echelon. Within minutes Holt received the reports that each ship occupied the proper attitude and was ready to apply thrust. At x-23 minutes and 16 seconds, their relative velocity had mounted to 4.37 km per second, they were but 6,875 km from Mars center, and the planet's colored surface seemed to rotate with ever-increasing speed. This evidenced that they would not crash perpendicularly upon his surface, but were racing towards him tangentially in a graceful sweep which would permit them to use his gravity to convert their movement into the satellite path which was their objective. No more than 3,500 km separated them from the planet's surface at x-11 minutes. His entire surface was bathed in brilliant sunlight. The maneuver of retardation which would swing them into the orbit of a satellite around Mars was to be simultaneous for all ships, unlike the maneuver of departure, for it was not desired that there should be the slightest divergence between them when the maneuver was completed. Minor differences in angle or speed would have been much more difficult to correct in an orbit than during their long, 
elliptical interstellar passage. The space forces had developed a technique for simultaneity during the ferry operations, when it had been found desirable to launch two Sinus ships in a time interval of but a few seconds toward the assembly operations going on in the orbit of departure. The technique used a flagship as master. Other ships were slave to her angular attitude. This was done by automatic, continuous registry of the flagship's angle in relation to her three control gyros and impressing the three error angles upon three continuously emitted tones which modulated a radio carrier wave. A fourth tone conveyed the acceleration factor of the flagship. Thus any special attitude of the flagship and her acceleration would be reflected in the pitch of the tones emitted by her radio transmitter dot on the slave vessel, the corresponding four tones were generated, and comparison of the pitches of these four tones with those emitted by the flagship indicated whether the slave ship deviated in spatial angularity and in acceleration from the master. If one tone varied in pitch, it produced a beat with that of the flagship. This beat induced a corrective signal in the automatic control equipment of the erring vessel, and her angle or thrust was corrected until the beat disappeared. This method had been used by two ships only in the ferry activity, but near Mars it was proposed to slave the whole flotilla of nine to Polaris. Ten captains lay strapped in their control rooms, ready to make corrections by hand if the automatics should fail or an alteration in the ship's relative positions should prove necessary. Thus there could be no danger of the vessels being drawn together in a mass collision, or by any malfunction in the flagship's mechanism. Polaris was now the last in line, astern of all the others. Next ahead was Sherman in his completely repaired Aldebaran. Haynes Ziolkowski spread her wide wings in the next position and at the head of the column flew La Roque and Vega. Two minutes before the maneuver. Holt ordered the navigators out of their astrodomes and to their acceleration couches, for Royer had informed him that the vertex of the hyperbola would be missed by but 12 kilometers, and this could easily be allowed for by a slight change in the length of the thrust application. Computation was now to be laid on the shelf. The proper guidance tapes were inserted so that the automatic mechanisms could take over. The next minutes would show whether the various ingenious devices had survived the rigors of their long, idle voyage and whether John Wigan's precision was to bear its fruit. A malfunction of the most insignificant part of the machinery might bring disaster upon the ship where it took place. Each vessel was faced with a passage between the sila of an all-shattering crash on Mars and the charge of losing herself in space forevermore on the second branch of the hyperbola. X minus one minute. Came Holt's voice through the bullhorns. The once weary hours spent in the synthetic trainers returned to the crews. Captains and navigators checked the spatial attitudes of their commands. Engineers went over the checklists of control gyroplanes, automatic steering gear, and the readiness of rocket motors. Each and every gauge and indicator seemed to smile encouragingly at them. They lay back on their couches. The fateful second hands of the clocks jerked towards the deciding moment. Six, five, four, came Holt's quiet voice. Knight firmly pushed Polaris igniter button. On Holt's panel a red bulb glowed, to be followed by the nine others showing that ignition had been all but simultaneous on the other vessels. Two, one, the thrust roared out and a column of green bulbs lit up across Holt's panel. The whole convoy was now pushing against their self-created gases to reduce the precipitous speed. But weak indeed was the deceleration. The indicators showed a bare 0.2 grams, only a miserable one-fifth of Earth's gravitational force. The oldest spacemen in the crews could not but realize how different was a true voyage through space from an Earth launching, where they were almost crushed by acceleration at the end of the booster thrusts. Convoy from Polaris. Reports from Laroque. Please. Polaris from Vega. Formations good, except for 20% lateral between numbers 3 and 4. First three ships are a little too far inside. Roger, thank you. Burke, did you hear? Roger. Haul out 60 meters. Oh, Roger, we'll go. Over a little later, Burke called, now on station. Out. 
Holt instructed Oberth and Vega to follow suit, then LaRoque reported the station keeping above reproach. The thrust maneuver was to last 10 minutes and 58 seconds, and the accelerometer rose slowly to the figure of 0.45 grams. Holt size flickered between the clock and the integrating velocimeter where was registered the speed reduction produced by the thrust working against their direction of travel. When it read 2.01 km per second there was silence, and the hand of the accelerometer snapped to zero. The roar of the rocket motor, transmitted by the structure of Polaris, had suddenly ceased, as the ten green bulbs on Holt's panel went out. Polaris integration gear had simultaneously cut off the thrust in the whole convoy by radio. Holt called for reports in a dry, tense voice. When LaRoque's French accent pronounced the final, all's well, a shout of joy came from all the bullhorns. Cutting off reception from the other ships, Holt relaxed above his couch with closed eyes. A mumbled prayer rose from his lips. Thanks to thee, O oh Lord, we've done it. Be thou with us henceforward. Amen. Chapter 20 The Red Planet Bears His Secrets Hardly had the maneuver of retardation been completed than Bergman called from Vega to ask Holt if he might have Goddard sent him a busy bee so that he might get his telescope working. His request was turned down until two hours later, when Roy reported that they were making good their satellitic orbit with excellent accuracy. They were whirling around Mars in an almost perfectly circular path at an average of 1,009 kilometers from his surface. Holt then put the formation back into line and told Bergman to go ahead with his observation work, for he himself was only too curious about the fantastic scene below them. The naked eye could easily distinguish the canals with their green, symmetrical intersections. And no sooner had Bergman reported from Goddard that he was in full swing with his observing than Holt's busy bee was on its way to the free-floating observation chamber of the telescope. Bergman opened the hatch and emerged in his space suit to greet him. What's the latest news from Mars? asked Holt through his microphone. His curiosity was almost getting the better of him. Bergman shook his head. So far, it's mighty scarce, he answered. No towns, no streets, no movement anywhere. The whole planet seems dead as a doornail. But somehow there's an impression of symmetry entirely uncharacteristic of death. Quite frankly, I'm just as dumb as ever. Inside the observation chamber, they removed their helmets. Let me have a look, said Holt. Wait until I set the scope at a point just west of Citus Minor in the region we call Libya. Bergman arranged himself in front of the eyepiece and twirled the leveling controls, continuing meanwhile, this zone lies south of and close to the equator, between the famous Citus Major and Citus Minor. It is surrounded on the south, east, and west by vegetation and is bounded on the north by the broad canal of Nepenthes, which the leads through Meris Lake, a small, circular spot of vegetation. Libya stretches about 300 km north and south and 500 km east and west. I'm using low power at present, so that you can see the whole area. Take a look. Holt drew himself to the eyepiece. In the center of the bright orange-red desert which Bergman had called Libya, there was a circular, green speck into which not less than seven canals of varying breadth terminated radially. Some of the canals connected with the large vegetal areas of Citus Minor and Major. Two of them proceeded with admirable parallelism from the great, green circle of Meris Lake, cut rectilinearly by the broad Napenthes Canal. Holt gazed reflectively for a long time into the telescope. Then he withdrew and looked inquiringly at Bergman. It's incomprehensible, he said. Try 2000 diameters magnification. Then it will seem as though we are only 500 meters above it, although the field of vision will be smaller. When Holt looked again, the circular edge of the Green Island cut halfway through the field of view. Holt was forced continuously to adjust the telescope setting to prevent their motion in the satellitic orbit and the rotation of the planet from losing the location on which he was focused. The drag of the air, heightened by brake flaps at their tails, 
would decelerate them and bring them to earth with diminishing velocity. The sounding bomb was equipped with a parachute opening automatically at an altitude of some 125 kilometers, while the atom bombs had continued at high speed until their proximity fuses detonated them not far above the ground. The chute was intended to delay it, particularly in the little known lower layers of the Martian atmosphere which were of such vital importance to the landing. Elaborate instrumentation replaced the warhead of the atomic missile. This radioed its determinations back to the ships circling the planet. The telemetering technique employed was in no way novel, for it had long before been used in reverse in rocket instrument vehicles which explored the mysteries of the upper atmosphere on Earth. Holt transferred his flag temporarily to the Zyolkowski in order to be present at the launching of the first of the three bombs from her launching mount. The latter was a simple affair of steel sections with two interior guide rails, two feet in diameter and some twenty long. The bomb lay ready between them. In order not to endanger the ship by the jet of the bomb, the mount was attached longitudinally to an outjutting member of the tank retainer, and was some ten feet clear of the ship. Being parallel with the keel of the vessel, it could be directed much as the stern torpedo tubes of a submarine are directed by swinging the whole craft. John Wigand and Lusini, with the help of some of the technical ratings, had spent the last 24 hours calibrating and inspecting the complicated instrumentation and the telemetering gear which would radio back the data. Aside from the relatively simple problems of securing and sending simple readings such as pressure, temperature, humidity and instantaneous altitude as found by electric altimeter, the bomb was also equipped to analyze automatically the composition of the Martian atmosphere and to transmit it by radio. As John Wigand often remarked, measuring is no great trick. But to measure correctly. A, there's the rub. A busy bee moored to Ziolokowski served as launching station. Lusini's high duty radio set aboard the Ziolokowski was still in reserve and was equipped with a special receiver for the bomb's telemetry transmitter together with the oscillographs which would record the vital data. Wigand in the busy bee was to attend to the firing, with Holt as an interested but inactive spectator, while Lusini sat before his automatic receiver and Haynes, in the control room of Ziolkowski, would lay the vessel to the correct angularity. All three parties were in permanent contact via the ship's interphone. John Wigand spoke into his microphone. Attitude set? Attitude set. Came Haynes' voice. Receiver tuned. Receiver tuned. Said Lusani ready on the firing line, fire. Flame shot from the tail of the bomb, urging it rapidly out of the mount. Like a torpedo, steered by its small gyros, the sounding bomb passes close to Aldebaran and Polaris. The flame contracted to nothingness after four seconds for the bomb's speed had been reduced to 130 meters per second less than the 3.14 kilometers per second with which Ziolkowski was circling Mars. After nearly an hour, one half its time to circle Mars, the bomb would reach the atmosphere tangentially at the lowest point of its ellipse. Then it would dive deeper and begin to take its measurements and to send them back to the anxiously waiting Mars crews. Tensely the men waited. Every ten seconds a signal impulse flitted across Lusini's check instrument, showing that the telemetry transmitter in the bomb was alive and at the ready. At the sixtieth minute, the multiple indicators on his receiver came to life, proving that the instrumentation of the bomb had armed itself faithfully. Lusini switched on the oscillographs which would record the many readings radioed by the precipitously falling transmitter in the bomb. Slowly the light-sensitive strips of paper wound themselves through the recording instruments. From the tracings which would later appear would come the final word whether the design of the landing boats had been based upon solid facts, or whether guesswork had made a landing on the long-sought planet too risky. Now the tiny specks of light on the instruments began to register, for the bomb had entered the atmosphere and was beginning to telegraph the vital information. For twenty drawn out minutes the luminous points danced across the observation screen. Then they suddenly vanished. The bomb had reached Martian ground. Hardly had the light specks disappeared than Lasani feverishly began to develop the paper strips. 
24 hours later Holt addressed his anxious crews by radio to tell them that he proposed to take the landing boat of the Oberth down to Mars within three days, with Glenn Hubbard as pilot. Chapter 21, Down to Mars Tom Knight took over the command of the vessels circling Mars with strict injunctions not to risk any foolhardy efforts with other landing boats until Holt so ordered by radio from the surface. Should he crash in the attempt? Knight was to keep the space vessels in the satellitic orbit until a suitable opposition for a return should occur between Mars and the Earth, employing his time with such observations as might be made from the orbit. A series of eight radio relay bombs was then fired off into the Martian atmosphere after the manner of the sounding bomb. The radio relay bombs contained automatic transmitters and receivers which could receive short waves from the circling space vessels and retransmit them on long wave. They could also receive long waves and retransmit them as short waves. The object of these devices was to permit constant communication between the landing party and the circling convoy, for a line of sight between the two would exist for only very short stretches at a time due to the rotation around Mars of the spaceships. Such line of sight is essential to short-wave communication. But Lassini had predicated his design of the radio relay bombs on a Martian ionosphere which would reflect long waves and permit radio communication between any points upon the surface. Thus several radio relay bombs would always react to long wave signals from the landing party while one or more of them would always be in line of sight with the convoy. After they had been eased to ground by their parachutes, Lassini questioned them as to their readiness and no less than six responded, to his great delight. He reported to Holt that uninterrupted two-way communication was assured when the latter should have made his landing. John Wigand and his inspectors went busily to work on the Oberth's landing boat, seeking not only defects in its involved mechanism, but subjecting the three caterpillars, the respirators, the pressure suits, the radio, and even the food and water supply to the most exacting scrutiny. The devil, said John, is a squirrel. Wouldn't it be silly to go through all this and have one of the boys die on Mars of Tumane poisoning? Eighteen composed the first landing party and Holt was unwilling to shift the burden of its leadership to anyone. Glenn Hubbard, his executive and pilot, had vast experience as former chief test pilot of United spacecraft in supersonic glides and landing techniques of experimental craft. No other captain could compare with him. Dr. Gudunek, the linguist, was a member, in the hope that he would be able to initiate conversations with the Martians, whose intelligence was by now a foregone conclusion. Sam Wolf's geological knowledge would be of inestimable value in getting out of the polar melting zone and in finding a suitable area in which to lay out landing strips for the wheeled landing boats. John H. Billingsley's experience with strange races and people's hold thought might be extremely important. As engineer, there was first Sergeant Clark E. Winslow whose tireless efforts had kept the Oberth and Wigan's good graces throughout the trip. Harry Brooks was radio man, and Lieutenant Hempstead, with a detail of ten soldiers, was there to do odd jobs, including the operation of the caterpillars on their radio sets. These men would also undertake the building of landing strips, once the equatorial zone had been reached, or, if need be, Hold off any unhoped for Martian attacks with tank ordnance and small arms. Holt seated himself beside Hubbard in the Oberth's landing boat's co pilot seat, while the others floated into the well packed cargo space. Then the boat was cast off and hauled by two busy bees some 300 meters to the side of the orderly column of spaceships. The 300 meters increased the boat's distance from Mars above that of the column of the convoy and the bees had to reduce slightly the boat's velocity around the planet to keep the orbit exactly circular. Since Oberth had been number two ship near the head of the line, the boat now passed in review beside the circling vessels, drifting slowly astern of them, while their crews floated in their astrodomes and waved farewell. Then the boat hung solitary above the vast Martian surfaces. Deceleration for descent was to take place at the sunmost point of their orbit. They would then make a half circle of Mars to enter his atmosphere just before reaching the point where their northing flight would again turn southward. 
Detailed computations had shown that the boat could then glide down to the selected landing spot near the South Pole in a long, gentle right-hand spiral and with minimum alteration of course. Hubbard brought his flywheels up to speed and turned the boat to maneuvering position. The rocket nozzles were now opposed to the direction of the satellite orbit. Hubbard glanced at the clock and signaled the passengers to strap down. He touched the ignition switch and the jet roared into space, snapping the accelerometer to LG. Slowly it climbed to 1.03 minus 1.05, 1.07, 1.08 grams. At 17.2 seconds, the thrust cut off. It had reduced their orbital velocity by 173 meters per second. Quiet again reigned in the boat. Hubbard again rotated his vessel to coincide with the flight direction, occasionally correcting to keep their center line coincident with the line of flight. That must be Lucas Solis, he remarked to Holt, pointing at a geometrically circular large green area in the desert just below them. Even with all the study of this scenery and the many months in the simulator, it still looks pretty strange when you actually see it. Ahead of us must be a raw sinus, said Holt with a glance at his knee-held chart. Then the Margaritiva sinus. Who do you suppose doped out all these crazy Latin names? I'll bet the Martians name them differently. Maybe they call it Greenland because it's green, ventured Hubbard. Hardly, grinned Holt. If their logic works the way logic works on Earth, Greenland would be white. They had been coasting for half an hour without power when night fled below them across the planet's wastes. In their control room it remained bright for fifteen more minutes, then they too were shrouded in blackness. Their radar altimeter sending its pulses to ground and measuring the time of return, had begun to register, showing their altitude as 200 kilometers. There were no responses to Hubbard's control movements, nor did the wing temperature indicators even flicker. What a queer atmosphere this planet has, remarked Hubbard. Near Earth, we wouldn't even be expecting any air at this height. But if the scientific boys are right, We'll have stratospheric conditions right at the surface when it comes to the landing. According to the sounding bomb, answered Holt, you ought to feel something when the altimeter reads 180 kilometers. That's quite amazing when you remember that we're moving much slower than we would be this high over Earth. That's right, said Hubbard. If this were a landing from Lunetta, we'd have a velocity of 8.27 km per second at the perigee of our landing ellipse. Here it's only 3.67 km per second, notwithstanding this perigee's being 155 km high, while the one from Lunetu is only 80. Seems to me I can feel something. As he twisted the wheel to and fro, the wide wings began to rock slightly under the influence of the elevens and there began the first audible signs of the passing air in the shape of a gentle hissing dot the pressure altimeter's hand began to kick around the dial which had been covered with a rough, hand-drawn scale computed from the results radioed back by the sounding bomb. It went from 165 to 160 to 159 kilometers and then settled at 158. Hubbard thrust the control wheel ahead. We seem to have gotten into this funny stuff a little high, he remarked. I'd better nose down a little so as not to sail right out of it again. They were lifted softly out of their seats by the negative lift of the great wings. The ship's doing all right, said Holt with an eye on the altimeter. Here we go down again. The wing temperature began to rise. 100, 200. 300 degrees registered in succession. Then it stopped at 370 degrees centigrade. Wing temperatures are no problem here, said Hubbard. What with our low wing loading and low speed, we won't even get to 400 degrees. Do you remember how Dick Payton wanted to skin those things with Gerald instead of steel? He might almost have gotten away with it so far as the temperature's concerned. Dot, but discretion's the better part of valor. Holt kept an anxious eye on the leading edge, but the familiar glow of a landing on Earth failed to materialize. This was less ghostly than a return home from Lunetta. 
the tiny light ray from the cabin lost itself along the length of the somber wing surface. There was no tendency to float out of their seats now. Harry Brooks handed up a radio chit from his cubby hole. Hope you are doing fine, Tom, it read. Holt wondered whether night, circling above them, was worrying while they sat as comfortably as in any airliner and split the air of the second planet to feel the foot of man. Here they went, through a mad sort of atmosphere. which nevertheless reacted to controls as if their aircraft were in the familiar air of their home planet. Showing Hubbard the chit, he scrawled upon its reverse the familiar words, having wonderful time. Wish you were here, and gave it to Brooks. Doubtless the very banality of the response would help to quiet any undue nervousness in the distant spaceships. Hubbard now cut in the automatic pilot, setting the ship in a long, right-hand gliding turn, carefully worked out beforehand. It would steer them out of the plane of the ecliptic and towards the south polar cap, the aiming point of their descent. Holt kept looking out at the dark surface below them in the hope of discovering some gleam of light similar to what he had seen through Bergman's telescope. At times he felt that it had again appeared, but on each occasion the enveloping darkness swallowed it before he could be sure or the wide wing interrupted his vision. Finally the first livid glare of the solar corona came up over the dark edge of the horizon. The heavy boat's speed had been reduced only to 3,400 meters per second by the tenuous Martian air, despite the 20 minutes which had elapsed since the perigee of their landing ellipse. They were still 150 kilometers high, and the electric and pressure altimeters coincided almost exactly thanks to the calibration of the latter permitted by the sounding bomb readings. The first rays of the sun penetrated the bow windows of their cabin, although the darkness still spread its mantle over the scene below. Slowly, very slowly, the dawn crept toward them, revealing vague outlines on the surface. Holt consulted his watch, the chart and what he could see through his port. That elongated area ahead and to the right must be the Mare Cimmerium. Our flight time corresponds with our passage across the 220 th meridian and the equator. Yes, answered Hubbard, and that broad canal just under us must be Cyclopus. Still at vast altitude, they followed the Antuas Canal from northwest to southeast, and passed Mare Cronium, looking like a fertile, green meadow. Fifteen minutes later. There was a broad bridge of vegetation joining the bleak deserts of Thylai and Thaltu and after they had whipped across it, the glistening white of the south polar snows rose over the horizon. Holt took his field glasses and inspected the surface below, that extensive vegetal area which so strikingly surrounds the polar caps, even when seen from the earth. It was Mare Austral. After landing, their caterpillars would crawl through it to the point Bergman had selected as most suitable for the landing of the other two boats. In the steep sunshine, the land appeared dry, for no puddles sent up their reflected shimmers. From 80 kilometers, he could not distinguish the nature of the vegetation. As they approached the snow, Holt examined the line of demarcation between it and the green surroundings. At that line it would be easiest to discover the depth of the snow and the nature of the white covering concealing the sunmost part of the planet. Dot spreading along the wide verge of the Antarctic snowfield was a band of shimmering water, extending into the distance like a great river. As they flew above it, they could see its vast extent and recognize its shallowness from the tops of the plants emerging. I believe we'd better go further south where the snow may be firmer, said Hubbard. To land in the melting zone might get us upon a surface so soft that we and the whole business would sink us in a quicksand. There was a change in the reaction of the ship to Hubbard's neat control movements. Martian transonic conditions are about the same as those at home, he called to Holt as the altimeter hung for a moment at 38 kilometers. Hubbard cautiously lowered the leading edge flaps of the wings. Holt scanned the surface attentively through his binoculars. Suddenly he gave Hubbard a punch in the ribs and handed him the glasses. Give me the controls, he said, and take a look at that long, grey thing down there. He banked into a smooth curve so that Hubbard might see better. It certainly looks artificial, said the latter. Rather like concrete. 
I wonder what it can be? Holt returned the controls and began taking photographs of the strange object with his telecamera. Hubbard made several 360 degree turns around the mysterious structure while his companion again studied it with the glasses. There's no doubt about it, that thing's artificial, he said. A mass as regular as that in the middle of a stoneless region didn't just happen. It looks rather like a concrete concert hut, with a domed roof and no windows. Perhaps we can tell more from the photographs after they're developed. Hubbard marked the location of the object on his chart and glided further over the snow, meanwhile descending to 1,000 meters. Ready with the wind bomb? He asked the mechanic below him. Ready? came the answer. Does the surface look good? He asked Holt. Upon Holt's affirmative, the bomb was dropped, and Hubbard piloted the ship into a left turn, his eyes on the spot where the bomb would fall. A huge column of black smoke arose from it, drifting slowly to the northeast. As the trailing edge flaps went down and the skis were lowered, Hull radioed night that they would land immediately. The ship was now heading upwind towards the smoke bomb, close to the glittering surface of the snow. The skis touched softly and they sped like a sleigh along the smooth white plain. The friction brakes reduced their speed with an unpleasant scratching and grinding, and their motion stopped. Nice landing, Glenn, said Holt with a pat on the shoulder. Looks like the finale of the second act, commented Hubbard. Do you think we've got a happy ending coming too? Asked Holt with a smile which couldn't quite hide the obvious concern he felt. Never been to a movie yet that didn't have one. And you know this must be a movie, for people don't get to Mars except in movies. So I, for one, I'm counting on a happy ending. Chapter 22, A Greyish Mass The first 18 human beings to land on Mars were grouped around the door leading to the upper surface of the huge wing. They listened intently to the hiss of the escaping air as the cabin was brought down to the low pressure outside. Then the door opened and they stepped out, Holt in the lead. Clad in their pressure suits and spherical, transparent helmets, they grouped themselves around him on the wing dot curiously, and with mixed feelings, they gazed upon the wide expanse of snow surrounding their motionless vessel. Although encumbered with their space suits and not yet accustomed to walking and standing in the long unfamiliar gravity, there was a feeling of release at no longer being cooped up within the small confines of the vessels in which they had made their long and silent journey. The scene before them might well have been that presented by a snow-covered plateau of their own familiar earth, glistening in the sunlight from a dark blue, cloudless sky. Yet they beheld the scenery of a strange place, which to their loved ones at home appeared hardly different from any of the myriad denizens of the heavens. Holt and Hubbard walked to the trailing edge from which the landing flap sloped towards the snow, six meters away. Go ahead, jump! shouted Holt gleefully into his microphone and pointing downward. Hubbard looked sheepish. How about the boss being the first man on Mars? he asked. You're the fellow who got us here safely, returned Holt. Get on with it. Hubbard, without further ado, sprang down, landing no harder than if the jump had been two meters or so, for Mars' weak gravity seemed barely to pull him through the six meters between the wing and the surface. He gathered a handful of snow in the clumsy mitts of his pressure suit and tried to toss it up. It broke in the air, returning as powder to dust the transparent top of his helmet. We've got powder snow, he called into his microphone. Did we bring any skis? As soon as the excitement of the arrival subsided, unloading operations were begun by opening the belly hatch and lowering the first of the caterpillars. The Chrysler Corporation had developed them especially for conditions on the Red Planet, and they varied considerably from familiar patterns on Earth. The power plants in particular had been designed to be independent of the atmosphere, except for cooling, for it had been thought unwise to rely upon burning any fuel in the relatively low oxygen concentration of the Martian atmosphere. Supercharging, similar to that used in aircraft engines for high altitudes, might have been effective. But Holt's judgment was that this would be a questionable expedient in view of the refusal of the spectroscope operators on Lunetta to commit themselves. The caterpillars, 
therefore, were driven by two propellants, concentrated hydrogen peroxide, as used in the reaction pistols, and common fuel oil. The hydrogen peroxide was first dissociated into water vapor and oxygen in a catalyzing chamber. This mixture evolved steam at high temperature by the energy of dissociation. Into it was injected a metered quantity of fuel oil, which promptly burned in the oxygen portion of the mixture. A row of successive nozzles injected water into the flame, thus producing steam of moderate heat, only slightly contaminated by carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide from the combustion of the oil. The flow of this steam could be regulated by throttling the admission of its three constituents. It turned a turbine which provided power for the caterpillar. The steam was condensed in a low pressure condenser, cooled by a blower, after passing through the turbine. The carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide remained in the vapor phase and were drawn off and expelled by a second and smaller blower, while the water in liquid phase was recirculated from the condenser to the combustion chamber. The water loss of the system, therefore, was limited to the portions affected by dissociation of the peroxide and the combustion of the oil, by being ejected into the atmosphere as withdrawn from circulation. The efficiency of this system was quite high in view of the necessity for providing artificially the oxygen which an ordinary engine would extract from the atmosphere, and considering that this oxygen formed part of the propellants and so tankage had to be provided for it. In order to conserve supplies, the cruising speed of the land vehicles was restricted to 13 miles per hour. The tracks of the caterpillars extended across their whole lower surface and their 12 foot length in order to diminish their surface loading and give maximum traction on the softest ground. In the weak Martian gravity, the vehicles weighted but 28% of their terrestrial tonnage. This reduced the danger of becoming mired, but it also diminished the traction to the same extent. Thus the maximum obtainable length tended to prevent non-propulsive churning of the tracks. Directional control was obtained by breaking one or the other of the tracks, their low ground pressures permitting this despite their great width. The power plant was located between the tracks, and above it was an elongated cylindrical body which could be pressurized and which provided space for passengers and lading. Forward it had two large, oval windows through which the driver might view the ground and several circular ports along the sides for the passengers. Two hemispherical, plastic gun turrets stood above the forward and after ends of the cylinder. Just behind it, mounted on the framework of the strange vehicle, was a small crane such as is used on wrecking tow cars. From the crane's jib to the forward end of the cylinder ran the radio antenna which was to aid communication via the radio bombs. When all three caterpillars had been lowered and given a short test run to ensure their power plants were working properly, Holt deployed them around the helpless landing boat in the untoward event that the hitherto invisible Martians might undertake some hostile action. But nothing happened. After the removal of the three huge caterpillars, unloading began in earnest. Three folding trailers were dropped through the hatch and assembled on the snow beneath the belly of the boat. The first one completed, standing upon its wide wheels, was placed beneath the hatch while busy hands under the expert direction of Clark Winslow piled it with a vast assortment of cases and equipment. As each was hauled away with its load the reserve fuel tanks to supplement the tankage of the caterpillars were filled by gravity hoses from wing tanks of the landing boat. The long voyage ahead precluded the tractor caterpillars from carrying adequate fuel supplies in their own tanks. For twelve hours, the landing party bent its united energies to the accomplishment of the seemingly endless task. But when the work was done, no restful night came to induce sleep in their wearied limbs. It was summer at the Martian South Pole, and the midnight sun remained visible in undiminished splendor. It made but a sweep at the horizon returning in a great circle in the sky to a point due south. All hands were much relieved when Holt ordered the hatch closed on their boat and the air valves opened to bring up the pressure. Wearily they had trooped through the door and divested themselves of their space suits to seat themselves around the table hastily constructed from various bits and pieces of the storage gear. One of the soldiers proved himself to be no mean cook and it was a novel experience for them all to eat and drink in the old familiar fashion from open plates and glasses. That night, 
when the shades were drawn over the landing boat's ports to keep out the brilliant glare reflected from the snow, the men retired to their acceleration couches, somehow grateful not to be floating in space, despite the sometimes painful pressure which even the light Martian gravity inflicted upon them. Zero, they arose next day to find the sun shining as brightly as before. Donning their space suits and releasing the pressure in their abandoned landing boat, Billingsley, Gudunek and Wolf stamped their way through the powdery snow to the panther, Holt's caterpillar, which was to head the column moving northwards. The driver was Sergeant Rigand, a tough farmer from North Dakota, Brooks, Oberth's radio man, would attend to communications. Holt himself would man the forward gun if things got tough, while Brooks would take the after one. The Jaguar, under Glenn Hubbard, was manned by Clark Winslow and four soldiers, while Leopard was to bring up the rear under Lieutenant Hampstead and the remaining five men of his guard. After each caterpillar had picked up its trailer, Holt sent Winslow back to assure himself that the abandoned landing boat was as well moored as circumstances permitted, lest she capsize in some storm or blow away across the limitless wilderness of snow. The thought of burning the boat as Cortez had done with his ships ran through Holt's head. Both the lack of propellants in her tanks and her station near the pole effectively prohibited any return to the orbit where their friends still circled Mars. But finally Holt's natural conservatism prevailed upon him to preserve what few material possessions he had brought to this distant goal. As the caterpillars rattled and snorted northward with their trailers. Holt stood in the gun turret of the Panther and surveyed the vast snow field ahead. In the pressurized interior, he had removed his helmet and laid it upon the breech of the gun. Like the others, he still wore his pressure suit. As the mileages were called up to him from below, he entered each odometer reading on the chart where he kept track of their progress along the 190th meridian to which the gyra compass held their course. If he had estimated correctly, some twenty-five miles should bring them to the mysterious, concrete Quonset hut which had so attracted his attention during the landing approach. Tom Knight, whirling around Mars high overhead, had been kept closely in touch by radio with all that occurred. He had returned a description of the joy of the Mars circlers at the successful landing on the 82nd parallel of latitude, and was fully aware of their course towards the mysterious building Holt had described. Shortly before, he reported that he was able to make out the three dark spots of the caterpillars on the blind snow through Bergman's great telescope, and that he had located the mysterious grey building during the half hour that his vessels were able to view the region where the landing party was making its slow progress. The northward trek had continued for two hours at twelve miles per hour when Holt saw the previously clear horizon become misty and blurred. This he took to be the effect of the melting zone and the haze which would naturally form above it. He turned to look astern. The tracks left by their caterpillars, which had therefore been almost indistinguishable in the mixture of hoarfrost and powder snow, were now clear and distinct, indicating that the snow must be growing stiff and sticky. Sure enough, the thermometer outside his glass dome showed 30 degrees Fahrenheit just under freezing. As he meditated upon the rapid increase in temperature, a rounded silhouette rose out of the haze ahead. It could only be the mysterious building. Quickly he called Jaguar and Leopard with orders to man the guns, again bracketing his binoculars on the projection above the monotonous expanse of snow. There was no movement, no sign of life. But with surprise, he beheld at each end of the strange structure two small turrets protruding from its smoothly rounded roof. Had there been smoke, he would have taken them for chimneys. The heavy machines clattered towards the mystery and stopped two hundred yards away at Holt's radioed command. The lenses of his glasses revealed nothing. There was no path nor road leading to the building. Around it, crevices in the now melting snow showed green vegetation apparently thick and mossy. There were no windows nor other apertures in the great, grey block 300 by 100 yards square. The rounded roof met the ground hemispherically at either end. Nor did the two turrets help to uncover the mystery. Their twelve feet of height and nine or ten of diameter were topped off by hemispherical, smooth caps. They could not be chimneys. No snow was on the rounded roof, 
but the light northerly wind bringing the haze towards them might have blown it away. That was quite possible. Could there be heat inside? Staring through the glasses, Holt's eyes burned with curiosity and concern. Now they seemed to tell him that the upper portion was more lightly shaded than the grey of the lower. Sure enough, he detected a marked line of separation running horizontally around the roof at mid-height. Where the building ended hemispherically, the line ran upward and across the rotund gable. The central portion of the roof was unmistakably of a different material and seemed to have been let into the main structure. Holt ordered the caterpillars to disperse, one at each end of the weird building, while he with the panther took position fifty yards from their long, curved southern wall. Useless as they seemed, the tiny gun barrels swung around toward the giant mass. Calling to Billingsley in the compartment behind him, Holt suggested a little sally to the placid Briton. Quite so. Might be rather fun, you know, came back the imperturbable voice. Slipping on their pressure helmets, they airlocked themselves out into the wet snow and took a tall ladder from the loaded trailer. Dragging it behind them, they approached the curving wall with the floating step which characterized the light Martian weights of their bodies. Holt drew a heavy knife from his belt and scratched at the strange material. Harder than concrete, he remarked with a shake of his head. They pushed the ladder carefully up the sloping surface before them and mounted to a point at which the angle was flat enough to prevent their slipping on the roof itself. As they reached the mysterious line, the waiting crews saw them throw themselves down with their heads just across it, gazing fixedly at the surface. What they saw took away their breath, for the whole upper part of the roof was of transparent, glass like material. Below it was a huge engine room, reminiscent of a giant terrestrial power plant. They counted fourteen huge, circular, red painted shapes, neatly arranged within the silver glittering hall. Pumps, or I'm a Chinaman, said Holt after getting his breath again. Old man Hansen was right. And your Percival Lowell, God rest his soul, chimed in Billingsley. Holt pressed his helmet to the glass. Feel it? The machinery's running. Look, old fellow, grunted Billingsley, I'm sure I just saw one of their chaps running about down there. A diminutive, dark-haired figure of human bearing and carriage was walking down the length of the great room. He stopped and inspected one pump after another as he gradually approached the spot above which they kept their watch. The Martian wore a white garment reminiscent of a Japanese kimono with multicolored ornamentation. The man, for no other name could be applied to him, was beardless. His face was swarthy, with warm and friendly eyes and delicate features. His arms and legs showed nothing different from those of Homo sapiens, as exemplified by the quaking observers on the transparent roof. Almighty God must have found that our species has some good points, if he chooses to plant something so much like us on Mars, meditated Holt. But look at the enormous skull the fellow has," whispered Billingsley as though he feared eavesdroppers. My dear chap, if what that skull contains is all intelligence, we may be able to learn something yet from these bally Martians. Holt gazed solemnly at the creature below who still seemed unaware of his brethren from another planet. John, he finally remarked, now I think I've got my theory working. These Martians are undoubtedly subterranean, and cannot live in the open. The whole pumping station is pressurized. Why else the curvature of this roof? Their whole civilization is pressurized and air conditioned. Otherwise, how to explain the rest of it? No streets, no cities, no life above the surface but this huge pumping station, and the radio music Lassini picked up the other day? Billingsley brought his hand up as though to scratch his head through the plastic of his hermetic helmet. Bergman, he said, once confided to me that he believed this to be the answer. But he was a bit bashful about declaring it openly. Probably thought it rather on the fantastic side, you know. But I don't see why they shouldn't have done it judging from this. Do you think we should try and communicate with the lad down there? Asked Holt. If we're right about their civilization, we shall run into similar structures anywhere we go and have similar difficulties. We can't get in, and they may not come out. 
wouldn't that be a joke on us, if we sailed halfway through the solar system to find that we can do no more than look at a Martian through several inches of glass? I jolly well don't see why the blighter shouldn't come out, huffed Billingsley. If his bally job is to pump water, he must look southward once in a while to see how the melting snow is holding out, and how much more water he can expect before the pumping season is over. Or do you think that might be a blooming terrestrial point of view? You're probably quite right about it. We'll dash back to our caterpillar and make a report to Tom Knight who ought to be hanging around somewhere above us right now. He can retransmit what we've seen to Earth. Our voyage will have had some value, no matter what happens from here on. We'll tell him to bracket the big scope on us while we make a racket which the fellow down will be bound to notice. Then we'll see what happens. Jolly good idea, said Bayou Ingsley. Perhaps our Martian here in the frozen south will be a bit more pleased with interplanetary visitors than the authorities of some large town. They might be frightfully annoyed if we were to drop in on them unannounced. Well, concluded Holt, if our friend down there should have some kind of death ray, or otherwise make it hot for us, the caterpillars can always retreat in a hurry and send the bad news tonight. Let's chapter 23, contact Holt. After having heard the circling convoy in the satellite orbit confirm his exciting report, ordered Jaguar and Leopard to station themselves a thousand yards to the west of the Martian pumping station. Sam Wolf took over the command of Panther, which remained where she was, close to the station's well. Her living compartment was depressurized and the crew sat within in pressure suits, ready to respond to any call for help. Wolf had connected his walkie-talkie to the antenna of the caterpillars so that he could speak with the men outside. Gudunek accompanied Holt and Billingsley back to the pumping station and up the ladder. The white-clad figure below still stood before one of the great pieces of machinery. The great moment had come. Holt moved two steps onto the transparent roof and then stamped thrice upon the thick pane. The Martian glanced up, a look of amazement flooding across his features. In a moment, his face reassumed its calm and he waved up at them as though interplanetary visitors were an everyday occurrence. Holt waved back, pointing to himself and his companions, then down into the hall. The Martian stared, then passed his hand horizontally before his forehead in an indescribably graceful gesture and walked to a small doorway through which he disappeared. Ten tense minutes passed. Suddenly they became aware that a door in the chimney like turret at the end of the building had opened. Looking through, they could see a second, unopened door of glass, some five feet inside. Behind it was their Martian, inviting them with easy gestures to enter what was evidently an airlock. They could now see him clearly. Aside from his stature, which was shorter than their own by a foot or so, and his large cranium, he exhibited no major differences from terrestrial man. Entering, they stood before the transparent bulkhead, awaiting the Martian's next move. With some perturbation, they saw him push a button which closed behind them a semi cylindrical sliding door of metal, confining them within a cylinder whose other half was composed of the curved pane behind which the Martian stood. A hissing sound indicated that the airlock was being filled so that they might pass into a larger pressurized compartment without major discomfort. The three earthlings gazed with attentive concern at the Martian's doings at a small switchboard. There was no backing out now, they could not even radio to the waiting Sam Wolf. With apparent unconcern, the Martian continued to pull switches and push buttons. Holt's exterior pressure meter in his helmet now indicated 4 pounds per square inch. The interior of his suit held 7 pounds per square inch. A glance at the gas analyzer from his pocket showed 40% oxygen and 3% carbon dioxide. The rest was inert gas of some unknown kind. Should this be nitrogen, which his analyzer could not show, the prospects were good indeed. Even other noble gases such as helium or argon would offer no hindrance to satisfactory respiration. He could, however, by no means be certain that their Martian was flooding them with something safely respirable by terrestrial human lungs. Holt's space suit inflation collapsed and the pressure gauge now showed 10 pounds per square inch. 
This corresponded to an altitude of 25,000 feet altitude on Earth, where 40% oxygen may be breathed with impunity without fear of intoxication. Breathing masks commonly used by aviators furnished a higher oxygen percentage than the 21% of the terrestrial atmosphere. As the pressures equalized, the inner glass door slid back. The Martian's face lit with a friendly smile as he pressed the palm of his right hand over the spot where his heart was. If the inner anatomy of Martians resembled that of terrestrial humans as much as did their exteriors, Holt and his companions followed suit and then stepped towards him in the elevator which he evidently occupied. Silently, the Martian pushed a button, and the lift descended to the floor of the great pump house. On the way down, Holt removed his helmet and took a deep breath. Aside from a great feeling of relief at the presence of relatively vast quantities of breathable air of adequate oxygen content, he felt no effects. A silent prayer of gratitude that the Martians had created an artificial atmosphere suitable to their brethren from Earth arose within his heart. Few things could so favorably affect the coming effort to reach an understanding with them. The terrestrial trio, bearing their helmets under their arms, followed the silent Martian down a long corridor lined on both sides with beautifully ornamented metal doors. The corridor glowed with a clear, warm light although there were no lamps or other apparent sources of illumination. Holt cudgeled his brains for an understanding of this phenomenon. Then he realized that the walls themselves were luminescent, like the symbols on the watch dial, though vastly brighter. Here the ancient dream of illumination engineers had become real, light without heat. No incandescent wire nor flaming arc threw out vast heat losses while producing limited light. Martian engineers had solved the mystery of the firefly and applied the solution to practical illumination problems. A feeling of infinite satisfaction overwhelmed Holt, for he could see that on the economic side alone, he might return to Earth with an infinite variety of technological and economic advances to be applied to the amelioration of human living conditions. The initial friendliness of their reception gave ground for hope that the Martians would not hesitate to part with their formulae and methods. The guide stopped by one of the metal doors lining the corridor, opened it, and ushered them into a large, windowless room decorated with carmine red patterns of pleasing outline. Opposite the door sat a venerable, dignified Martian at a long, ebonite table from which he arose at their entrance and laid his hand upon his heart. When they had countered his greeting in like manner, he motioned them to be seated upon a long, cushioned bench across the table from him. Their Martian guide thereupon intoned a melodious speech in words without significance to any of the visitors. From time to time the dignified, elderly person interrupted smoothly with what could only be questions. Gudunek listened intently to every inflection and syllable attempting to coordinate the words with the remarkably restrained gestures accompanying them. He could not get even an inkling of the Martians' reactions to the arrival of earthlings upon their transparent rooftop. There was a pause in the smooth flow of language and both looked at Holt with expressions of amicable interrogation. Drawing from his briefcase a diagram prepared for the first interview with any authorities they might meet, Holt placed it upon the table before the elderly Martian. Clearly and unmistakably portrayed was the solar system with the five inner planets Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and Jupiter. Each orbit was marked with its astronomical signs and the direction of rotation of its planet. The route of the expedition stood out in brilliant red, with an arrow marking the direction of travel. The ancient art of astronomy was surely the most likely ground upon which to base a set of semantic symbols capable of development into broader means of communication between the denizens of separate planets. The senior of the two Martians bent over the diagram with evident interest and understanding. Holt's finger point to his own group and then to the Earth, followed the flight path, then indicated their hosts and their planets. He then arose and placed his hand upon his heart after the Martian method of greeting. The senior Martian followed suit, turning thereafter with a wry smile to a small cabinet in the wall. He opened the cabinet and adjusted two knobs within. No sooner had he done so than the blood of the visitors suffused their faces with embarrassment, for a voice in colloquial English sounded forth, Can you still hear me? 
Tom it questioned. If we don't get out of that building within 24 hours, the caterpillars will proceed northward along the 190th meridian to the equator where they'll start preparing the landing strip. It was Holt's own voice, evidently intercepted and recorded by the Martian radio system. While it was likely that the significance of the words entirely escaped their hosts, it was at least entirely clear that the latter were anything but ignorant of what was going on in an interplanetary way. It would be well to be careful in dealing with people of that sort. The Martian shut off the record and smiled tolerantly at Holt and his party, whose answering grins held no small portion of embarrassment. Holt felt that matters were progressing rather better than expected, despite the evident lack of privacy of their communications. The elderly Martian now extracted a large sheet from a drawer in the wall and spread it before Holt. It seemed an organization chart being covered with circles arranged in pyramidal form and containing mysterious symbols. The Martian selected one of the small circles in the bottom row and placed his finger upon it. He put a finger of his other hand upon his breast and nodded as much as to say, this is where I am. Then, with a finger on the larger circle at the top of the pyramid, he gestured into the room and said something which sounded like Allah. By Jove spoke Billingsley with a perfectly straight face but with a trace of roguishness in his voice, looks rather as though the British Labour Party had gotten here before us. Mars seems almost as bureaucratic as jolly old England. Holt produced his map of the Red Planet, showing the mark he had made to locate the pumping station in which they were being entertained. Then he pointed at the ground below them. Saying Allah in a rising and questioning inflection, he offered the Martian his pencil. Accepting it promptly, the latter poised it above the circular, vegetal area over which they had flown when approaching the landing and made a cross in the center. It was Lucas Solis, and the repetition of the word Allah convinced the visitors that here must be the center of Martian civilization. Although Lucas Solis was 2,600 miles away from them and quite distant from the spot which Bergman had selected for their landing strip, it became apparent to Holt that a landing of the other boats near Lucas Solis might well be sensible, for it was plain that the Martian government was anything but unprepared for the visitation by the earthlings. Even the most distant outposts had evidently received instructions for the treatment of the interplanetary visitors. Send them to headquarters immediately, was quite plainly the tenor of the policy. Holt could see no reason for doing otherwise than comply with alacrity. It was a question whether he should attempt to make clear that he would proceed there in his own vehicles, or seek Martian transportation, which he knew must exist in view of the technical perfection attained along other lines. Martian transportation, whatever it might be, would doubtless offer the quickest answer to the question of the attitudes of the inhabitants of the planet. On the other hand, he and such members of his group as might accompany him would be separating themselves from what little equipment they possessed. The other alternative, to undertake the long drive with his own vehicles, at the rate of 120 miles a day, would require almost a full month, and during that time the Martian authorities, to whom his presence was known, might well grow suspicious of his intentions and perhaps take unpleasant countermeasures. Holt put the question to Billingsley and Gudunek while their hosts listened politely if perhaps uncomprehendingly. No doubt about it, said the former. We'd best thrust our unprotected heads right into the lion's mouth as soon as possible. He'll be much less likely to bite than if we delay the business. Gudunek expressed the same sentiments and brought up the question of how many men should accompany Holt. If we take too many, said he, we shall have difficulty keeping them together. Quite right, answered Holt. We three will do it and leave the rest of the party with the caterpillars to await word from us. Hubbard will wait seven days, and if he doesn't hear from us, he'll drive on to the location already selected for the landing strip, prepare it and arrange anything further according to his judgment and nights. Minus zero, after some difficulty in convincing the elderly Martian that they must depart from the pumping station in order to communicate with the waiting landing party outside before accompanying him to Allah, they were politely ushered out of the airlock, from which the old gentleman observed with interest their return to the vehicle.
exactly what his feelings were when the other caterpillars rolled up and their helmeted crews crowded into one of them, they could not tell. His greeting was nonetheless cordial when Holt, Billingsley and Gudunek returned dragging heavy boxes which they took with them into the airlock and to the floor of the pumping station. Following the Martian, the three earthlings and their burdens entered another elevator which plunged yet deeper into the mysterious planet. At the bottom, the Martian opened the door and they stepped out into a bright, vaulted space of some sixty feet in length and twelve in height. Both lateral walls were interrupted by circular glass windows reaching to the floor. Looking through one of them, Holt saw a wide tube of some twelve feet in diameter gleaming brightly, as did all other rooms or corridors, by reason of the luminous paint. That looks rather like a subway tunnel, he remarked to Billingsley, except for there being no rails. There's a sort of slot at the top, commented the latter. Perhaps it's a kind of hanging railway. By Jove! They advanced to one of the round windows somewhat further down the sixty foot platform and saw through it a compartment containing a number of low, but comfortable looking seats. The Mars Express! whistled Gudunek. The Arla Limited, so help me cracked Billingsley. The Martians pressed a switch button beside the window, which promptly slid up, much after the manner of the windows of the more expensive terrestrial motor cars. With his help, they stowed their baggage behind their seats, and seated themselves at his inviting gesture. He went to the other end of the compartment and began to work the switches on a panel located there. Beyond him was a transparent sheet which permitted Holt and his companions to see the luminous tube in which their small compartment lay, extending indefinitely ahead of them. As the Martian worked, the door through which they had entered slid closed, as did a second one hitherto concealed in the walls of the compartment. The Martian returned and seated himself beside Holt, but nothing moved. Then there were three flashes, one after another, at the forward window. The Martian gestured that they should remain seated. At a double flash, the Martian raised his arm aloft. Then came a third, long extended orange flash, the arm came down and the vehicle, for such it evidently was moved noiselessly and smoothly into the tunnel with rapidly increasing speed. The earthlings were pressed back into their chairs with an acceleration reminiscent of that of a serious launching. Holt's hands clutched the arms of his seat, his head against the headrest. He could just see the watch on his wrist which indicated that they had been moving for twenty seconds at an acceleration which he was convinced could not be less than three grams. It almost frightened him to realize that already they must have reached supersonic speed, for their vehicle was in no way streamlined, having blunt, hemispherical ends and fitting the inner diameter of the tunnel so tightly that there was but an inch or so of clearance. There could be but one explanation for the terrific speed with which they shot down the tunnel, there must be a vacuum within it. Holt's curiosity as to the mode of propulsion of this fantastic vehicle plagued him like a rash. There was no familiar clicking of rail joints every thirty feet, nor could he hear the hum of an electric motor or any other source of power. Finally he determined to attempt to elicit the information from the silent Martian. From his briefcase he drew a colored photograph of one of his Native American streamlined trains which he had brought for the dignitaries of Allah. The old gentleman examined the picture minutely while Holt pointed at the rails ahead of the locomotive and then made circular movements to suggest the rotation of the driving wheels. Then, with an interrogatory gesture at the roof of their car, he offered the Martian a pencil and the reverse side of the photograph as a place to sketch. As the lines flowed from the Martian's fingers, Holt recognized a fellow engineer in the old man. Martian railways knew no wheels. At the front and rear of the roof of their car were two horseshoe-shaped permanent magnets which were poised around a bearing rail at the top of the tunnel and within the slot running along its center. The magnetic flux which passed through the bearing rail from one pole of the magnets to the other suspended their light vehicle without metal-to-metal -metal contact. 
the secret of the absence of such contact and therewith of the suspension lay in a device which prevented the free floating supporting magnet from sliding to one side and contacting the rail with one of the poles. The device was located behind each of the powerful supporting magnets and consisted of two condenser plates arranged on either side of the supporting rail and whose capacity changed as they approached or receded from the rail. This change in capacity was apparently utilized to energize two electromagnets arranged laterally to the rail through an electronic amplifier. According to whether one or the other of the two electromagnets received more or less amperage, the position of the large permanent magnet was displaced to the right or left by a small increment. The control was so adjusted that the bearer magnet was balanced in a free floating central position. That's a problem of getting sufficient sensitivity and damping in the control system, thought Holt. Actually, there was no reason why an electronic control with sufficiently fast action shouldn't he solve it. The handy sketch produced by the Martian also revealed the secret of the power driving their fleet car. In principle, it was nothing more nor less than the famous, or infamous, solenoid gun, which for many years had ghosted in the minds of terrestrial engineers without ever reaching the practical stage. Above the suspension rail was a chain of electrical windings, interrupted at regular intervals. These coils were energized consecutively from an exterior source of current so that a cylindrical permanent magnet located centrally in the car roof was attracted from one coil to the next, rushing the car with it. This permanent magnet represented in some sense the armature of an electric motor which, instead of rotating, dashed along the extended sequence of the coils. It seemed that once the period of acceleration was passed, strong current impulses no longer were required through the coils, for there remained but friction to be overcome. Friction? Ran through Holt's mind, what sort of friction? There were no wheels whose bearings and rims could produce friction. In order to use wheels, the Martians would have had to possess materials of strength many times superior to the best terrestrial steels, if they were to withstand the centrifugal forces produced by such tremendous speeds. Air drag. There was a vacuum in the tunnel. So there was only hysteresis created in those sections of the suspension rail gripped by the vehicle's magnets. But if the suspension rail were laminated, as is the custom in terrestrial transformers and generators, even the hysteresis caused by eddy currents could not be great. Every now and then a brief row of round lights flashed at them as they whizzed down the straight tunnel. There were obviously entrance doors of stations lining the underground passage through which they were shooting like a projectile. It occurred to Holt that it might be embarrassing if another car happened to be stopped to receive passengers at any of these stations. There was no engineer or motorman, and he had seen nobody except their small party on the platform from which they had departed. The elderly Martian sat unconcerned beside him, immersed in the pictures Holt had handed him. He paid not the slightest attention to their bullet-like speed. The only explanation was a completely automatic system. Suddenly there seemed to be an application of brakes, for they were gently urged forwards in their seats. Far, far ahead, a slight change of direction in the tunnel could be seen. They were on top of it and could feel the centrifugal force as the car swung slightly outward, despite the reduction in their velocity as they made the turn. Then the acceleration came on again and brought them back to speed. Twice their vehicle came to a full stop for a few seconds, then the invisible and automatic signals controlling this underground miracle of transportation sent them on their way once more. Zero, after a brief two hours, their Martian companion signaled that their journey was approaching its end. With reduced speed, they slid through switches at forks in the tunnel and finally halted before the round glass doors of a station. Here a festive scene awaited them, for the tiny platform was decorated with multicolored and tasteful draperies and occupied by 80 or 100 Martians of both sexes. The clothing of the Martians had a silken metallic sheen and was beautifully ornamented in the most varied colors, lending a solemn, almost reverentially antique flavor to the occasion. The earthlings could not but contrast this with the marvelous practicality of the technical miracles achieved by the same people. At the signaled invitation of their guide, 
Holt stepped out at the head of his companions upon a thick carpet which led from the door of the car to a group of Martians centered around a venerable man in a violet kimono embroidered with tiny golden stars. Holt approached him and gave the Martian greeting with his hand on his heart. Bilingsley and Gudunik, a few paces behind him, followed his example to right and left. The old gentleman returned the greeting followed by the surrounding dignitaries. Harp like musk filled the air with a cheerful lilt in which a joyous greeting was somehow reflected, and the chief dignitary advanced towards Holt holding out in both hands a massive and glittering ornamental chain which he ceremoniously placed over Holt's bowed head. Then, after the manner of a South American abrazo, he embraced him. The hospitality of this reception surprised Holt no little, despite the very complete equipment he carried with which to reciprocate kindness. With a grandiose gesture he motioned Bilingsley to his side. The latter stepped forward, ceremoniously opening a gold embossed jewel case in which lay a ruby studded arrangement in the shape of a star. As though he had spent a lifetime pinning royal decorations upon the breasts of faithful servitors, Holt gravely attached the glittering bauble to the Martian's upper garment. Next he returned the embrace. Apparently satisfied, the old Martian made a gesture of mutual departure and stepped forth with Holt at his side. Holt was no little concerned about the baggage with the radio transmitter, a signal from which his comrades in the frozen south were anxiously awaiting. A turn of his head revealed Gudunek engrossed in a sign language conversation with their erstwhile guide and evidently relating to the baggage which had been left in the underground car. Coolly he turned back to his dignified companion, somewhat restrained by the obvious impossibility of initiating any small talk, and they walked together decorations jingling, to the exit. Chapter 24, Hamas is governed long and exhausting were the official receptions of the three earflings by the Martian authorities. Holt and his two companions finally found enough leisure to make themselves a consecutive picture of the vast variety of novel impressions which the week of greetings had poured upon them. At no time did they sense any suspicion that their arrival out of the depths of space might be motivated by anything but the most friendly of feelings and intentions. At first they had thought that perhaps the Martian consciousness of absolute technical superiority over earthlings had been the foundation of the dignified courtesy and consideration shown to them by the personalities in authority. After all, an interplanetary visitation could be no ordinary event, even in their lives. But slowly Holt and his companions began to realize that they were acting from primarily quite different motives. The pictures of life on earth with which they had been regaled were to them but final confirmation of the universally held, deep, religious conviction that God had created man in his own image, wherever man was to be found. The efforts of earthlings to subjugate nature on their richly endowed planet seemed to the Martians technically extremely primitive but again they drew the conclusion that these pitiful efforts were but an additional proof that God had inspired the doers, and that this inspiration was inseparably linked with that inner urge to action which had been the driving power of Martian civilization. The Martian government was directed by ten men, the leader of whom was elected by universal suffrage for five years and entitled Elan. Two houses of parliament enacted the laws to be administered by the Aelan and his cabinet. The upper house was called the Council of the Elders and was limited to a membership of sixty persons, each being appointed for life by the Aelan as vacancies occurred by death. In principle, the method was not unlike that by which the College of Cardinals of the Roman Catholic Church is appointed. Usually the Aelan chose historians, churchmen former cabinet members or successful economic leaders who could offer lifetimes of valuable experience. The Council of Elders, however, had but limited authority. Proposed laws could be approved or disapproved as presented, but no riders, amendments or alterations could be voted. The Council of the Elders could stimulate, suggest and test legislation. Its main purpose was not action but rather to assure continuity of the basic thought on legislation, as also the protection of that thought. A lower house, the Assembly of Deputies, was devoted to action, 
for here demands were made and wordy battles were fought. The main distinction between the Martian Assembly and analogous terrestrial legislatures was the electoral system. The United Congress of the Earth was composed of representatives regionally elected after the tried and true examples of the formerly great democratic nations. The Martian Assembly of Deputies, on the other hand, consisted of representatives of certain occupational groups. This peculiar electoral system originated in the structure of the entire Martian community which, despite the close relationship between the thinking and feeling of the individual and that of his earthling brother, yet differed profoundly from the community of Earth. The ancient culture had long since emerged from the age when the welfare of the inhabitants of any region depended upon their being well and powerfully represented in the machinery of government. The earth had not yet cast aside the concept that the riches of any particular region, whether in natural resources or skill and energy of its inhabitants, should be devoted primarily to the welfare and comfort of those same inhabitants. Thus each country of earth attempted energetically to elect such representatives as would most effectively further its own, immediate welfare and interests. Thousands of years of civilization on Mars had permitted refined technology completely to remove all regional concepts. Racial prejudice, national and local patriotism had not existed since time out of mind. Conditions of life on Mars, vastly different from those of earth, made it possible for the planet to be governed without any form of regional representation. It was possible to make any conceivable journey within the confines of the planet in less than four hours in the high-velocity subways. This, and the fact that the very concept of nostalgia was unknown, due to subterranean existence which prevented Martians from developing attachment to local scenery or dwellings, together with the standardization of all ideas and desires had much to do with it. Other factors were mass production of all consumer goods, and synthetics had replaced organic and inorganic natural materials and foodstuffs. This, of course, abolished the distinction between naturally rich and naturally poor regions, so that there no longer existed have and have not regional groupings with conflicting interests. The aging planet offered its inhabitants very few natural riches, and they had found that their individual lots could not be improved by attempting to bring their particular regions to the fore, either politically or economically. So integrated had their economy become that any trouble afflicting one locality was immediately painful to the entire planet. This, however, did not mean that utter peace and unity existed among the Martians, for there was only a displacement in the points at issue. Instead of geographical differences of opinion, Political debates went on between the representatives of various branches of science, technology and administration concerned with maintenance and improvement of living conditions. Traders and transportation people would differ with sociologists, physicians could not agree with ventilation engineers, private industry would argue with government, employees had grievances against employers, and so on. Ad infinitum. The ultimate result of these differences was a congress of professionals from each of the complicated branches upon which the highly involved society of Mars was dependent, and each branch was represented in proportion to its importance. Mars appeared to be doing extremely well with this system. There were, of course, local authorities to handle local problems. The fairy underground city of Arla was the capital of Mars and had a mayor as did New York. But the city council was composed of elected professionalists, exactly parallel to the assembly of deputies.0, towards the end of the week of receptions and festivities with which Holt and his two companions had been welcomed, Glenn Hubbard and the rest of the first landing party arrived in Arla. Holt had followed a suggestion of the alien and instructed him to move his caterpillars to one of the great power stations at the southern rim of Thylai where there was a terminal of the underground freight system which spanned the planet. This freight system was wholly independent of the passenger transportation net and differed considerably from the latter, except as to being subterranean. The cars were extremely spacious and were coupled one to another as on Earth, and operated in tunnels no less than 30 feet in diameter. Unlike the passenger vehicles, they were suspended from wheels running on a monorail at the top of the tunnels. 
movement was much slower than that of the passenger system, for extensive switching operations had to be undertaken to classify cars with different destinations. Nor would the monorail wheel suspension permit anything like the speed of the magnetically suspended passenger vehicles. The freight tunnel to Thylai carried primarily drainage pipe and earth moving equipment for the pumping station of the region. The evacuated tunnel had airlocks at its terminals which permitted bulky freight to be moved into the atmosphere where the drainage pipe was installed. This was done by special ditch digging machines which did the excavating, laid the pipe, and then covered it, being manipulated by Martians in pressurized cabins atop the huge machines. Hubbard had reached the station after three days of hard driving, 16 hours a day. Lieutenant Hempstead's leopard had mired twice in the soft ground of the melting zone. But Hubbard and Wolf had each time succeeded in towing him out. Finally, they had reached the great concrete station. Worn out and muddy. The Martian attendants at the Thylai station greeted Hubbard with the utmost courtesy and consideration, inviting him to step into the great building in advance of the rest of the party. With great politeness, they ushered him into a small, quadrilateral room and seated him at a table where they left him. No sooner had the door closed than the light went out, greatly to Hubbard's consternation, for he felt that this might be some sort of trap. He was about to make a rush for the door when Holt suddenly appeared across the table from him against a milky, luminous background. Hello Glenn, how goes it? How on earth, one mean Mars, did you get here so fast, Colonel? I'm not really here at all, grinned Holt. What you see is my astral body. We're talking by Martian telephone, and that includes television. Hubbard was almost speechless with amazement at the full-sized colored, stereoscopic telepicture, for he would have bet his bottom dollar that Holt was really present. It was some time before he could get hold of himself enough to make notes from Holt's instructions as to the mode of behavior he should inculcate into his men so that no offense might be given the Martians. Then he had returned to the caterpillars, which he directed into the airlock. Here, they were lowered to the tunnel level and driven directly into the waiting freight cars. Since the latter were not pressurized, the earthling crews remained in the caterpillars and kept their air conditioning running until they reached Talu after a journey of some 12 hours. Chapter 25 How the Martians Live When Hubbard and his caterpillar crews debarked from their machines in the roomy freight station of Arla, Holt, Billingsley, and Gudunek were on hand to greet them beside the Martian reception committee. The new arrivals were honored with but little less ceremony than had been proffered their commander. Gudunek's uncanny semantic sense had already breached the difficulties caused by the lack of a common language, and he was able to distribute a rudimentary glossary in which he had reproduced as closely as possible the musical sounds of the single Martian language in Earthling phonetics. He himself could already chatter easily with the people of Allah, while Holt and his two original companions were no longer limited to the sign language, although they were by no means as fluent as the linguist. Dot preparations had been made for the weary earthlings to be lodged in Allah's finest hotel, on one of the upper levels of the circular, subterranean city. Although daylight never penetrated their apartments, they soon lost the power they had acquired during their wide voyage through space for the luminosity produced by the miraculous Martian interior paint in no way lacked health giving invisible rays. Invitations to the visitors from the distant planet poured in upon them and the hospitable aliens spared no pains to make them feel the sincerity of their welcome. The strangeness of their whole surroundings, and the puzzling inability of the earthlings to grasp the nature of the truly inconceivable three-dimensional city were mitigated when they were invited to the underground office building which fulfilled the functions of a city hall. Here was displayed a model of the amazing, bright, cheerful catacomb in which they were to live for more than a year. It was a huge, circular, conical mass of drifts, stopes, halls and galleries, some twenty miles in diameter and half a mile deep in full scale. The central shaft held forty round, open levels, one above the other, each about 1,000 feet in diameter. 
around them were ranged the spacious quarters of the Martian government and the administration offices of the important companies. The tubes of the Metropolitan High Speed Transit System proceeded radially from each of these levels to the sections of the city devoted to dwellings. From whatever level he happened to be occupying, the homeward bound Martian had but to walk around the circle of the spacious shaft level where he was, and enter the station which served the sector to which he wished to go. One after the other, small, six seat cars continued to pass the platform at a walking pace. Selecting an unoccupied car, the Martian would step into it and dial a three letter combination on a device not unlike a telephone. The residents of each Ala dweller had such a letter combination. The little car would continue to move slowly to the end of the platform from which unoccupied cars were switched back into the column passing the platform. Any car with one or more passengers and a dialed combination would fly down the open tunnel ahead of it to the circular gallery corresponding to the first letter of the dialed combination. Here it slipped into an elevator which carried it up or down to the level prescribed by the second dialed letter. Then the car would slide right or left within its sector until it stopped at the dwelling coded by the third letter. The Martian would step out onto the tiny platform in front of his home door, while the car returned automatically to the central station. Should the Martian or some member of his family wish to make a visit somewhere in Nala after the departure of the car? He had but to push a button beside the doorbell. Within three minutes an automatic mechanism at the central station would dispatch the same or similar car, after which dialing the appropriate three-letter combination would take them to any desired destination on any level and in any sector. There were no streets, automobiles, pedestrians, traffic lights, collisions, parking problems or crowded trains. Allah suffered from none of the nerve-wracking imperfections of an earthly metropolis. When a Martian family desired a walk, the button near the door would summon a car in which they could ride in comfort to one of the many beautiful subterranean parks in which grew the most amazing, never wilting trees and shrubs, and through whose maze of branches the sun shone by day and the stars by night. A most immaculate cleanliness was the hallmark of the huge, underground metropolis. There was no such thing as dust, for the air was cleaned, refreshed and even given the qualities of different times of year by a central air conditioning system. Individual preferences as to temperatures could be catered to if that selected by the operators of the municipal plant failed to please. Each dwelling had its own supplementary heating and cooling system, which could be adjusted to suit the occupant. Water, televisiphone, news, purchases. Everything was done by wall plugs, spigots or cabinets in which the articles desired were taken out of one of the walls. It had required some time for Holt and his companions to accustom themselves to this automatically operating subterranean existence, but as soon as they mastered it and became sufficiently familiar with the language to communicate without undue difficulty. They began to take part in the private social life of the great city. The Dean of Martian Astronomers was an elderly scientist named Ares who took great pleasure in extending to Holt one of the first invitations to a Martian home. The Ares's, with their two daughters and a grown son, lived in a handsome, capacious apartment in one of the exterior Arlian sectors. For many years Ares had devoted himself to research of Earth's conditions, indeed, his devotion to that type of discovery greatly resembled that of a kindred spirit on earth, Percival Lowell. When Holt and Hubbard, to whom the invitation had also been extended, arrived at the Ares's hospitable door in their little car, they were greeted by the whole family with the cordiality which had marked all their contacts with Martians. The old gentleman adorned them with the customary chain like decoration about the neck while Holt returned the compliment in the shape of a fine, large, terrestrial globe. Hubbard presented the ladies with flowers he had ordered from one of the large forcing greenhouses. Chattering as gaily as their still limited knowledge of the language permitted, Holt and Hubbard took their seats with the family around a bare, but graceful table in the living room. No sooner were they seated than the lady of the dwelling, for house it could not be called, extinguished the light and flipped on the television. One after the other, a procession of delectably prepared dishes flowed past their hungry eyes. When the final dish had melted into the darkness, 
the procession was repeated, this time a little faster, and during the second presentation, the diners pushed a button handed to them on a long cord as each course of which they desired to partake passed upon the screen. The screen became blank and the room again was bathed in the soft Martian interior light dot for the space of five minutes, Holt and Hubbard were given an opportunity to exercise their growing knowledge of Martian, then there was a clicking sound from somewhere and the lady of the dwelling arose and removed from a cabinet door in the wall seven shining silver containers, which she graciously placed before the diners. Cooking and serving was a lost art in Allah, for the huge catering firms of the city were able to display their wares by television and to accept orders at the simple push of an electric button. Whenever such a button was pushed, the dwelling letter combination appeared upon the order board of the company patronized, at a moment corresponding to the passage of a given dish across the television screen. Electronic cookers prepared it in a flash and, together with the trimmings, it was rushed into vacuum jars which were in turn loaded, complete with utensils, into metal containers and forwarded to the diner via the pneumatic tube delivery system which connected all portions of the city. Nor did dish washing plague the lives of Martians, for the remnants of the meal were simply replaced in the containers and pneumatically returned to the caterers.0, when the meal had been completed, Ores began to relate his observations of Earth not minimizing the difficulties which he had encountered in achieving satisfactory results, for it had, indeed, been much more difficult to observe the earth from a Martian observatory than the reverse. During the closest approach of the two planets and when Mars was in the full rays of the sun and easiest to observe, earth was between Mars and the sun and turned a pitch black surface towards the Martian astronomer. To a Martian, earth was the morning and evening star, as Venus is to the Earth. Only when at a considerable angular distance from the Sun could Earth be successfully observed. The naked Martian I then saw her as a bright double star, due to her large moon, in the morning or evening twilight. In a telescope, however, she showed as a fine sickle which grew finer the closer the planet approached the Sun in angle. Only when Earth had receded almost as far from Mars as the Sun himself, did she reveal a half illuminated disk? The extent of her illumination increased as she continued to recede on her more rapid voyage, but when her face was almost completely lighted, she was so far distant and so close to occulting behind the glare of the sun that but little of value came from observing her. Dot despite this handicap, and the frequent and extensive cloud banks which often obscured Earth, Ores related some remarkable results. Martian astronomers were well up on terrestrial climates, seasons and temperatures. They knew the composition of the atmosphere far better than Holt had known the Martian one, and they were entirely convinced that a Martian could live easily on Earth's surface without the elaborate pressurization to which he was accustomed. They had no doubt that Earth was inhabited, and inhabited by surface creatures who could move freely around their planet as the Martians had been able to do in former ages before the oxygen in their air was reduced and their water began to disappear. But in general, Martian researchers had held no very high opinion of the intelligence of earthlings. Nothing they could see on the surface had betrayed traces of intelligent creatures. There were mountains, zones of snow which melted in spring, vegetation which bloomed when the snows melted, but there were also vast deserts, even near huge supplies of water, which never changed. To the Martians, for whom water was the most priceless of all natural gifts, a planet rich in moisture could not be inhabited by creatures of intelligence if deserts were allowed to exist year in and year out. Holt was but little edified by the poor reputation of his fellow earthlings and with a trace of asperity changed the subject by asking Ores just how an impending visit by a deputation of such ignorant creatures became known in Allah not forgetting to mention his own surprise when the Martian in the southern pumping station played him the record of the radio conversation with Knight. Ores informed him that intercepted radio messages had in fact been the first intimations of the Earthlings' nearness. Holt concluded that this must have taken place as early as the final adaptation maneuver. The Martians had caught no more mysterious messages for the following two days and the rumors that radio messages had been received from space thereupon sank beneath the waves of public ridicule.
Subsequently, however, the Great Observatory of Nibelo on the Giga's Canal had reported ten fast-moving stars in an orderly row which slid into the early dawn against the background of the fixed stars. When the observatory computed their orbits, it was realized that the luminous objects were quite small and were circling the planet along an orbital path, their luminosity stemming from their reflection of solar rays against the dark background of the twilight heavens. Other observatories confirmed Nibelow's conclusions the following day. According to Ores, suspicion that the novel phenomenon might resolve itself into spaceships was strengthened by their orbital path being in the plane of the ecliptic, and it was generally assumed that they must come from Earth. Then directional radio receiving antennae had been bracketed upon the mysterious objects. This immediately and entirely confirmed the source of the radio emanations as intercommunication between the stranger spaceships. The flight path of the landing boat had been followed quite accurately by the same method and the outlying South Polar pumping stations had been advised of the impending visitation. Holt inquired whether they had nurtured any suspicions that the visitors might have hostile intentions. At this the old man smiled tolerantly. I hope you'll forgive us if we doubted the intelligence of earthlings until we came together with you. But we really never thought you could be stupid enough to attack a whole planet with a handful of men. This sally brought good-humored laughter from all the listeners, including Holt himself, who felt that this might be an appropriate moment to put out feelers as to any Martian urges to visit the Earth. Ores immediately penetrated the meaning of the delicately put question. You may set your mind at rest on that subject, said he. We Martians have no desire to storm the heavens. Troglodytic as we have become through the centuries, we seldom indulge in stargazing, either actually or spiritually. Nevertheless, you are a religious folk in whom heaven has kindled a powerful light. Our Martian God does not live in heaven. His abode is in the hearts of our more worthy people but I regret to say that he leads a sorrowful existence in the minds of the majority, for the god of the Martians is old and weary. Holt tried once more. But your whole planet abounds with creative power, said he, and the people seem to rejoice greatly in each technical achievement as it comes to fruition. It would seem to me that your adventurers might well be tempted by a neighboring star which might, in many ways, offer greatly improved living conditions. Adventurers are an infrequent manifestation of the culture of Mars, answered Ores in a tone of regretful resignation. During the short time you and your friends have been here, I know that you have been deeply impressed by many of the superficial things. When you have observed our people for some time, you will realize that an age weary. Languid satiated culture lies hidden behind all the mechanical refinements with which our technicians have overwhelmed us. Not long ago, it was my privilege to hear you describe how few earthling pioneer races extended civilization over your planet only a few centuries ago, and then, consumed from within by the ardor of their mission, prepared the way for new races. Tens of thousands of years ago, the same development took place here also. Here, too, there were battles and wars until there arose a planetary government. Then came the long flowering of a beautiful culture. Standards of living rose higher and higher, despite the increasing depredations of global drought and erosion. Fine arts progressed to unthought of perfection. Production of consumer goods on a vast scale well nigh leveled the difference between rich and poor. But the extirpation of contrasts and of the asperities of life decreased those tensions which theretofore had supported the ebullience of our inner drives. Now our planet is the home of a peace-seeking and easeful race, reposing upon the deeds of their ancestors. Everything is well organized, too well, indeed, to breed adventurous thoughts or actions. Ores fell silent for a space. Then he added contemplatively. Perhaps the arrival of you young heroes may shake our languid minds awake one more. Perhaps. So you believe that this spiritual lassitude was caused by the necessities of life being satisfied in too great a measure by the perfection of the means of production? inquired Hubbard. 
On our own earth we are now attempting to fight poverty along identical lines. And hitherto we've held to the belief that when dire need is banished, mankind will be able to turn to higher and nobler things than the fight for bare existence. Natural laws are inexorable, returned or raise. You earthlings too will enter a period of wonderful cultural development, once the political unification of your planets is complete, and I envy you. But you will also have to pay the piper. It is impossible to satisfy the demands of the millions unless you adopt methods of production which produce identical goods likewise by the million, and true mass production means not only the standardizing of the goods produced, but also the standardization of requirements and tastes. As an example, the identical dishes we ate this evening were eaten at the same time by millions of others here in Allah, and identical tablecloths lie upon millions of identical tables. Even the shoes my daughter wears. Father, you know Eve cut my initials in the heels. Objected the young woman. Ores smiled bitterly. You've just seen a very tiny example of what represents our greatest tragedy. It presses upon us all like a horrible nightmare, and those of us who have any feeling are fighting tooth and nail against an ever increasing, grey uniformity which besets our lives. That uniformity is, I fear, too powerful ever to be overcome. Throughout thousands of years our people battled for personal freedom. Usurper after usurper who attempted to suppress freedom in the name of his own conceit was overthrown, and a free political system was established which covered the entire planet and has provided an unheard of degree of stability for more than 5000 years. Our technicians liberated us from bodily need. That's right. But their methods, the horrible uniformity with which they invest everything, has literally scorched our souls. The old man choked in his excitement. My son Imo, there, is a physician. Moura, my eldest daughter is a teacher. Our hospitals are no more than anatomical repair shops and the schools simply pack mines as mechanically as machinery fills and seals food cans. You will have to see them to understand what I mean. Chapter 26 all hands ashore on Mars Wolf and Hempstead set about their task of preparing the landing strip for the boats from the Goddard and Ziolkowski within a few days of the termination of the welcoming festivities. With Gudunek's able linguistic assistance, they agreed with the Martian authorities upon a location exactly on the equator and just north of the great vegetated Aurora Sinus. The crews of the spaceships which still circled in their orbits had been kept informed of all the exciting events on the red planet below them and were eager to escape the narrow confines of their inflated nasals, and experience for themselves the wonders of the fairy, subterranean existence of which they had heard so much. The sight of the landing strip had the advantage of lying only 1,600 miles from Allah, and was distant but 430 miles from Sigali a large city hidden beneath the verdant carpet of Orosinus. Wolf and Hempstead shipped the panther to Sigali by underground freight and drove her around the region in the company of several Martian employees of the Ministry of Irrigation. Near the Jamina Canal, and just west of it, where it connects Orosinus with Lucas Nilicus, they found an open plateau with satisfactory ground consistency where they proposed to lay out the landing strip. The Martian irrigation authorities provided earth-moving machinery with which the work was accomplished within a very few days. One of the aspects of life in Mars which had astounded Holt was the relative unimportance of aviation, despite the tremendous progressiveness of the highly technological civilization. It was not that aviation was unknown or unpractised on Mars for the museums were full of all sorts of highly developed transport aircraft which once had been in extensive use. Subterranean existence and the increasing perfection of the bullet fast underground transportation system had banned the aircraft as obsolete and no longer adapted to modern transit problems. It was occasionally used to observe the waters of the polar melts and for surveying, but almost all remaining aircraft were helicopters, requiring no landing strips. Hence, there were none available for the high landing speeds of the eagerly awaited boats. Zero. In the course of the explorations in search of suitable landing terrain, 
Sam Wolf was able to throw considerable light upon the secret Martian vegetal regions and canals. Nowhere did he discover any signs of farming or plantation. It was simply that a sort of moss proceeded to grow anywhere sufficient moisture was provided, and to cover the bare ground with a carpet of varying thickness. The Martians themselves paid not the slightest attention to any utilization of this moss. Sam found himself before an apparent enigma, for it hardly seemed reasonable that the vast and complicated system of irrigation had been engineered and developed merely to further the growth of unharvested moss over enormous areas. The thousands of miles of canals were also covered with moss, and Sam Wolf kept expecting that he would discover plantations from which the Martian would derive vegetable nourishment. Slowly there awoke in him a realization that there must be some other solution to the riddle than could be suggested to him by his earth trained mentality. In Allah, he had become aware of the great synthetic food manufactories which shot appetizing, torpedo like meals into the swellings. The could of course, be no farm industry. Highly developed chemicals satisfied the Martian hunger just as synthetic fertilizers nourished plant life on earth. But any industry calls for a certain amount of raw material, of which the most elemental is water, and water on Mars came only from the poles. Thence it was pumped during the vernal melts. How did the water return to the polar regions? Of course, Snow fell there during the winters, but whence came the snow? Nowhere but from the atmosphere's moisture, and how could the atmosphere gather moisture, if industry and the cities consumed all the water pumped to them? Nothing is lost in nature even when she is abused after the manner of modern chemistry, therefore, what once was water must again become water. It was quite plain that the subterranean cities must drain away the same amount as was pumped to them. If this were not so, they would drown in their hermetic capsules. Sam Wolf discovered that the city sewage was distributed to an extensive net of porous tubes which ran slightly below the surface in the vicinity of the population centers. Thus the liquid soaked the ground and caused the moss to sprout. Millions of tiny roots absorbed it, through which it rose above the surface as sap and returned to the air sucking greedily at the stems and leaflets of the plants. By the grace of autumnal winds, the moisture returned to the poles, where it again began its cycle. This insignificant moss played an important role in the life of the whole planet. Wolf was also able to explain why the green of the vegetal areas wilted in winter, although the urban water consumption did not vary the year around, the flow being constant into the drains. The ground froze solid during the winter season and thus was unable to absorb. The cities accordingly stored their sewage and waste to water in enormous sumps from which it was pumped when the warmth of springtime softened the ground once more. Then the life-giving moss awakened again. The verdure covering the canals was explained in the same way, for the underground waterways could be pumped full only when the heat of spring or summer melted the polar snows. During such times, the huge pumping stations delivered water sufficient for the entire year to cities and industries, where it was stored against the future, as the waste water dot in view of the vast, straight line distances, the Martians had forborne to install piping and had simply dug series of parallel ditches with enormous earth movers. The ditches were covered over to prevent undue evaporation losses, and between them the moss tended to grow whenever they were full. This was in spring when the pumping began, and the moss withered away when it ceased in the autumn. Wolf's research into the Martian water circulation did not impede the work of preparing the landing strip, and Holt radioed Goddard to launch her landing boat. An hour before it was due, the entire Earthling landing party stationed itself at the end of the runway. The three caterpillars, from which Hempstead had tactfully removed the ordnance, were manned by drivers and radio men while a pressurized, transparent Martian vehicle loaded with journalists and television newsmen stood by to immortalize the epic-making landing of an interplanetary space vessel. The usually imperturbable Holt showed signs of nervousness, for the success or failure of his expedition was at stake in the landings of the two boats. He suffered at the thought of being only a spectator at this decisive moment, and longed to be in the co-pilot's seat of Nordensk Scholz's craft. 
where he might perform a bit of discreet backseat driving. It distressed him to know that his men were in danger that he could not share. As they scanned the northwesterly sky through field glasses, a signal flare drifted down out of the somber, crystal blue. Soon they could see the wide sweep of the raked pinions centered by the pod like hull. The great wings swept across them at 6,000 feet, made two descending spirals and a wide, left turn into the approach leg. Holt saw the two landing wheels drop into place before the start of the turn hid them under the wings. An agitated voice came out of his helmet receiver. Colonel Holt, this is Brooks in Panther. Reporting Mayday from Goddard. Lieutenant Nordenskjold reports nose wheel stuck. Minor fire in propulsion compartment caused a short circuit. Over. Damnation. Holt exploded into his microphone. Clear away the caterpillar fire equipment, Nordenskjold will have to work it out for himself. Transmit to me any further reports. Over. I had a hunch something would happen, he growled to himself. He could see the absence of the nose wheel between the extended main wheels as the boat leveled off. Full stall landing will be made. Over, now came through his receiver. That's the only thing he can do, said Holt, more to himself than to the radio man. Hope the tanks don't burst and the ship doesn't catch fire. With the nose high in the air, the wheels touched the landing strip. Holt crossed his fingers as well as he could in his clumsy gauntlets. The heavy boat rolled a hundred yards or more with the nose still high and a cloud of dust rising from the short, cruciform empennage, where the emergency tail skid was tearing up the ground and tossing pebbles and sparks into the air. Slowly the nose dropped as the speed diminished until, in a cloud of dust and with a grinding of metal, the craft came to rest directly in front of the waiting group without sending up any fatal plume of fire. Holt rushed to the stern, pale and trembling. Sure enough, the emergency skid had torn off. The diagonal cross of the stabilizing fins, which were so essential for the eventual relaunching, had been ground down to half their span by contact with the landing strip. The whole stern appeared to have suffered and the skin was torn away in places through which protruded bent and broken struts. A repair job of the first magnitude would give John Wigan a chance really to demonstrate his skill, and Holt experienced a moment of satisfaction in the knowledge that the invaluable John would rejoice in his visit to Mars, instead of remaining in the circling orbit as originally intended. The door of the boat opened and the inflated, Helmeted figures filed out upon the inclining wing and leapt down. Sorry about that, said Nordenskjold as Holt held out his hand. It might have been far worse, answered Holt, and it's mighty good to have you here. You did your part splendidly. Twenty-four hours later, Ziolkowski's boat descended from the orbit, and in the hands of the experienced Haynes landed as though on the home field of United Spacecraft. John Wigand was with him, somewhat sketchily equipped with a toothbrush for the coming year on Mars. This lack of impedimenta did not disturb him, and he immediately crawled under the Goddard boat for an inspection. It shouldn't be too much of a job, if we can remove the stern from Oberth's boat and replace this damaged one, said he. Do you think we can get that done? Chapter 27 body repair and brain filling stations after the landings of Goddard's and Ziolkowski's boats and when the various scientists were well started on their tasks of discovery, Holt and Hubbard decided to take advantage of Ores's invitation to visit a Martian hospital. Dr. Barrett had arrived and, with Wolf and Billingsley, they made their way to the surgery clinic headed by Ores's son. Imo. Ores's lamentations concerning the seedy side of their civilization had made a profound impression on his hearers, and Dr. Barrett was consumed with curiosity as to medical and surgical procedures on the Red Planet. Notwithstanding his devotion to space medicine, he had retained a high degree of surgical skill and a good familiarity with internal medicine. The group of Earthlings was greeted at the entrance to their municipal hospital where the clinic was located by the youthful swore the Imo, who promptly led them down a wide corridor behind whose transparent walls was displayed a grim collection of human organs preserved in glass containers. Livers, hearts, lungs, eyes, legs, 
hands and feet were stored in nutritive fluids or kept in states of activity by complicated glass pumping devices. Here you see our stockpile, commented Imo. All these organs are willed to us by people who have died and who, in their lifetime, declared their willingness to devote any still usable parts of their bodies to the healing of the sick. You may be interested to know that it is socially good form so to specify in one's testament. When such a person dies, we immediately remove surgically those organs for which there is the greatest demand. They are then made sterile and preserved against future use in the machines you see before you, under conditions which permit us to keep the organs usable for a considerable time. How horrible! whispered Holt to Dr. Barrett. Hyper civilized cannibalism disguised as brotherly love and humanitarianism. Dr. Barrett chewed somewhat dubiously at his ragged mustache. I'm not so sure, said he. Our own medical science seems to be headed in the same direction. If blood banks, and eye banks, and bone and skin grafts are acceptable, why shouldn't a heart for which the owner has no more use, or an arm or leg fall into the same category? Imo ushered them into an elevator which descended to a circular gallery whence they could look down into a bright operating theater. On the table lay a patient completely enveloped in what seemed to be a white, celluloid skin. He was conversing freely with the masked surgeons and assistants through his transparent head enclosure. Ultraviolet lamps for sterilizing the air shone from the ceiling. Imo began to describe the operation. This patient is a musician and yesterday his arm was crashed in an accident. Fortunately for him, his accident coincided with the death of a noted violinist, so that his new arm will require little, if any training when he returns to practice his profession. It might even happen that his skill will improve measurable. As Imo continued with his gruesome lecture, the crashed arm was removed and placed in a dish. One of the surgeons removed the new arm from its preservative solution and held it closed to the socket, while another began connecting up the various nerves, muscles, sinews and blood vessels. For greater convenience, these were identified by small, colored tags, like the wiring of a switchboard. Finally the ball was fitted into the socket and the wound closed. During the whole process, the patient lay with open and interested eyes, conversing loquaciously with the operators. Getting a tire changed on my car seems more of a job than that, commented Wolf. In the next operating theater, an eye was being removed from a woman. This lady has been getting very myopic, and we once replaced her cornea, but this failed to effect a permanent cure. Not long ago, we received an eye which would fit her, and she decided on an exchange. Eye operations are among our more difficult surgical problems. Shall we move on to physiotherapy? In a long, half dark room, patients lay on elongated apparatuses and watched a television show on the ceiling. Peculiar arrangements of levers and wheels moved legs, fingers, or arms to and fro. Most of these people have received new members or had serious operations, explained Imo. We apply local anesthetic to the joint or affected part and then use mechanical movement to restore suppleness. The movements are initially slow and small, to be increased in size and speed after a few days. Gosh, it's like running in a car. Whispered Wolf. Not over 40 for the first 500 miles, then increase speed gradually. They left the half-lit room and Holt questioned the young surgeon. I saw some hearts on glass pumps in your stock room. Can you really exchange a heart without losing the patient? I see at what you're driving, was the answer. My father's remark about God living in the hearts of the few good Martians and suffering in the minds of the others. Perhaps the old gentleman is right. But you might as well know that medically the heart is neither more nor less than a pump with a particular aspiration pressure, and an optimum delivery pressure. It delivers per second an accurately defined quantity of a reddish liquid called blood. Of course we exchange hearts. First we shunt a sterile electric pump into the blood circuit and dam off the old heart, next we excise it and connect and insert the new one. Finally we set the new heart in motion by mechanical massage, and after it takes up the load, we shut off and remove the electric pump. 
No patient has ever asked us what happens to his God during an operation. Holt was having difficulty concealing his distaste and explained to Imo that other business called him urgently. When they got outside, he addressed Billingsley. I'm beginning to understand what old Ori's meant. It seems impossible that men who pretend to serve a science should be capable of such sacrilegious cynicism. Minus zero, a few days later they paid a visit to Imo's sister Moira at her school and heard a description of the Martian educational system. Martian children entered school at the age of three, which was approximately equivalent to six on Earth. The first two years were devoted to reading, writing and arithmetic, together with a broad, illustrative coverage of the physical aspects of Martian civilization. Then the curriculum became more specialized. It included mathematics, physics, engineering and electrotechnics, not to mention chemistry, sociology and jurisprudence. There was also a short course in the history of Martian development and civilization. When the children attained their eighth year, there came a most confusing elaboration of the educational field. Metallurgy, food chemistry, atomic physics, transportation, communications, pressurizing and air conditioning, domestic economy, domestic troubleshooting, automatic registration and management, anatomy, medicinal properties social hygiene, labor jurisprudence, vitamin studies, hydraulic installation, water rights, and ten or more other subjects, including the study of tunnel building, as abstruse as it might be to the average citizen, were thrown at the young students. The curriculum was designed to familiarize them with the inordinate complications of their future life and simultaneously to impress them with their responsibilities as vital, if undistinguished. Cogs in the mighty machine. At the age of 12, both boys and girls entered universities or technical schools to prepare for their actual professional or business activities. Moura explained proudly that for many generations, sex equality had been the foremost law and tenet of the Martian social order. Under her guidance, the visitors then entered a classroom where six-year-olds were studying chemistry. The instructor was brushing through his subject at a terrifying rate. Within 30 minutes he covered the periodic system of elements and the secret of electrical adhesion which binds atoms into molecules in chemical combinations. Lightly, he tapped the subject of natural radioactivity of heavy atoms and included some remarks on the variety of behaviors of noble gases in their splendid isolation as compared to such clinging vines as the halogens. On leaving the classroom, Holt spoke to their guide. The speed with which all that involved material was presented to those children is really bewildering, and surely, even if those boys and girls understood it at all, it's out of the question that they should remember it. Oh, answered Moira with a disarming smile, they're not expected to. The children learn no detail matter in school. It's done at home at night. You mean in the evening, as homework? No indeed. I mean at night, when they're asleep. How on Mars can that be? Our entire system of instruction is so arranged that lectures at school merely provide the children with a very general concept of the interrelation of things. In the classroom they are not expected to absorb detail, but only to comprehend indicative viewpoints and general systematics. We can instill detail much more simply in the absence of waking consciousness, when the brain is not distracted by other external stimuli. Here you will see a large collection of phonograph records relating to every professional subject. When they return from school, the children carry home records appropriate to the subjects they have just heard discussed. They fill their record changes and connect the pickup to their pillow receivers. During sleep, the substance of the instructional matter on the records flows into their subconscious and, according to our experience, it is absorbed much more reliably than if we had hammered knowledge into them in the classroom. How can a child get to sleep with a voice chattering from the pillow? inquired Hubbard. The phonograph does not cut in until the encephalograph shows that the child is asleep. That's beyond me, answered Hubbard, with a shake of his head. Let's go to the repose chamber, said Moira, and I'll give you a demonstration. Nearby there was a dimly lighted room containing several couches.
on one of which Moru invited Hubbard to recline. When he had done so, she produced a piece of apparatus like a radio phonograph on small, rubber tired wheels. From a neighboring closet she took a record and placed it on the turntable. How much do you know of the periodic system of elements? asked Moura. No more than I was able to pick up from that high speed lecture we heard just now, and furthermore, my Martian is too limited for me to have understood it all anyway. You shall know much more very shortly, answered Moura confidently. Dipping an absorbent pad into a liquid which smelled like acetone, she wiped several spots on Hubbard's scalp and then placed a number of shining metal discs on the spots, retaining them with an adhesive. Each disc was connected to the apparatus by a thin wire. Dot. Then she pushed a button on the machine and a monotone buzzing reached Hubbard's ears from the pillow where his head reclined. Soon you'll go to sleep, said Moura. These discs are sensitive to the waves of your brain and conduct them to the amplifier. Can you hear a loud ticking in this receiver? That is the high frequency of your waking consciousness. As soon as you fall asleep, Slow oscillations will indicate that your conscious mind is submerged, and when the amplifier registers this, your lesson in chemistry will begin. Five minutes of listening to the monotone sound coming from the pillow put Hubbard into a sound sleep. The amplifier ticked slower and slower. Then there was the click of a switch and the phonograph began to revolve. An insistently persuasive voice whispered from the pillow, the first nine elements of the periodic system. Hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. Hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium. Hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium. Boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. Boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. For several minutes the insistent list was repeated. Then Moura shut off the machine and wakened Hubbard. Well Glenn, can you tell us the first nine elements of the periodic system now? Laughed Holt. Hubbard sat up with a yawn and then repeated his lesson mechanically in Martian just as he had received it from the phonograph record. Hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. If I only knew what the devil it all means in English. At this, Gudunek, who had been standing skeptically in the background, exploded joyously. What a wonderful thing for my Martian language teaching! Holt shook his head dubiously. What was it that Ores had said? Canned knowledge? It was an excellent tag for this horrible intervention of technology in the sacred mysteries of the human mind. When I was a small boy, he said, I used to sleep with my Latin primer under the pillow because I couldn't remember the words. How many thousands of hours I put into learning mechanical things, and how difficult it was. It doesn't seem possible that it can be so simple. I say, Dr. Barrett, remarked Billingsley, doesn't this jolly well explain why our Martian friends all have outsized heads? Surely if continued overeating puts a fine round belly on a man, this stuffing the brain with wisdom must enlarge the good, old cranium if it's not to burst you know. Chapter 28, The Machinery of a Super Civilization As Holt and his little band penetrated further and further into the details of Martian civilization and culture, the 449 days of waiting time which they originally contemplated with considerable dread began to fly like the wind. Rather did they fear that the apposition necessary for the start of the return journey to Earth would take place long before they could thoroughly examine and record all the surprises offered by the extreme ingenuity of these members of an overripe civilization. Among these surprises were great atomic power plants whose millions of horsepower kept the bloodstream of the huge unified technical organism in circulation. Almost equally impressive was the chemical industry of Mars and the manner in which it was able to integrate the scarce but vital planetary store of water, oxygen and ore in such manner that its cycle sustained the inhabitants' general welfare. The chemical industry was faced with three major problems, air conditioning and pressurization of the subterranean cities and installations, feeding the hundreds of millions of people 
producing enough steel to extend the underground structures and to provide for consumer goods. To fulfill these functions, around which gravitated a whole series of other industrial activities, the managing mentalities were faced with almost entirely exhausted natural coal deposits, which had been ruthlessly exploited by earlier generations of Martians, much as earthlings presently exploit their coal mines, very limited water supplies, which were required to be pumped from the polar regions during springtime, a good supply of electrical energy, generated by atomic power, finally. An inexhaustible supply of relatively low concentration iron oxide adulterated by various minerals in the ferrous soil of the deserts. The Martian chemists had gone about their work in the most admirable fashion, attacking the triple problem with a model degree of integration. They electrolyzed a certain proportion of the water as it arrived from the polar regions by passing powerful electric currents through it and thus disassociating it into hydrogen and oxygen. The oxygen was piped to the air conditioning and pressurizing plants and there was used to regenerate the air of respiration, a continuous process. The hydrogen was used in the steelworks, where it was passed over beds of incandescent iron oxide, combining with the oxygen in them. This converted the ferrous oxides into metallic iron, to be worked into structural and other steels by ensuing processes of varying sorts. Simultaneously. The hydrogen burned to water vapor by taking up the oxygen from the ferrous oxide, and the water produced by condensing the vapor returned to the cycle. In the air conditioning and regenerating plants, only half of their function was completed by the addition of oxygen to the air of respiration, for the carbon dioxide produced by breathing had to be eliminated to an equivalent extent. This was done in the same manner as in hold space vessels where the exhaust air was pumped into pressure air washers and sprayed with water. Under the high pressure of these sprayers, the carbon dioxide was absorbed into the water droplets, thus separating itself from such air constituents as were insoluble in water. The carbonized water was expelled from the bottoms of the pressure washers and then, when depressurized, it rendered up its carbon dioxide in bubbles. The latter was then piped to food manufacturers. Martian food manufacture was one of the more extraordinary chemical miracles, although it was more biochemical than chemical, in the strict terrestrial sense of the word. Here the mystery of natural vegetable growth was duplicated by artificial means in retorts. The biochemical establishments made practical use of that marvelous process which manifests itself in the growth of every plant and which earthly scientists in their inability fully to explain it, have called photosynthesis, an empty and non-significant title. Photosynthesis is the word designating the ability of plants to produce fat, sugar and protein for their nourishment from carbon dioxide, water and a few chemicals which they ordinarily extract from the ground, and they do this by the mere presence of light. The Martians in their food factories utilized the simplest form of vegetable growth known in nature namely microscopic algae. The water supplied to the factories was first heat sterilized in order to destroy alien and undesired germs. Then it was inoculated with a relatively small amount of algae and was enriched by the necessary nutritive materials, in the main, carbon dioxide, magnesium, nitrogen and phosphorus. Water thus prepared was passed slowly under batteries of powerful artificial lights within glass tubes which allowed the ultraviolet rays to pass freely. The algae grew both in size and numbers by the mysterious process of photosynthesis, forming, in accordance with the modifications of the process by minor supplementary chemical additives, primarily fats, sugars or proteins. When the light had taken effect and the water flowed out of the transparent piping, the augmented algae growth was centrifuged from the water and taken to extraction presses where the useful products were recovered and sent on to refineries to become food for the Martians. Electricity was the mainstay of the hyper refined Martian technological setup. Only by electricity was it possible to replace the complicated interplay between plant and animal life the atmospheric processes and the farms and industrial production which on earth permitted civilized life to be maintained and improved. It was, therefore, 
quite natural that electricity had attained an almost mythical quality on Mars, for it not only helped transmute the waste products of the lungs into rich and tasty foodstuffs and permitted air of respiration and structural steel to be manufactured from desert dust and polar snow. It kept the infinitely involved gearing of the entire civilization in rotation. Hundreds of horsepower were invisibly at work for every Martian, day and night, and to them alone Martians owed the high state of their material welfare, which were, in effect, the air they breathed, the food they ate, and the clothes they wore. Electricity bore the voice and image of distant friends into homes whenever people might wish. By that horsepower people were born to any point of the red globe within the space of a few hours. It kept in motion the huge productive machine whereby they were able to earn in a short four hours daily their portions of whatever joys material accomplishment could offer. Such conditions naturally brought in their train the establishment of energy as a standard of monetary value. Since nearly all production was almost fully automatic, the number of kilowatts used in manufacturing any sort of goods became the determining factor of their price and valuation. More energy per person meant more riches for everyone. Thus, on Mars, kilowatt hours took the place of Earth's gold standard of values. Each time a new generating station was built, the amount of money in circulation increased, but no danger of inflation was incurred by this continual increase in the currency. Industries operated by the new source of power increased in productivity in the same measure as did the currency in circulation, thus maintaining a well-proportioned balance between the values of goods and money. Zero, in bygone days, improvement of the general welfare and increase in productivity, together with medical and surgical advances, had combined to induce a marked rise in the population exactly as had taken place on Earth since the dawn of the industrial and technical age. For an extended period, the population grew faster than did the housing facilities and industrial production. During this time, decreased infant mortality in combination with greater general longevity prevented the Martians from benefiting from the increasing productivity of their industries. At one time the authorities were even obliged to impose taxes on children, for the rapid increase in population threatened to outrun the available respiration air, food and housing. Such a tax, brutal as it was, offered the only means of limiting the population below the danger point. Later, the pendulum swung back again, and in a most interesting manner. Industry had, by reason of sharp competition, tended to eliminate the human element in production and to utilize automatic machines as much as possible, with resultant savings. This development brought with it an increasing degree of standardization with the consequent dullness of uniformity about which RAs complained so bitterly. Nonetheless, it elevated human labor more and more into the regions of creativeness and utilized man's spirit rather than his muscles. Throughout the lifetime of several generations, man's liberation from bodily labor remained a pyrrhic victory of very doubtful value, for the proud and experienced craftsman was replaced by a miserable machine watcher, who saw to it that the automatics did not stop, with a box of uninspiring index cards before him. But this unhappy stage was eventually overcome by the development of self-activating methods of registration. An electronic equivalent to the punched card method of Earth, these methods gradually dammed the flood of paper. Phonetic notation of the Martian language was introduced, thus allowing the typewriter to die a natural death and to liberate an army of unhappy girls. A dictating machine replaced it and transcribed the text directly from the spoken word. When all this had happened, the last and lowest Martian became free of the major portion of any physical burden, and could devote himself to work of a creative nature, no matter what his profession or trade might be. The pendulum of increasing population reversed itself. Every Martian who desired to earn his living in such a complicated scientific and technical world by creative contribution was faced with enormous demands on his professional knowledge by reason of the high scientific level of all professions. The breadth of knowledge to be transmitted to the youth by schools and colleges was beyond conception, and as this breadth increased, so did the costs of education. The average age expectancy of a Martian man or woman was some 50 Martian years, 
or about 94 terrestrial years. It was not possible for the universities to graduate their students, fit to live their way of life, a day younger than 15 to 18 Martian years, despite their specialized methods of instruction. Thus the young folk were financially dependent upon their parents up to that age, in addition to the costs of their education. Marriage prior to graduation was out of the question for all but a fortunate few. Having babies had become an expensive luxury, even without considering the underhanded tax situation. Not unnaturally, the danger of overpopulation died a warning. It had been created by technical civilizations advent and was strangled by its growth. Ala and the neighboring city of Sujili were bitter rivals in athletics, and athletics played a vastly important role in the life of the Martians. Sport in general was not merely a safety valve for the ebulliency of youth as it is on Earth, where the exuberance of youthful spirits is offered an outlet, yet held in check by carefully thought out rules and limitations. Rather, was sport on Mars an elemental rebelling against the slavery of the troglodytic existence which bound the natural instincts and physical energies of the young of both sexes, and deprived them of contact with nature and of the beauties of life in the open? It was also a revolt of their bodies against the danger with which mental overdevelopment threatened them. It was a broad revulsion against the push-button civilization where physical labor had been turned over to machines and electrical gadgets. Martian athletics were also a forum where the combative instincts of the younger Martians could find vent in constructive rather than destructive activity, now that the former warlike eras lay far in the past. Finally, they had become a favorite mode of indulging the long leisure granted the Martians by the four-hour workday. Holt and a group of his companions sat in the stadium of Arlo under a huge dome of glass which maintained the artificial atmospheric pressure, the life of the planet. The arena was oval and surrounded by four rows of seats after the fashion of a Greek amphitheater. Natural sunlight irradiated the festive scene through the vast dome. As the last day of the competition was reserved for the decathlon between the young men of Sigali and Arla, Holt had felt that he could not miss the important event. The brown bodies of the Martian youths were almost naked. Sinuous and beautifully knit, they went through the events of running, jumping, swimming, discus throwing, shot putting, and other sports with a grace and ease beyond all praise. The high and distance jumps positively astounded the earthling visitors, despite their familiarity with the weakness of the Martian field of gravity. As they scrutinized the gay festivities, the observers from Earth could not but be reminded of the spirit of the ancient Greek Olympiads, for no individual victory in running or jumping counted here, it was the development of the entire body which was sought. No misshapen wrestlers or biceps bulging weight lifters were to be seen. Any distortion of the human form by over-specialization was carefully avoided. The decathlon was an ideal means for producing true bodily perfection and balance, for it demanded an extensive proficiency of the body along a wide variety of exercises, and simultaneously evolved the aesthetic satisfaction which a broadly trained body offers to the eye. In the Martian decathlon, the ultimate object was not so much the highest record as it was to bring forth the most versatile and perfect, the Kalos, as the Greeks had it. Despite the emphasis on beauty and bodily perfection, there was no lack of strenuous effort in the competition between the males. The final event, a sort of marathon lasting a half hour, brought most of them to the verge of exhaustion. The winner received an ovation which re-echoed from the glass dome above when he stepped to the front to receive the prize of a purple neck chain. The enthusiasm of the spectators was no more for the wonderful performance which he had put up than for the harmonious physique which his long training had developed. As a finale, there were ball games and gymnastics for girls, for whom beauty and grace also were prime objectives. The earthlings marveled at the enthusiasm with which the maidens engaged in the various exercises and the pride with which they display their charms. There was none of the languor which so often tinges an earthly stage show with the obscene. On the other hand, there was none of the prudery which ugliness so often drapes around itself as a form of moral cloak. The whole festivity was an unforgettable tribute to the living strength and will to beauty of the healthy youth.
offering to a nature banished by technology the honor and veneration which was her due. Chapter 29 The expedition bears fruit Douglas McRae and Howard Ross were the zoologist and botanist of the Mars expedition. Great indeed was their disappointment when Holt's first radio reports from the surface to the circling vessels indicated that, to his eye at least, there was but little plant or animal life on Mars. Holt had flirted with the idea of directing both McRae and Ross to remain in the space vessels and to continue to circle in the orbit in order to devote the lifting capacity of the landing boats on takeoff to objects of greater importance to earthlings than the reports and specimens of a zoologist and botanist. It seemed that such reports would consist of the solemn conclusion that Martian fauna was limited to a few species of ants and worms, while flora consisted of a limited variety of mosses. Holt's point of view changed when he was introduced to the elaborate Martian underground gardens, bathed in a combination of filtered natural and artificial light. Parks produced a luxuriant growth of trees, shrubs and flowers beneath the sun rays that penetrated the enormous glass domes above them. When he had spent some time browsing in the Natural History Museum of Arla, he revoked his intention of keeping McRae and Ross circling in space and radioed them to descend in the Goddard's boat. Arla's Natural History Museum, like many others in various cities, contained inexhaustible treasure troves for seekers of answers to developmental questions. How? For example, had Mars come to present the picture of today? How may the red planet have appeared thousands or millions of years ago? What had become of the oceans and mountains which once must have existed? How long had it taken for the atmosphere to dissipate to a point where the Martians fled to a subterranean, pressurized existence? When and why did higher forms of animal life die out? What had such forms actually been? How did the Martians breed the marvelous plants of their subterranean world? Sam Wolf had haunted the museum from the moment that he was free of his duties as airport engineer, and he found so rich the collections and specimens that he was able to dispense with the geological equipment he had brought to the orbit. He promptly abandoned any thought of digging for specimens himself and devoted his time to studying the exhibits in the museum. Here, the Martians had correlated all he desired to know in the most extensive manner, while the curators were always at his beck and call to explain anything he might not fully understand. Hans Bergman was another scientist to benefit from the Martian punch on for thoroughly documenting and recording the astronomical phase of the development of their planet. Bergman enjoyed the astronomical bliss of seeing the history of a planet pass in review in full scale photography, and it was his planet to which he had devoted his professional life. He found the complete answers to his years of patient, tireless research, passing the planet's red rays through the torture of the spectroscope. Now he had no need to correlate one vague theory with another equally vague in order to make his observations agree with one another. Mars life story lay before him, an open book. He could even compare it with that of Earth and thereby set up a series of generalizations for basic laws which must underlie the developments of all planets. Thus the Earthling scientists abandoned the primitive research equipment with which they had hoped to solve the mystery of the Red Planet's life and history. They were able to benefit by the efforts of generations of Martian scientists as collection after collection, specimen after specimen was presented to their eager eyes. The expedition's scientists had been a glum lot when the first message from Mars surface reached them in their orbit, but their gloom rapidly dissipated when they plunged into the stimulating flow of revelations of natural science with their Martian confreres. So vast was the treasure of information that it threatened to overwhelm their mental capacity, and they loudly boasted that a mere visit to the Natural History Museum of the City of Arla would alone more than justify in the minds of Earthling taxpayers the billions of dollars expended on Operation Mars.0. The unfortunate Tom Knight continued to command and maintain as best he could the interplanetary vessels as they circled the Red Planet. The tedium of his faithful watch was relieved by the daily reports radioed up by Holt for retransmission to Earth. Lassini sent them forth into the ether until they reached the grasping antenna of the high-duty station in the Lunetu orbit. From there they were poured into the ears of the Space Force communicators and to Braden's desk, 
from which eager reporters and radio commentators passed them on to the news-hungry people of Earth. Not long after his arrival, Holt came to the realization that Mars' boiling economy and scientific advancement might well represent an extremely valuable outlet for Earthling trade and the industry behind it, while there could be no doubt that along certain lines an interchange not only of knowledge and culture, but also of material goods, should be envisaged. Using the code designated for confidential matters, Holt asked Braden what his attitude on this subject should officially be. He asked for instructions whether to foment plans for closer interchange of experiences and permanent economic cooperation, if the general idea should seem to appeal to their Martians. Braden's usually prompt response to any message from Holt was long delayed on this subject, for he did not fail to recognize the solar system shaking importance of such a decision. He characteristically felt that it was beyond his province. During a personal interview, he laid it before the newly elected president of Earth. But that worthy official likewise declined to rule on so far-reaching a subject, preferring, as was more than natural, to submit the matter to a session of the United Congress. The quandary in which the president found himself was indeed no light one. To undertake trade relationships with another planet could have unforeseeable consequences. It might open infinitely rich fields of knowledge of incalculable benefit to suffering humanity, but it might also carry the microbe of possible future cosmic conflict. Holt's fateful question was, therefore, tossed into the ravening maw of a special session of the United Congress, which flung it from one tongue to another in impassioned debate. The elder politicians viewed it with alarm and were strongly supported by the lobbies of some of the major industrial concerns, in mortal fear that the comfortable practical monopolies they enjoyed might be threatened by revolutionary methods descending on them like a blight from Mars. Some few of the more progressive and open-minded interests publicly announced that they proposed to organize a joint private expedition in order that various technical advances described in Holt's radio messages might be studied in situ by their own experts. Lobbying flowered as never before and the representatives of both persuasions exerted gigantic efforts to win legislators to their points of view. The debate raged for month after month until the Congress uttered its historic decision that cosmic isolation could be no more successful than terrestrial isolation had proven in the past. If Mars had developed an advanced situation, it would simply be the worst form of retardationism not to enter into full relations with the representatives of this civilization. The approval of the scheme contained very few reservations, carefully masked in some of the minor clauses. In the meantime, Holt became aware that desire for a permanent relationship with Earthlings and their science and industry was anything but one sided. Oasis helps that the young heroes from Earth would shake some of the Martian mentalities out of their lethargic channels of thought seemed to have been granted. A new spirit seemed to pervade them and to blow away the cobwebs from their rigid minds, revealing that there was another and a different world outside the pressure locks of their underground culture. They began to sense that in a free and open world with a free and open sky, Simple human happiness might be more attainable than in their troglodytic existence of gadgets and tawdry ornamentation. Holt telecast to the entire population a series of pictures and explanations of the technical advances of Earth, but the Martian engineers and chemists displayed little more than an extremely patronizing interest. Certainly the great liners plowing the seas were to them an amazing prehistoric manifestation and aroused their admiration as did the skyscrapers of terrestrial cities, although it seemed to them somewhat illogical to build upwards when an underground structure could so easily be expanded indefinitely simply be digging and bracing another stope or tunnel. Their disdain, however, of the primitive mechanical art which still drove wheels by diesel and turbine power was unbounded, and human mining methods seemed to them but little advanced beyond the Neanderthal man's scratching for minerals with a fire-hardened stick. They thought very little of a race which depended for its food upon surface agriculture and the breeding of edible animals. Their final conclusion, reached with many expressions of self-appreciative sympathy, was to the effect that they had little to learn from any fledgling civilization, 
as curious as it might be in its primitive way. Other branches of Martian science adopted a radically different point of view, particularly those who saw in Holt's pictures much of value and interest, although not contributing to any immediate advancement of their planet. For them, Earth was a planet in the first flush of youth, a planet populated by people of natural intelligence who had mobilized all the mighty forces God had given his favorite creatures, men. And those forces varied from the farmer rooted on his land to the spacefarers plumbing the depths of the heavens. On Earth, they might still see the plant and animal life which had long since been extinct upon their own planet. Fossil forms of life in a Martian museum could still be studied as it lived and breathed upon the sister planet. Martians knew that their globe had once rejoiced in mountains, seas, swamps and forests, their natural histories told them so with an abundance of colorful detail. But such phenomena were now as remote from their own days and times as the Pliocene era is to an earthling of the 20th century. If they could study Earth in the flower of her development, well might they discover the source of that monotonous artificiality which was the bane of their own poverty-stricken planet. The mainspring of any true scientist is curiosity, and the Martians were no exceptions. Holt wound that mainspring to its utmost limit and held before them an Olympic torch of truth-seeking from which they caught the fire of enthusiasm. There were many factual discussions with Wolf, McRae, Bergman. Ross and others, and no Martian ever departed without an aroused interest in an exchange of experiences. Societies in support of scientific cooperation with Earth grew like mushrooms. During the most bloody wars on Earth, scientists had always found a common denominator on which they could heartily concur and agree, irrespective of their national loyalties. Theirs was a community of soul in the search for the truth in God's own nature and it was now to extend its unifying bond across the vastnesses of space. Holt was overjoyed when the radio message containing Earth's decision to take up interplanetary relations with Mars reached him in the office he occupied in the Martian government lodgements around the deep, central plaza of Ala. Without delay, he communicated to the president of the Martian Academy his desire to lay before the outstanding men of science of the planet an offer to have three of them accompany the expedition on its return to Earth. These men would be guests of the government of Earth for the duration of their stay and would be returned to the satellitic orbit around Mars at the next suitable apposition between the two planets and to their subterranean civilization by a landing boat carried by a cargo vessel to be built for the purpose. A special session of the Martian Academy of Science was called to select from the huge number of candidates those who should be distinguished by making the voyage. Election to or even a call to speak before. The Academy of Science was the highest honor within the aspiration of any Martian scientist, for the significance of the Academy far exceeded that of a mere association of honorable gray beards distinguished in their chosen fields. The Academy was, in point of fact, a sort of general staff of research, set up with the perfected skill in organization which characterized Martian civilization. It organized and planned all embracing and systematic campaigns against ignorance wherever found. It discovered breaches in the linked chain of knowledge and forged new links. It appointed liaison officers whenever it discovered that some advance in one branch of science might be of importance to another branch. It offered training to any scientist whose position at the forefront of research required that his work be correlated with the general welfare. When some new horizon was discovered in any field of knowledge, the Academy immediately proceeded to evaluate not only its practical application, but also the effects it might have on social, hygienic, psychological, economic or other circumstances. In its studies, the Academy was some 50 or 100 years ahead of the present, and it planned the strategy of research accordingly. Notwithstanding the regimentation and systematization of Martian scientific thought, the Martian Academy was fully aware that basic research must wither and die without freedom. It was the custom of centuries that the Academy should be apportioned some 15% of the public budget for research purposes. Oddly enough, this figure was astoundingly close to that devoted to armament by terrestrial nations before they settled their differences, even in piping times of peace. 
Much of this money went to research institutes and universities without strings as to its disbursement and without an accounting. All that was required of the beneficiaries was that they should report with the minimum of delay to the academy any new discoveries made by them. Ancient custom dictated that the president of the Martian Academy be a teacher of philosophy, the queen of spiritual sciences. The high esteem in which the academy was held was reflected in that its president ranked, together with the senior justice of the Supreme Court, immediately behind the Elan, despite the general lack of social distinctions throughout the planet. Even the cabinet officers occupied the next lower rung of the social ladder. And Santo, the sage of Laroni, was president of the Martian Academy of Science when Holt's epic making proposal was submitted for deliberation. As presiding officer, it was he who introduced the subject in the presence of Holt and the scientific leaders and officers of the expedition. He appealed to the Academy to draw inspiration from the Earthlings' splendid interplanetary pioneering. He adjured them to pursue without hesitancy or vacillation the path of cosmic cooperation thus courageously opened. Life below ground, to which our aging planet has condemned us, said he, has made us forget that another and a greater world lies without the hermetic capsule wherein we perforce must live. Until our earthling friends and brethren came to us through the airless reaches of the solar system, we were in danger of entirely forgetting that there is a heaven wherein God guides the courses of the stars of his creation. We awoke to the joyous discovery that we are not alone in the infinite ocean of the stars. We rejoice that our kindred from across space think, feel, hope and believe as we do. Dotforians we have sought the answer to the final question, the great, hitherto insoluble question of the purpose of the cosmic creation. Why did God make the magnificent machinery of the universe? To this day, our natural scientists have stood perplexed but gripped in the fascination of its endless complexities and bemused by the infinity of its riddles. Our earthling companions have brought us the answer, it is life. Joyful, pulsating life, everlastingly sustained by the two divine urges, love and hunger. We may well still wish to know what is the purpose of this life and to that question, too, they have brought us an answer full and complete, it is the quest of perfection. In this quest, life has evolved from the amoeba to the thinking, sentiment being, following the dictates of the conscience with which God in his own good time endowed it, so that it might seek him and strive for his perfection in the full knowledge that never can it fully be attained. The inspiration of your cosmos shaking journey, my earthling brothers cannot have been that of a purely technical experiment, despite the magnificence of its conception. You have come to us on a mission whose ultimate object was planned by God himself, for it is you who have brought together the germ plasms of rational creation in our solar system that they may thrive and grow into a higher and more noble organism, which shall envelope the depths of space. In no other manner than by the joining of individual cells did the higher forms of life evolve at the beginnings of time. Let no man here, whether earthling or Martian, cried Ansanto prophetically, misapprehend the significance of this mission. Let us follow in the path it so clearly defines for us, and may the generations which shall come after us never deviate. Then, and then only, may we be assured that we have seen God's plans and aims, and that we follow his holy will towards his cosmic ends. Chapter 30 the sage of Laroni The sage of Laroni's speech in no way failed of its effect upon the highly intelligent and basically religious members of the Martian Academy of Science. Three prominent and able men from among their number were appointed to make the voyage which Holt scheduled to begin by a launching of the two landing boats, some two weeks before the expiration of the 449-day long waiting time. He had no intention of allowing any last minute difficulty to prevent him and his men from being snugly ensconced in their spaceships when the crucial hour of departure from the Martian orbit should arrive. To miss that figurative split second by reason of some minor malfunction would mean the loss of the expedition by exhaustion of food and oxygen in the orbit. Nor could refuge be taken on the friendly red planet for the landing boats no longer had the wings necessary for the descent. Dot with the entire expedition gathered in the seven passenger vessels for a solid two weeks prior to the final departure from the orbit, Wigand would have ample time for a thorough inspection of the equipment, 
so that the months of the return trip would be begun with every possible assurance of mechanical perfection. Tom Knight's reports from the orbit showed that there had been no serious damage nor malfunctions in the waiting vessels, for he had been able to carry out all running repairs with the supplies at hand. Holt, however, proposed to run no chances. The damage to Nordenskjold's landing boat caused by the stuck nose wheel had proved once again the importance of keeping everything in apple pie order. Failing this, the whole expedition might be endangered, with incalculable loss not only to Earth, but perhaps to a universe into which man had just taken his first, faltering steps. Most of John Wigan's time on the Red Planet had been devoted to the repair of Goddard's landing boat. With the generous assistance of the Martian authorities, he had dismounted the necessary parts from Oberth's boat in the snowy South Polar region and transported them to the landing strip near Sigilai. Here the damaged craft was staked down alongside her sister ship from Zyolkowski. Wigan even found a small machine shop near Sigilai where he fabricated some of the material needed. As soon as the repairs were completed, Wigan and Hempstead's detachment busied themselves with task of removing the great wings from the landing boats. The next step was to set the huge, torpedo-like hulls erect upon the steel launching tables which had formed part of their cargo. Their sections were bolted together and mounted on the wheels destined for them. Then began the actual process of erection, a by no means simple matter on which Wigand had spent much time before departure from Earth. The tail of the still horizontal boat was first jacked up sufficiently so that the table on its wheels could be pushed under it. Then the wheels of the table were removed and it was lowered to the ground and the stern of the boat was let down upon it. During the procedure, two protrusions on the impenage rested on two bearings of the table forming a sort of hinge around which the boat's hull would rotate when brought from the horizontal to the vertical. The table was then firmly staked to the ground. The next step was to erect upon the top of the still horizontal hull a vertical strut over which passed a steel cable fastened to the nose of the vessel and extending out over the stern where it was attached to one of the caterpillars, standing stern to stern with the still recumbent landing boat. When the caterpillar wound in the cable on its winch, the huge hull began to rise, turning about the hinge joint of the launching table. Another cable from the nose led to a second caterpillar stationed forward of the boat. The second cable was slacked as the first one was wound in, thus avoiding a sudden, jarring adoption of the vertical position after the point of neutral equilibrium had passed as the boat approached the vertical dot. The principle employed in this delicate operation was simple and by no means new. It somewhat resembled the method applied to the erection of telegraph poles. The landing boat hulls, however, were easily damaged, so that a high degree of skill and experience in handling heavy and bulky equipment was essential. With the boats safely in their launching positions and secured against the treacherous Martian windstorms by wire guys, John Wigan applied to them his most rigid inspection technique. A few minor parts were found defective and these he replaced from stock. Ten days before the date of departure, he reported to Holt that both boats were in complete readiness to ascend to the orbit, where Tom Knight awaited the crews and their Martian guests, and where the wingless boat hulls would circle forevermore as man-made satellites of Mars.0. It was the last evening Holt was to pass in the pressurized passages of the Red Planet. He esteemed it a great honor to be the guest of Ansanto, the Sage of Laroni where the Dean of Martian Scientists dwelt in company with many artists, writers and philosophers of the planet. The little town exhibited distinct differences from the larger cities such as Allah and Sigilai, for the liberal attitudes of its inhabitants reflected themselves in vagaries of taste and decoration beyond the scope of more conventional Martians. Laroni lay beneath the verdant moss of Lucas Luns. And Santo was by no means limited to the scientific aspect of his proud position in the academy, and it was as much over the cultural phases of the evening that Holt rejoiced as over the more familiar scientific and technical ones. And Santo's vast historical and philosophical studies had given him a perspective extending over truly cosmic ages of Martian development. When they sat down together after a simple but satisfying meal, and Santo urged Holt to talk about the recent war on Earth, 
for he himself had never experienced such a cataclysm and greatly desired to complete the impressions he had derived from Martian history by a first hand, vivid report. Holt launched into a description of the titanic struggle between the Western and the Eastern powers and told how a unified government had eventually resulted but that the cruelties of the conflict had brought terrestrial mankind so close to the abyss of universal cultural suicide that the damage could hardly be repaired in less than several centuries. He spoke of the desperation of those horrible years and of the misfortunes with which technology had flooded mankind instead of with her highly touted blessings. Nor did he neglect the increasingly frequent and insistent warnings of the many earthling thinkers who proclaimed that technology bore an eternal curse and that naught but a return to a simple bucolic existence of self-determination could preserve humanity from utter self-destruction. And Santo listened silently for a long time until Holt finished. The can, said he, be no turning back for any civilization which has once pinned its faith to the advance of technology. Any such turning back would conjure up such a terrible economic and social crisis as to reduce the civilization itself to rack and ruin. Nor is there any inner justification or lightness whatsoever in turning back. Men is responsible for the dangers and unbalance of technology, not technology itself. During one of your lectures, so greatly appreciated by our students of history, you recounted how all the ancient cultures of earth were based on slavery. You expressed amazement that the great thinkers of those ages found nothing objectionable therein. I, for one, am no whit amazed, for our own earlier cultures were likewise based upon slavery. Every culture is an organism, analogous to a plant unable to flower towards the light if the roots, the source of strength, do not dig into the soil. Subjugation of the forces of nature by technology is the only means offered us by God whereby we may strip off the curse of slavery. By this means only can we create a social system where each and every man may unfurl his capabilities to the breeze of freedom rather than permit a chosen few to blossom and bloom while supported by the weary shoulders of the multitude. Here on our venerable and weary planet we have moved far ahead of your youthful earth towards the manumission of our slaves by technology. The difficulties you are presently encountering have a familiar ring in the ears of Martian historians, for we too have suffered them. But you may be assured that you also will master those difficulties, not, of course, without paying a certain price for the freedom thus achieved. This price in part will consist in the leveling of consumer goods which is followed by a general leveling of tastes, modes, and even of human attitudes. These inevitable concomitants of the technical age affect sensitive souls as does cruel tyranny. It is the luxuriant glory of jungle flowers being transmuted into an orderly garden where each plant is assigned its place in accordance with its size, its color and its form. No longer is it privileged to grow according to its own sweet will. To me, the manumission of humanity is well worth the price. Tell me, my friend, Holt said after a pause what you believe to be the main obstructions to making technology operate for the benefit of mankind rather than to its destruction. And Santo smiled. I will try to formulate it for you. Technology is by nature dynamic, while political order, created by man for orderly social living, is fundamentally static. Continually renewed conflict arises between the static social order, unable as it is to grow with dynamically progressing demands and the technical advances which create the latter. A new invention is capable of changing the basis of many lives to a far greater extent than any novel social or political concept. The explosions which have plagued your planet during the last few decades cannot, in the last analysis, have been caused merely by clashes between opposing political ideologies. The fact is that limited and sovereign states cannot live next to one another on the same planet. Once technology has attained a certain definite advancement, you may be very sure that technology was the real architect of your present government of Earth and that your politicians were only subordinate artisans. As technical developments progress, political conflict becomes increasingly destructive. This is not simply accounted for by the increased effectiveness of the weapons employed, no less important is the inevitable increase of governmental authority and bureaucracy 
which supervenes to direct the complicated social order brought by more mechanization in living. The personal responsibility of political leaders becomes infinite with such advances in mechanization. On a smaller scale, chuckled Holt, I can drive a buggy along a country road with a few drinks too many under my belt, and nobody gets hurt. But if I drive a high-powered car on a highway in the same condition, those drinks may be fatal, not only to me, but to others. I've never seen a motor car, answered Dan Santo, but we still have humor on Mars, even without cars, and your amusing analogy goes to the root of the matter. Ethical progress must keep up with technical progress. But ethics wither and die without self-control and without humility and religion. Do you believe, Holt asked, that increasing scientific insight undermines religion's belief? Back on Earth, I know so many who seem convinced that they know and no longer need believe. Here too, I have encountered not a few of the same turn of mind. And Santo smiled tolerantly. When I was a young student, he remarked, I thought myself very wise indeed. Natural science was my passion, and to some extent it still is. The universe seemed to me to be a relatively simple, if rather large mechanism, whose laws of operation I thought I understood quite well. As our technicians applied identical laws to their own purposes with ever increasing success, I became more and more convinced that it was idle to seek a transcendental director of fate behind the transparent cosmic machinery. To me, there could be no God, except as identified with the laws of nature. As time went on and I matured, I began to realize the blank areas in our picture of the universe. What I had previously seen as a wide expanse of beautifully clear perceptions began to be choked in the underbrush of vague attempts at explaining the unexplainable. Slogans and catchwords covered the thickets which the spirit could not penetrate. The simplest things no longer could withstand critical scrutiny. Consider the concept of infinity, which is no more comprehensible than its opposite, finiteness. What is behind either or both these concepts? Or consider the mutual relationship between matter and energy. We know and can use the formulae, and their potency serves us in our atomic power plants. The inner secret of their mechanisms will, however, remain a sealed book for all eternity. What of the miracle of heredity? By what mysteries does a great grandchild carry some touching trait of his forebear? Are we not deluding ourselves if we pretend to explain such mysteries on a scientific basis? A period of profound depression followed my youthful exuberance over our scientific achievements. The fundamentals of my cosmic beliefs were profoundly shaken. I lost myself amid the distances of the theory of cognition, where I vainly sought to delimit the capacity of our minds to solve these problems. I sought the key to the ultimate revelations in the history of our planet and in the lives of our great men. And it was here that the genius of great thinkers and inspired artists pointed the path out of desperation. For I sought for some law which should direct the hearts of these men. Was there, I asked myself, some equation working in their minds as they advanced beyond the frontiers of knowledge, or created immortal music or paintings? But there was no regularity nothing resembling our so-called laws of nature behind their genius. By no repetitive series of experiments could a mathematical causal relationship be established. Inspiration put into effect the will of God himself through the thoughts and deeds of these men. There could only be one answer, it was God, acting through his creatures. It was a soul-satisfying illumination of my spiritual darkness to find the transcendental deity manifesting himself in the creativeness of the spiritual and artistic great. My discovery convinced me that whatsoever is good and desirable is sired by the holy search for perfection and damned by the receptivity of humility. That the majority in their search for truth do not go beyond the material is the greatest of human tragedies. Our schools crowd the minds of our children with knowledge which intoxicates them, perhaps broadening their horizons, notwithstanding. At the gates of the mysteries our schools balk. We cannot teach what we do not know is the slogan. Thus our youth is deprived of humility, their most valuable dowry for the future. 
As an example, the schools enlighten the children at a tender age as to the physiological and medical aspects of sex. It is claimed that such biological enlightenment protects and strengthens the morality of youth. Not a word is said to them of the ethical aspects of love, nor of any factor which might awaken in those children respect for the divine mysteries of propagation of the race, and of birth. No, I say. As medical lectures on sex cannot promote morality, scientific enlightenment cannot promote ethics. Rather, is the reverse true, for each scientific advance brings the danger of blasphemous self-glorification. The most important and never-ending social task of our churches is to keep awake humility for the curbing of overweening pride in our knowledge and accomplishments. We may learn from the history of our planet that idolatry of our own deeds and achievements is the greatest, most dangerous blight with which humanity threatens both itself and its civilization. It renders mankind completely sterile in the face of the challenge of the future. If scientific achievement be deified, humility suffers, and there can be no further true science without our mother, humility. If mankind worships ideology, symbols, or its own history, it forfeits the ability to adapt the structure of the state to the demands of technological advancement. God, and God alone must be worshipped, if man would complete his mission in this world. He cannot overcome his pride of accomplishment except by his humility before the deity. Such humility, however, frees him to adapt to the constantly varying demands of the future and fits him to better the inheritance of his forefathers and such of his own works as require betterment. Thus man may achieve submission to God's will by recognizing the imperfections of the present, and develop a will of his own to follow God's way as it opens before him. Thus, and not otherwise, can he create the basic ethic which must bear up technology and transmute her dangers into benefits for mankind. Chapter 31, Immortal Man The launching of the now wingless landing boats was a major event in martial scientific and cultural circles. Towering on the launching platforms, the boats were miniatures of the massive Sirius vessels, ready to ascend from Earth on their voyages to the orbit. A large number of Martians witnessed the unprecedented spectacle. When all was in readiness, Holt led his little group to their respective landing boats and then, clad in his space suit, marched slowly around the circle of observers who were seated in the great pressurized vehicles which several Martian irrigation companies had furnished for the great event. Holt placed his hand upon his heart in the Martian farewell, then mounted to the cabin of God and T.S. boat. The door closed and a few minutes later the two boats shot upwards a few seconds apart. As the condensation trails gradually dissolved in the thin atmosphere, the huge land vehicles rattled to the concrete airlocks through which the Martians would return to the galleries of their pressurized world. The earthlings were on the first stage of their journey home. No incident disturbed the climb to the orbit, where the interplanetary ships awaited the boats. When the short maneuver of adaptation terminated, Holt's party and their three Martian guests beheld through their circular ports the clumsy structures hanging without apparent motion against the black heavens. To the three Martians, the sight was so moving that they could hardly be dragged from their windows. Almost reluctantly they entered the busy bees which came to transfer the landing party and the various gifts and souvenirs to the passenger ships for the long drift to Earth. Finally, the remnants of propellants unused by the landing boats were emptied into the reserve tanks of the returning vessels. Zero, X minus one minute, resounded from the bull horns. Holt, from his acceleration couch in Polaris Pilot's cabin, viewed the six excellent passenger ships in front of him. The final test had come. Would the complicated mechanisms still function to a fraction of a second? Had the crews properly maintained them despite the psychic load to which they had so long been subject? Could, perhaps, this at long last have frustrated John Wigan's tireless insistence upon perfection? Within sixty short seconds, he would know, perhaps the last knowledge he would ever acquire. X minus thirty seconds. Co-pilot and engineer rapidly scanned the complicated instrument panels, nodding approvingly, yet gravely. The rising pitch of the direction gyros rose above the monotonous rustle of the respiration blowers. 
x minus 20 seconds. The tenseness of the moment reflected itself in the exchanged glances of the three men. x minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4 number 6 prestige lights missing. Hal Royer's voice roared through the bullhorn. The navigator had been checking the warning lights of the squadron from the navigation room. Hardly had the words left his mouth than the main stage of Polaris ignited, as simultaneous streams of fire shot from the rocket motors of all ships except Holt's immediate leader, Regulus. Regulus, report! shouted Holt into his microphone. The answer came in a thunderous bang in the intercom and a blinding flash from Regulus rocket motor, where there should have been a steady jet of smooth flame. Holt flicked the emergency cutoff switch and Polaris jet collapsed into silence. Quietly, the commander spoke into the microphone. Polaris to Vega. Take over expedition command. Proceed as planned. Polaris will stand by to help Regulus. He gazed at the five rocket jets receding into the vastnesses of space as Knight's voice answered, Roger. We'll go. God keep you. Over. Out. With a word to the co-pilot to return Polaris to her original position relative to Regulus, Holt moved down the central shaft of Polaris nacelle and entered the airlock leading to the busy bee. He went forth to assess the extent of the damage and to bring what help he could. As the bee approached the damaged vessel, Holt saw the afterflames of the explosion fade and die at the stern of Regulus. He knew from this that the propellant control valves had not suffered and had shut off the flow. The great cylindrical rocket motor itself, however, was completely shattered, together with its tubing, wiring, and other accessories. He steered his bee into the guide rails of Regulus Nacelle and was greeted by her commander's plump face grinning a bit shamefacedly through the port. Major Freddie Duncan was a calm soul and far less subject to edgy nerves than some of his fellow commanders. With the knowledge that the latter were receding into the distance at many miles per second, Holt rejoiced in his confidence in Duncan's stability. The airlock opened and the visitor entered a bluish haze and heard the hissing of escaping air. Splinter punctures? He asked calmly. A few, answered Duncan imperturbably, but they're all located and we'll have them plugged pronto. Anybody hurt? Poor Nordensk Joel got a splinter in his right thigh, which smashed his femur. He lost a lot of blood. Our medic's working on him now. I hope he's up to the job. Barrett's over a thousand miles away in space by now and we can't call him back. Duncan rubbed his cheek. He's a good boy, but this looks like a large order for his amount of medical training, Colonel. Haven't you got a Martian in Polaris who's supposed to be a surgical whiz? We'll get Svetla on the intercom and see if he can help, said Holt. In the meantime, let's see how Trigv's feeling. Nordensk Jold was strapped to the bunk in the captain's cabin, his upper right leg swathed in bandages. As Holt pulled himself into the tiny space Nordensk Jold smiled wanly. It seems that I'm always making trouble for you, Colonel, he said. Don't worry about that, son, answered Holt. We'll get you out of this all right. You're needed back on Earth, you know. Not every pilot can make good landings without nose wheels. He patted the youth's shoulder, then sent for Royer, the navigator, and retired to the pilot's compartment with him and the captain of Regulus. Duncan looked quizzically at his commander. Colonel, he said, it seems as though we've missed the bus. If we try to install a propulsion system from one of those cargo vessels still floating out there. It will take so long that Earth will be way past the point on her orbit where our voyaging ellipse intercepts it. You can't take us down and introduce us to your friends on Mars because you forgot to bring the wings back with the landing boats. It looks as though we were in the permanent Martian satellite business. With a smile at Duncan's imperturbable humor, Holt answered, We can't repair Regulus, but there's still a chance. The mathematical planning section and their electronic brains figure out a solution for just this kind of situation. We'll take a set of tanks from one of the cargo vessels, attach them to Polaris, and fill them with what's left of your Regulus propellants. 
that will give us a velocity reserve permitting Polaris to make a fast trip back to Earth, even with your regular screw aboard. Of course, we'll be down to a bare minimum of food and essentials. Roya, how does it look from the figure standpoint? The navigator studies his tables. There's no time to be lost, said he. We'll have to be on our way in not more than 104 hours. That's just a little more than four days. If we can tank up with regular full supply, we can pick a returning ellipse which will have a perihelion at a distance of 140 million kilometers from the sun day that is about 9 million kilometers less than the distance of Earth's orbit from the sun, and this ellipse will intersect Earth's orbit at an angle of 8 degrees and 40 seconds after a voyaging time of 233 days. Fortunately, the Earth will be at that intersection at that time. But if we are to enter such an ellipse, we shall have to give our ship a velocity change of 2.275 km per second when we leave the Martian orbit, as compared to only 2.01 km per second for the other five ships. And when we attempt to re-enter our former departure orbit around the Earth, we'll need a velocity change of 4.28 km per second instead of the 3.31 called for by the original calculations. What with the crew of Regulus and the necessary oxygen, food and water, Polaris load will be increased by 19 tons, and with Regulus propellants, we'll just be able to make it along the ellipse of which I've spoken. If we add our four days to the 233 days, we can be back near Earth 213 days from now, while the other ships will need 260 days. We can be home 47 days before them, if all goes well. Minus zero, the four days of grace were hectic and the three available busy bees worked constantly, even through the hours of darkness, when the great mass of Mars shielded the workers from the light and heat giving rays of the sun day the three cargo vessels which had been stripped of their landing boats still hung near the lonely earthlings as they whirled around Mars and Holt selected the four empty tanks still attached to Goddard as those to be used. They were first towed to Regulus and temporarily suspended from her structure in order to facilitate their filling with the available propellants. Regulus had lost 32 tons through the rips caused by the explosion of her rocket motor, so that only 326 tons were still available for Polaris Desperate Venture. The next problem was to bring the partially filled tanks over to Polaris and to attach them properly. Each of the four was filled to only two thirds of its capacity, so that it was necessary to top them off with helium under slight pressure in order to distend and facilitate handling. With a busy bee at each tank header, the unwieldy shapes were carefully towed to a position close to Polaris from which all hands in pressure suits gently inched them into position and bolted their suspension nets to the cruciform tank supports. When the tanks were attached, the crews connected the aspiration tubes leading to the propellant pumps, and the pressurizing lines. Finally, they adjusted the temperature control blinds and the liquidometers. The last bee loads of food and supplies were loaded into Polaris, the final checks and tests were made, and the engineer reported to Holt that they could depart a scan five hours before the elapse of the critical 104 hour period. Oberth's high duty radio station still swam near them in the velvet darkness, and Holt had kept it manned and in communication with the distant convoy, so that both the departing crews and Earth itself might be kept informed of the desperate struggle for preservation. The last message announced that Polaris rocket motor would be started within the hour and that the laggards would enter a satellite orbit around Earth in 209 days. Until then, silence, for the high-duty station must be left circling in the Martian orbit along with the remnants of the landing boats and cargo vessels. Zero, Holt touched the prestage ignition switch and waited tensely. A few seconds later the main jet roared its deep-throated song of power. A silent prayer of thanksgiving rose to the lips of all in the crowded nacelle as they felt the familiar thrust. Svetla, their Martian guest and fellow traveler, relayed their belated farewells to his home planet and assured them that Mars, no less than Earth, accompanied them in prayer. Tired but hopeful. 
they settled themselves against the weary, weightless coast through space. There were now none of the amenities which had mitigated the hardships of the outward journey, for neither Earth nor Mars radio programs could be received, nor were there any movies or intership visits to break the monotony. The most careful movement through the weightless spaces of Polaris nacelle brought collisions with sleeping men suspended between the bulkheads or with someone attempting to beguile the time in desultory conversation with a listless neighbor. The tiny library's short stock of books were read and reread so often that the only exercise for the mind was to learn some classic by heart. The only physical exercise was that provided by a venerable spring exerciser, for Holt had been forced to abandon Polaris gravity cell. The 42nd day of their lonesome voyage saw Nordensk chilled in a sinking condition. Three days before, the ship's medic and Svetler, the Martian, had been compelled to amputate the injured leg. Svetler performed the operation and Holt acted as an aesthetist, but the youth failed to rally. He died in Holt Sums. Holt moved from the sick bay into the crowded living space and called for silence, after closing the oval door upon all that remained of the intrepid pilot. Men of Polaris, he said quietly, our friend, Trig Nordensk Child, has left us forever. Many of you owe your lives to his skill and coolness on that unforgettable day when he set down got our damaged boat without injury to a man. None of us can ever forget what a man he was, either on our home planet, through the long reaches of the sky, or in the hospitable underground galleries of Mars. Nordensk Child was a true Viking of the heavens, and we shall give him a Viking's burial in the infinite vastness of space, a burial not unlike those which honored his knightly forebears upon the wide and stormy ocean. At 0400 tomorrow, our last remaining busy bee will be launched into space never to return. In it will rest all that is mortal of Trigv Nordensk Child. When you hear the call, all hands to bury the dead, let each man send a heartfelt prayer out into space with our departed comrade. With reverent hands, the remains of the dead hero were strapped into the pilot's seat of the bee as it lay moored before the airlock. A strong spring was attached to the throttle, which was held closed by an explosive bolt. The latter was connected by a cable with an electrical socket outside the nacelle. As the clock struck four, Holt raised the microphone to his lips. All hands to bury the dead, he said hoarsely. Since it has pleased God in his almighty wisdom to take from this spaceship the soul of our true comrade and brother, we now commit his body to the depths of space. With the final word he touched the switch under his hand. There was a flash of blue-green flame outside the stern ports and the dead pilot sped forth into eternity, impelled by a fiery jet which, in an atomic and interstellar age, still was symbolic of the floating byres in which his Viking ancestors had journeyed to Valhalla. In the administration building on Christmas Island, Catherine Holt and General Braden sat amid wreaths of stale cigarette smoke and between piles of burnt-out stubs. Polaris had been overdue for three nights and neither man nor woman had closed an eye for twenty-four hours. Had the ship's maneuver of departure failed, so that she was still circling Mars, unable to descend to its hospitable surface and hopelessly exhausting the last supplies of nourishment and oxygen? Could some mischance have carried the bold vessel into the path of some big meteor, unlikely though this contingency was? Countless possibilities of disaster existed particularly for a spaceship alone amid the vastnesses of space. A navigation error might have swept the solitary craft far from her home planet. Perhaps Polaris had missed her meeting with Earth, or failed to develop the thrust required to convert her voyaging ellipse to a satellite path around her home planet. None could tell. Lunetta had been alerted for several days. Her radio stations were continuously manned in the hope that their directive searching antennae might pick up some weak signal from Polaris' feeble transmitter. The convoy itself regularly sent in night spirally report, but as to Polaris, all was silence. The tropic dawn began to spread over the island. Catherine Holt slept the sleep of exhaustion with her head on the conference table, while Braden was just about to ignite his fiftieth or sixtieth cigarette. Suddenly, a high-pitched buzzing split the silence. Braden snatched the telephone. 
Braden speaking. Report for you, sir, from Central Radio, Christmas. Go ahead, damn it. What are you waiting for? Lunetta's observatory reports blinker signals apparently reading, so's, Polaris.Lunetta reports blinker signals apparently from a satellite orbit considerably distant from, but encircling Earth. Is now attempting to get its coordinates. Hold everything, said Braden, I'll be in your station in a jiffy. Catherine awakened and gazed anxiously at the general, who returned her look half quizzically, although tears rolled down his lean cheeks. It's Gary. He said. Seems he's bored because we haven't come to drag him out of his orbit and wants to put in a kick about it. Two hours later, Astro Anna, with Braden and his staff on board, was underway to the departure orbit, where her top stage was retanked from a reserve held there for just such a contingency. Picking up two busy bees, the great spaceship again started her rocket motor and entered upon an extended ellipse leading further into space. This ellipse was computed so that its apogee might contact the distant satellite orbit now followed by Polaris and determined by Lunetta's observatory. Arrived at apogee, Astro Anna carried out a short maneuver of adaptation to the local orbital velocity. Her crew soon beheld Polaris, a scant ten miles distant. She was reduced to a skeleton by the absence of the great spherical tanks and was hardly recognizable, but reassuring blinker signals conveyed the welcome news that there was life aboard. Braden hastened into one of the busy bees picked up by Astro Honor in the orbit of departure and fairly hurled himself across the intervening distance. Within twenty minutes of sighting the lost spaceship, he entered her airlock and ordered her exhausted occupants to prepare to disembark into the busy bees which now shuttled excitedly between the two space vessels. Zero, the radioed report that Astroliner was alongside the lone Polaris brought not only Catherine Holt, but a swarm of reporters, workers, and relatives of the long-lost spacefarers to the great landing strip of Christmas Island and soon the flagship of the space forces could be seen making her calculated approach over the runway markers. Her wheels already in rapid motion, she touched down and slowed to a dignified stop alongside the tractor which hauled the massive vessel with her aching wings to the terminal building. The door in the ship's nose was thrown open and in it appeared a bent, grey-haired figure supported on either side by Braden and his chief of staff. It was Gary Holt. Tenderly, the general and his companion half fled, half carried him to one of the nineteen litters which had been hurried to Astroliner exit gangway. With a sign of complete exhaustion, and breathing heavily, Gary Holt lay motionless as Catherine enfolded him in her arms, covering his face with tears and begging him to answer her caresses. Darling, all I've wanted was you, and now I have you, I find I need weightlessness to do more than look at you. It seems impossible now that during most of my life, such a pressure as I now feel has oppressed me. A rapid health check at the station hospital revealed that the weakness of Holt and his companions was of a nature which only time and slow, careful exercise of the muscular faculties could cure. The doctors in each case decided that home influences would soonest overcome the psychic handicaps imposed upon their patients' mental and spiritual functionings. Oddly enough, Svetla, the Martian, had withstood the ordeal with less disturbance than his earthling companions. This was attributed to his lifetime having been passed under weaker gravity conditions than they, as well as to the enormous inner resources of his highly developed brain and spirit. The notes he had made of his observations of the actions and behavior of his companions were for many months thereafter a fruitful source of psychological data concerning maturity coefficients as affected by the most stressful conditions. Gary Holt, in the capacious quarters occupied by Braden, began towards evening to recover his spirits and energies enough to relate to Catherine some of the details of the journey of his lone ship back towards her home planet. As they coasted through the solar system, it had become apparent to the navigator, Roya, that the original track had not been followed with sufficient accuracy to bring them to their vital goal. Three corrective maneuvers had been necessary, largely straining their scanty reserves of propellants. 
when it came to the maneuver of adaptation to the Earth orbit, it had been essential to jettison everything not absolutely necessary to sustain life within the desperate Polaris. This had included much food, books, instruments, pressure suits, water, radio equipment, and even much of reserve oxygen supply. Even then, they lacked enough propellant to put them back into the bi hourly orbit around Earth, which had so ideally served for the departure. They had to choose the cheapest maneuver possible, and this dot proved to be an entry into a satellite orbit some 30,000 kilometers distant. The velocity change required for this maneuver was some 500 meters per second lower than that which would have put her into the original orbit of departure. With radio equipment jettisoned, Polaris despairing crew was reduced to employing their solar reflector, ordinarily used for electric current generation, as a heliograph. It had been largely a matter of luck that Lunetta had intercepted the blinker signals. The most dreadful hours of his life, Gary said, were the three days they had spent on reduced rations and with their oxygen supplied windling while they circled helplessly the home planet for which they longed so intensely. Zero, gradually recovering his energies under his wife's tender ministrations, Holt stubbornly resisted all reporters and other influences which would have beguiled him from the restful solitude of Christmas Island until night and his five Mars vessels re-entered the orbit from which Sinus rockets would ferry their crews and Martian guests back to the base. For Catherine, the 43 restful days were all too short, although much of the time, her husband's thoughts remained with the space crews in their lonely nasals. When, a day or so before the increasingly strong radio signals from Knight's squadron set the exact day and hour of their entrance into the orbit, four serious ships climbed aloft for the joyous task of picking up the spacefarers, Holt's strength of both body and spirit had so far returned that he insisted upon a last voyage with one of the vessels into the outer marches of Earth's gravitational influence and to bid a final adieu to the interstellar void which had been the fateful arbiter of his life. With his own eyes, he witnessed Knight's five Mars ships sweep into their Earth orbit in a neat squadron maneuver of about a minute's duration. No sooner did the busy bees from the four Sirius vessels snap into the guide rails of the returning squadron than busy and enthusiastic hands loaded the various Martian mementos into them. Immediately thereafter, and with their two Martian guests in the lead, the homesick but cheerful men were urging the captains of the ferries to make all haste to the Christmas Island landing strip. Once aground, ovation after ovation, celebration after celebration was their log. Soon Holt was on the road with his Martian passengers, but as the wife of a VIP, Katie was urged to taste his triumph with him, and uncomplainingly and gaily did so. Triumphal entry after triumphal entry to towns and cities. Banquet after banquet overwhelmed Braden, Spencer, Holt, and their companions. It was during one of the more festive of the banquets that it happened. Spencer, cigar in hand, had just responded to the conventional toast to the future of interplanetary commerce. He slumped, rather than seated himself. His bald skull fell forward upon the table. The last of his villainous cigars dropped from his failing fingers for the fighting heart which had borne him through the interplanetary battle had stopped. The spark was extinguished which had lit the fire of enthusiasm for space travel more than a generation ago. A few days later, Spencer was buried in the National Cemetery at Arlington. Holt stood with Catherine beside the open grave, his now grizzled locks shaken by the autumn wind. Again he paid a tribute to a co-worker in space, this time to the man who had also been a paternal friend, Brace Spencer's restless spirit and his life of combat opened the reaches of heaven to mankind. It was he who forged those wondrous tools which bore us safely among the stars. It was his vision which opened our eyes to life in the universe. His restless spirit has now returned to the God who inspired Bruce Spencer's creations. His ships will sail on through space and their bridge with our outer brethren will become strong and great. A new community of fate will overcome space and we and our outer brethren will become one. Bruce Spencer's ships carried us safely to the moon's dead landscapes, where we saw a heavenly body which cannot support life. They bore us to the fervid culture of Mars, 
where we learn the full capabilities of man to survive when his planet ages and he can no longer enjoy a life in nature. There we saw the declining glory of a setting civilization. Eons from today, Bruce Spencer's ships will carry our descendants from an aging earth, no longer capable of sheltering them, to a young, new home star where they may found a new future. His immortal creations will have given mortal man an immortal future. The end scientific appendix acknowledgments are due Mr. Croft Eric Dr. Hans Friedrich Dr. Joseph Jennison Dr. Joachim Muehlner Dr. Adolf Thiel Dr. Karl Wagner for their valuable contribution to the preparation of the following pages. A. The Serious Vessels 1. Summary of Principal Data Table I. Principal Data. First stage references and source material are Literature on rocketry and space travel American and British P. E. Cleeter, Rockets Through Space, London, George Allen and Unwin Limited, 1936. Robert H. Goddard, A Method of Reaching Extreme Altitudes, Washington, D.C., Smithsonian Miscellaneous Collections, Volume 71, Number 2, 1919. Willie Lee, Rockets and Space Travel, New York, Viking Press, 1947. G. E. Pendry, The Coming Age of Rocket Power, New York and London, Harper and Brothers, 1945. G. P. Sutton, Rocket Propulsion Elements, New York, John Wiley and Sons, 1949. French R. Esnault Peltier. L'exploration par fusses de la très haute atmosphère et la possibilité des voyages interplanetaires, Paris, 1928. R. Laurent, he volume du Dewey, le volume du futur, Paris, Airfile, 1911. German W. Hochmann, die R. H. Bach et der Himmels Koeper, Munchen and Berlin, R. Oldenwig Verlag. 1926. W. Lee, Dimoglitch Kiet der Well Raumfahrt, with contributions by H. Oberth, F. von Hoft, W. Hochmann, K. Debus, G. von Perke, F. W. Sander Leipzig, Verlag Hatchmister and Tai, 1928. H. Nor Ordung, Das Problem der Beförung der Well Ten Raums, Berlin. Verlag Richard Karl Schmidt and Co., 1929. H. Oberth, Direkit zu den Plantenra Eumann, Munchen and Berlin, R. Oldenwig Verlag, 1923. Wade zur Raumschiffe, Munchen and Berlin, R. Oldenwig Verlag, 1929. G. von Perke, Kann der Mensch die Erd Verlassen? 1. Reichpost, 1928. Fahrruten, Breslau, Direk Keat, 1928. E. Senger, Rake Flug Technik, Munchen and Berlin, R. Oldenwig Verlag, 1933. A. B. Skershvsky, Direk Keat, Berlin, Charlottenburg, C. L. E. Volkmann Akf. G. M. B. H., 1929. M. Valier, Dev Ostos in den Weltenraum, Munchen und Berlin, R. Oldenwig Verlag, 1929. Rake Tenfurt, Munchen und Berlin, R. Oldenwig Verlag, 1928. J. Winkler, Ein Führung in das Raumfach Problem, Breslau, Direk Keat, 1928. Italian G. A. Crocco, Sulla Possibilita Delta Navigation Extra Atmospherica, Roma, Atti della Relica Edemia de Linsi, 1923, Volume 23, Fascicolo 7 Rendiconti della Sigiut, 6, 1923. Russian A. Gorokov, The Mechanical Flight of the Future, St. Petersburg Leningrad, was the Sneeput, 1911. N. E. Reinen, Space Travel. Leningrad, Encyclopedia of the Problem of Space Travel and Interplanetary Voyages, 1928. K. E. Zyolkowski, A Rocket into Cosmic Space, Kaluga, Imperial Printing Office, 1903 and 1924.
exploration of interplanetary space by means of reaction propelled spaceships, St. Petersburg slash Leningrad, Westnik was due Choplawenaya, 1911 and 1913.b. Literature on Mars H. S. Jones, Life on Other Worlds, New York, The Macmillan Company, 1940. G. P. Kuiper. The Atmosphere of the Earth and Planets, Chicago, The University of Chicago Press, 1949. J. J. von Littrow, Die Wonders Himmels, Berlin, 10. Orflage Ferdinand Odmler's Verlag, 1939. P. Lowell, Mars. The Abode of Life, New York, The Macmillan Company, 1908. W. H. Pickering, Mars, Boston, The Gorham Press, 1921.C. General references are N. Cowdenhove Callagy, Revolution Dirch Technik, Wern and Leipzig, Pain Europa Verlag, 1932. W. Kempford, Science Today and Tomorrow, New York, Viking Press. 1945. A. J. Toynbee, A Study of History, New York and London, Oxford University Press, 1947.D. Special References Magnetically Suspended Railway with Solenoid Drive A ballistic test range with magnetical suspension and solenoid drive was in development at the Ballistis versus installed, Gatau and Goetzingen, Germany under the direction of Dr. Schkardin. Sleep teaching The story on sleep teaching in our tale has been based on work conducted by Max Sherover, president of the Bingusphone Institute, and experiments by Dr. C. E. Elliott, the University of North Carolina. Brainwaves The electroencephalograph, brainwave recorder, was pioneered by Professor Hans Berger, Psychiatric Institute at the University of Jena, Germany and Dr. E. D. Adrian, World famous neurologist, Cambridge University, England. Modern experiments were conducted by Dr. C. E. Elliott, the University of North Carolina. Fat algae culture's use of algae for production of fats, sugars, and proteins was pioneered by Sam Rubin, the University of California. After Rubin's death, his work was continued by DRS. Melvin Calvine and Andrew Benson. Dr. Herman A. Spur of the Carnegie Institution's Division of Plant Biology at Palo Alto, California, recently succeeded in developing a species of algae containing 85% fat. Dr. Spur believes in utilization of algae for mass production of fats. See Lestivoli, Bread Within the Waters, Collier's Magazine, September 11, 1948. Diagrams drawn by Dr. Wernher von Braun the 14 diagrams on the following pages were hand drawn by Dr. Wernher von Braun. They are part of the contents of this appendix, and are referenced within. About the author Dr. Wernher von Braun is best known as NASA's rocket man. His team designed and developed, among other large rockets, the Redstone Booster, which launched America's first satellite and astronauts, and the giant Saturn V which launched the Apollo missions to the moon. Although he worked on military rocket development during the first half of his career, Wernher von Braun dreamed of a world in which rockets were used for space exploration, and this, he claimed, was his primary motivation. In a series of articles in Collier's Weekly magazine in 1952, von Braun presented a concept for an Earth-orbiting space station. He also worked as a technical director at Disney Studios, preparing three television films about space exploration. In 1949, von Braun penned a science fiction story, Project Mars, a technical tale, a story based on detailed and accurate science, yet presented as a very human undertaking. Clearly intended as a way to infect others with his enthusiasm for human space exploration. This forgotten tale lingered in his personal files until being published in 2006, nearly 30 years after his death and 57 years after it was written. Dr. von Braun pauses in front of the Saturn V vehicle being readied for the historic Apollo 11 lunar landing mission at the Kennedy Space Center, KSC. The Saturn V vehicle was developed by the Marshall Space Flight Center under the direction of Dr. von Braun. Photo credit. NASA Marshall Space Flight Center